Chapter Twelve of J. S. Bach by Albert Schweitzer, translated by Ernest Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Death and Resurrection. Bach enjoyed all his life the best of health. He seems never to have been seriously ill. In the summer of 1729, we learn this accidentally. He had an indisposition that came at an inconvenient time for him, since it prevented him from visiting Handel, who was at that time in Halle. Yet the state of his eyes was always rather unsatisfactory. Bach was extremely short-sighted. He never spared his eyes. In his youth he sat up, as we learn from the necrology, and from Forkel, whole nights through, copying music. The demands he made on his visual powers in later times were hardly less they must thus have steadily deteriorated this is probably one of the main reasons for the slackening in his productivity from about seventeen hundred and forty onwards at the end he was attacked by a painful malady of the eyes he was operated upon partly from the desire to go on serving god and his neighbour with his still active mental and physical powers partly on the advice of some of his friends who placed much faith in an oculist lately arrived in Leipzig. Yet this operation, although it had to be repeated, turned out very badly. He not only lost his sight, but his otherwise exceedingly good bodily health was quite undermined by it, and by some mischievous medicines and other treatment, so that for a full half-year afterwards he was almost continually ailing during his illness he went on with the revision of his great chorale fantasias which had already occupied him for some time the manuscript part of the property left by emmanuel tells a story of suffering in the second version of the chorale jesus christus unser heiland appears the handwriting of altnikol who had become bach's son-in-law in, in seventeen hundred and forty nine then we meet again with bach's clear characters he even found the strength to make a new and improved fair copy of the canonic variations on vom himmel hoch da komm ich her which he had had engraved and published in seventeen hundred and forty seven on joining the misler society he appears to have passed his last days wholly in a darkened room when he felt death drawing nigh he dictated to altnikol a chorale fantasia on the melody when here in hochstein noten sind but told him to head it with the beginning of the hymn for deinen thron tret ich alhie that is sung to the same melody in the manuscript we can see all the pauses that the sick man had to permit himself the drying ink becoming more watery from day to day the notes written in the twilight with the windows closely curtained can hardly be deciphered in the dark chamber with the shades of death already falling round him the master made this work that is unique even among his creations the contrapuntal art that it reveals is so perfect that no description can give any idea of it each segment of the melody is treated in a fugue in which the inversion of the subject figures each time as the counter subject moreover the flow of the parts is so easy that after the second line we are no longer conscious of the art but are wholly enthralled by the spirit that finds voice in these g major harmonies the tumult of the world no longer penetrated through the curtained windows the harmonies of the spheres were already echoing round the dying master so there is no sorrow in the music the tranquil quavers move along on the other side of all human passion over the whole thing gleams the word transfiguration bach's eyes all at once seemed to improve on waking one morning he could see quite well and could endure the light a few hours later he had a stroke this was followed says the necrology by a violent fever in which in spite of all possible care on the part of two of the ablest physicians in leipzig he gently and blissfully passed away on the twenty eighth of july seventeen hundred and fifty at a quarter to nine in the evening in the sixty-sixth year of his age the burial took place at st john's cemetery on the morning of friday the thirty-first the second day of humiliation in saxony bach was universally lamented magister abraham kriegel his colleague at st thomas's school eulogized him in an obituary notice 
Telemann, the famous musician, eulogized him in the following sonnet. Last Huechland, immer viel von virtuosen Sagen, die Durch die Klingenkunst, sich dort berumt gemacht. Auf deutschen Boden sind sei gleichsvoll zu erfragen wo man dies beifalls sei nicht munder fachig acht erblichener bach dir hat allein dein ogel schlagen das edel vorgutswort des großen langs gebracht und was für kunst dein kiel aus notenblatt getragen das wort mit hochste lust auch oft mit neid betracht so schaffte Dein Name bleibt von Untergang frei, Dei Schule deine Sucht und ihre Schulerei, Bereiten für dein Haupt des Nachruhms Ehrenkrone. Auch deine Klinde Haut setzt ihren Schmuck daran, Doch was in Sodenbert dicht schatzbar machen kann, Das zeiget in Berlin in einem Wutgen, Sonne. Emmanuel and Agricola were commissioned to write the necrology which the Miesle Society wished to devote to its member. It appeared in 1754. This necrology contains the best known anecdotes, the fate of the music books in which the boy had copied out music at night, the contest with Marchand, the masterly organ performance before Reinken, the visit to Frederick the Great. It also gives the first list of the printed and unprinted works. The deceased members of the musical society were, in addition, commemorated in a Singedicht. The composition of the one for Bach was entrusted to a Dr. Georg Wensky. It is not exactly a masterpiece. First of all, the muses were involved. Chorus Dampft Musen ever sight and spiel. Brecht ab briegt ab die Freudenlieder. Steckt dem Vernügen itzt ein Ziel. Und singt zum Trost betrübter Brudet, Hort was für Klagen Leipzig singt, Es wird euch euch storen, Doch musst ihr horen. Then Leipzig appears and announced in a recitative, Der große Bach der unsere Stadt, Ja der Europens weite Reiche, Erob und wenig seine starke Hat, Ist leider eine Leiche. After the composers and friends of music have given vent to their grief and rhyme, the members of the musical society, as the true initiates, finally break out into a song of lamentation in the form of a two-part aria. At the end, the glorified one speaks. He comforts the friends with the reflection that the musical conditions in heaven are better than those in Leipzig, whereupon the chorus brings the Singedicht to an end. Mattison, the leading critic of that time, made an end after Bach's death of the secret envy he had cherished towards him all his life long, and wrote in warm praise of the art of fugue, which appeared in 1751. Johann Sebastian Bach's so-called art of fugue, he writes in the same year, a practical and splendid, practitious und praktigus, work of seventy folio copper plates, will astonish all the French and Italian fugue writers, provided they can understand it. I will not say be able to play it. How would it be then if every German and every foreigner should venture his Louis d'Or on his treasure? Germany is and remains, without doubt, the true land of organ music and fugue. The same note had been struck by the celebrated Berlin musical theorist Friedrich Wilhelm Marpurg, seventeen hundred and eighteen to seventeen hundred and ninety five, in the preface that he wrote to the art of fugue at Emmanuel's request although he had been a pupil, not of Bach, but of Rameau in Paris. It would be a great mistake, however, to imagine that Bach was at that time regarded as one of the leading German composers. It was the organist who was famous. The theoretician of the fugue was admired, but the composer of the Passions and Cantatas was only incidentally mentioned. In the same volume of the Miesler Bibliothèque that contains the necrology, there is a list of the artists who constituted the glory of German music. They come in the following order. Hasse, Handel, Telemann, The Two Grounds, Stolzel, Bach, Pissendel, Quanz, and Boomler. Bach's fame made hardly any advance during the 18th century. Johann Adam Hiller, in his 
Lebensbeschreibung Berumter, Musikgelehrter, 1784, allotted him only a few superficial pages, which, moreover, dealt only with the choropheus of all organists. And Gerber, in his Tonkunstler Lexicon, does not take the slightest trouble to appreciate the composer as well as the virtuoso. For all that, we must not be unjust to those who did not recognize his greatness at that time. They were not to blame. They could not do otherwise. In the first place, we must take into consideration the artistic ideal of the men of that epoch. They were too simple to rank the art of the previous generation as highly as that of their own. They were convinced that music was always advancing. And as their own art was later than the old art, it must necessarily come nearer to the ideal. That epoch could not resign itself to regarding mere performers of other men's work as artists. If a man wished to appear before the public, it should be with works of his own. So implicitly was this principle accepted that many people did not hesitate to perform the works of others under their own name. It was only when musicians began to recognize that other men's living thoughts were better than their own dead ones and to be content with being purely executive artists that the past ceased to be regarded as surpassed by the present. This, however, was not until the end of the 18th century and beginning of the 19th, but until it happened, Bach's day could not possibly come. Nor must we forget that even during the master's lifetime, art had taken a path that led it far away from cantatas and passions. People were weary of fugues and of pieces constructed of obbligato parts and longed for a music that could be spontaneous, feeling, and nothing else. The conception of nature, which in the epoch of growing rationalism transformed philosophy and poetry, asserted itself also in music. Answering as they did to the needs of the epoch, the emotional compositions of the day, with their tender and pathetic expression, insignificant as they were in themselves, appealed to thoughtful artists as being nearer to truth than the music of the epoch of rigid rule. That Bach's art is in its own way was also true to nature and that in a strict polyphony a volcanic emotion and thought were embedded like substances petrified in lava this the men of the expiring eighteenth century could not see there has never been a movement so lacking in the historical sense as the rationalism of the eighteenth century the art of the past in every department is regarded as mere affectation everything old was necessarily antiquated at least in its form if they were to appreciate its utterance it must be expressed in a simpler and more natural way. In this spirit, they restored so much of the ancient buildings as they allowed to remain. In this spirit did the Bach admirers of that epoch, among them his own sons and Zelter, undertake revisions of his works that are among the most barbarous things of their kind in the whole world. Zelter in particular discovered French powder in Bach's pigtail. Old Bach, he writes in one place, is, with all his originality, a son of his country and of his epoch, and did not escape the influence of the French, especially of Couperin. People try to be agreeable, and so write what cannot last. This alien product, however, we can skim off him like a thin froth, bringing out the real worth of what lies immediately underneath. I have arranged in this way many of his church pieces for myself alone, and my heart tells me that old Bach nods approvingly at me, like the good Hayden. Yes, yes, that is just what I wanted. Bach's sons were the children of their epoch and never understood their father. It was only from piety that they looked at him with childlike admiration. This remark of Eitner, severe as it may be, is true. The London Bach was even lacking in piety. He spoke of his father as the old peruke. In the eyes of the public and the critics of the end of the 18th century, the great composer of the Bach family was Emmanuel. No one stood so much in the way of his father's name as he. Burney, 1726 to 1814, the celebrated English critic, who visited him on his great continental tour in 1772, extols him as one of the greatest composers for keyed instruments that ever lived, and is of opinion that he is not only more learned than his father, but is far before him in variety of modulation. He makes only casual mention of the fact that Emmanuel had showed him the two volumes of the well-tempered clavichord. They were compositions that the deceased Herr Kappelmeister had written on purpose for him when he was a boy. Bernie was several days in Hamburg and spent almost the whole time with Emmanuel. 
The latter, however, did not play him a single note of his father's music. In a conversation with his visitor, Emmanuel made merry over the composers who affected canons, and said it was ever a certain proof to him of a total want of genius in any one that was fond of such wretched studies and undermeaning productions. On the other hand, he praised Hasse, the greatest cheat in the world, who in his compositions, without considering the obligato leading of the parts, made such divine effects as one could never expect from a crowded score. This points to a quite new conception of orchestral composition, which was afterwards realized in the Beethoven symphony, but at the same time it shows the son's complete lack of understanding of the character of his father's scores. For Reichardt, the greatest critical authority of that epoch, old Bach ranks considerably below Handel, though both are reproached with clinging to old forms. The only man who ventured to place Bach above Handel at that time was an enthusiastic anonymous author of an article in the Allgemeine Deutsche Bibliothek upon Bach's piano and organ works. Bach's case was greatly prejudiced by the German Handel worship that dated from the first Berlin performance of the Messiah under Hiller, 19th May, 1786, especially as Hiller became cantor at St. Thomas's, Leipzig, in 1789, where for ten years he worked for Handel and his own teacher Hasse, as if a Johann Sebastian Bach had never existed. When he had completed his own collection of motets and was desirous of doing still more to increase the supply of good church music, it did not occur to him to publish the few cantatas of Bach that lay in the musical library of the cantorate, but only to issue the finest pieces from Hasse's Italian operas, with a German church text added to them. The clergy of the town took the greatest interest in this undertaking. We learn from Zelta that Hiller tried to inspire the Thomaners with abhorrence of the crudities of Bach. The only cantor of St. Thomas's of the second half of the eighteenth century who did anything for Bach was Dolus, and he only half-heartedly. Although he had actually been Bach's pupil, he made a rule for himself in writing contrapuntally to observe its proper limits, and at the same time not to forget delicate and affecting melody, in which he took Hasse and Graun as his models. Nevertheless, as we know from Rochlitz, who was a Thomaner under him, from time to time he performed works by Bach, among them certain motets and passions. It was through Dolus that Mozart, who revered and loved him, made the acquaintance of Bach's motet, Singet dem Herrn ein Neunes Lied. Rochlitz, who was present at that performance, gives the following account of it. Mozart knew Bach more by hearsay than from his works. At any rate, he was quite ignorant of his motets, which had never been printed. Scarcely had the choir sung a few bars when he started up, a few bars more, and he called out, What is that? And now his whole soul seemed to be in his ears. When the performance was over, he called out joyfully, That is indeed something from which we can learn. He was told that this school at which Sebastian Bach had been cantor possessed a complete collection of his motets and treasured them as sacred relics. That's right, that's fine, he said. Let me see them. As there were no scores of these works, he got them to bring him the separate parts. And now it was a joy to the silent observers to see how eagerly Mozart distributed the parts around him, in both hands, on his knees, on the nearest chairs, and forgetting everything else, did not rise until he had carefully read through everything that was there of Bach's. He begged and obtained a copy for himself, which he valued very highly. The one who seemed in the best position to produce Bach's cantatas was Emmanuel, who was church music director at Hamburg. So far as we know, however, he performed only a few cantatas and sections of the B minor mass. In any case, he would not have been able to do much for his father's works, even if he had wished for his chorus and orchestra were in a sorry state. Bernie laments that a piece of church music which he heard in St. Catherine's, it was one of Emmanuel's own, should have been done so very badly, and that the congregation should have listened to it so inattentively. Nothing remained in Hamburg at that time of the old enthusiasm for church music. You should have come here fifty years ago, said Emmanuel sadly to his visitor. It is evident, too, that the discussions upon the reform of church music after his death that people had taken his productions of his father's work in ill part. At any rate, the pastors were forced to defend him against the reproach that many old compositions had been used, and with them also an old and often unedifying text. His apologists excused him on the ground that it could not be otherwise with the excessive quantity of music. 
how little interest was felt in religious art is shown by the fact that the college of sexagenarians abolished the regular sunday music from motives of economy retaining only the music of the six feast days conditions were no better in the other german towns the regular music was abolished the cantorate choirs were mostly extinct voluntary mixed choirs scarcely existed as yet and were not permitted in the church service bach's cantatas were really impossible in the churches by reason not only of their music but of their old orthodox texts we must bear all this in mind before we speak of the lack of understanding of the musicians who let bach's works fall into oblivion religious music was possible only outside the church service and even this had to be of the kind in which the effect depended more on the chorale masses than on the text for this reason handel the oratorio composer triumphed over bach the master of the cantata the reaction against rationalistic spiritual poetry had to be far advanced before the public could again tolerate a bach text even if any one in despite of the epoch had wished to give bach's work he could hardly have done so for the simple reason that they were nowhere to be had the possessors of the five yearly series of cantatas were emmanuel and friedemann who had divided the treasure among them those in friedemann's hands were soon dispersed emmanuel took more care of his to publish them however was impossible on account of the expense nor would he have found many purchasers his unfortunate experience with the art of fugue of which by the autumn of seventeen hundred and fifty six only thirty copies had been sold was not encouraging so he confined himself to lending the scores of the cantatas to the few people who were interested in them for inspection or for copying for which they had to pay him a fee not even forkel his friend being accepted after his death his wife continued the business when she died in seventeen hundred and ninety five anna carolina the sole surviving granddaughter of johann sebastian bach appended to the obituary notice in the papers an announcement that she would continue with the utmost attentiveness the business hitherto carried on by her late mother with the music of her late father and grandfather in leipzig there were the parts of the motets which belonged to the school three passions and some cantatas these were probably the works that bach's widow offered to the council in seventeen hundred and fifty two when she applied for relief the works of bach in the possession of amalie the sister of frederick the great and a pupil of kirnberger were temporarily withdrawn from publicity and were known only to a few intimate friends after her death in seventeen hundred and eighty seven her collection went to the library of the joachimstahl gymnasium in berlin the piano and organ works were hardly more widely diffused of those that had been engraved there had always been so few copies that they were scarcely better known than those which in bach's lifetime circulated only in manuscript it is hardly credible how little was known of bach by those who spoke admiringly of him it had always been so marpoch's celebrated treatise on fuga according to the principles and examples of the best german and foreign masters gives us the impression that apart from the art of fuga he had not seen many fugas of bach yet he refers enthusiastically to him in his practice the chorale preludes again he scarcely knew judging by the way in which he speaks of them the well-tempered clavichord was perhaps the most widely known work but at the end of the eighteenth century it seemed on the whole as if bach were forever dead at the very beginning of the nineteenth century however there was felt the breath of the spirit that was to wake him to immortal life in his works in eighteen hundred and two forkel's biography appeared this marks the turning of the tide johann nikolaus forkel seventeen hundred and forty nine to eighteen hundred and eighteen was a university musical director at Gottingen. He was also a musical historian, engaged on a general history of music that was to extend from the foundation of the world to his own time. As he feared that he might die before he got as far as Bach, and he thought it imperative that he should preserve for the world what he had learned of the master from his two sons, he decided to anticipate and publish the chapters in Bach, especially as the Bureau de Musique of Hofmeister and Kuhnel in Leipzig was planning an edition of Bach's work. His biography was to prepare for and justify that undertaking. The significance of this work of sixty-nine pages does not lie in what it actually says, although it contains plenty of interesting things, nor chiefly in the fact that it made the world for the first time acquainted with Bach and his art, but in the conquering enthusiasm that animates it. Forkel appealed to the national sentiment, 
the works that johann sebastian bach has left us he says at the beginning of his preface are a priceless national heritage of a kind that no other race possesses and again the preservation of the memory of this great man is not merely a concern of art it is a concern of the nation the book closes with the words and this man the greatest musical poet and the greatest musical rhetorician that has ever existed and probably that ever will exist was a german be proud of him o fatherland be proud of him but also be worthy of him zelter goes astray when he imagines that forkel had written a life of bach without knowing more about it than the whole world knew already no one before him had understood as he did the greatness of the leipzig master it is true that he treats of the creator of the cantatas and the passions very briefly but this was for the simple reason that forkel had seen only a few of these works if forkel was the first bach biographer rochlitz was the first bach aesthetician he tells in really thrilling style the story of how he came to bach the fact that as a boy he had sung in bach's motets and passions at st thomas's had merely made him scared of the master and his works as a young man he feels himself attracted to him by a vague enthusiasm and he studies the four-part chorale movements in the cantatas that emmanuel had published light does not dawn on him however for in the absence of the text in this edition he does not understand what bach is aiming at from these he goes not knowing of the existence of the inventions to the well-tempered clavichord against the pieces in this collection that pleases him he makes a mark at first there are very few of these with further acquaintance several more are added then still more till at last in the first part about half and in the second part perhaps two-thirds have their mark in the margin then he ventures on the vocal compositions and now father bach appears to him as the albrecht durer of german music since he chiefly attains the great expression by the profound development and inexhaustible combination of simple ideas in this he contrasts bach with the moderns of his own time as one of the old masters whom one discovers when one seeks the way that leads from the art that pleases to that which contents but he confesses we must to be sure first of all get used to these old masters it depends on them as well as on us his analysis of the saint john passion and the cantata ein Fersteborg, are masterpieces of aesthetic criticism the finest thing about them is their immediate freshness he pronounces judgments toward which he has slowly and painfully worked his way and which he is almost afraid to set forth for even to himself they seem too astonishing he ventures to set bach above handel for his parts always move so independently and yet work together with such marvellous unity as is hardly ever attained by other composers if handel is more splendid bach is truer if one is durer the other is a rubens it is rarely he goes on to say that bach pleases immediately rarely that he works directly on the emotions he addresses himself to the active inflammable and penetrating representative reason this gives the hearer the satisfaction that comes from a perception of the truth and the first bach aesthetician says of the recitatives of the saint john passion this truth this sincerity this clear delineation of characters and events merely by tones and rhythms this art that is apparently simple and hidden and yet is so rich deep and manifest who has ever exhibited this precisely this more perfectly who can even imagine it being exhibited more perfectly bach's time is therefore bound to come rochlitz does not feel that it is now close he rather believes that it will be delayed he remarks that the first enthusiasm of eighteen hundred when the rolling wheel of fate for a brief moment brought the spoke of the reverend father sebastian bach to the highest point is stifled the projected edition of bach's works did not come to anything and many people no longer saw any practical object in publishing his complete works however he recommended it apart from any practical object to the future since the revolution of things brings to the top again after a shorter or longer interval all the main manifestations of the greater human spirits this perception does honour to the artist rochlitz equally honourable to rochlitz the man in his care of bach's last child when he learned that regina susanna who had been eight years old at the death of her father was in want he published an appeal in the main number of the musicalische zeitung for eighteen hundred which runs thus rarely have i taken up the pen with so much alacrity as now for scarcely ever could i in confidence in the goodness of men be so firmly convinced of doing something useful with it as now 
the family of the Bachs has become extinct with the exception of one daughter of the great Sebastian. And this daughter, now very old, this daughter is starving. Very few people know it, for she cannot, no, she must not, shall not beg. She shall not do so, for surely people will listen to this appeal for her support. Surely there are still good men who will consider, not me, how could I hope for that, but a fitting occasion to see that the last twig of so fruitful a stem does not perish without care. If every one who has learned something from the box would give only the smallest trifle, how comfortably and free from care would the good woman be able to spend her last years? As one of the first who had learned from Bach, Beethoven sent his contribution. A year later he gave Breitkopf and Hartel a work to publish for the same good object. There were also other donors, so that enough was got together to set the remainder of the life of Bach's daughter free from galling care. Beethoven had made the acquaintance of Bach through his born teacher, Christian Gottlob Niefer, 1748-1798. to when still a boy he studied the well-tempered clavichord, which in after years he used to call his musical Bible. It was he who said, Nicht Bach, mir sollte er heißen. At the end of his life he planned an overture on the name of Bach. Zelter won two friends for Bach, Goethe and the youthful Mendelssohn. He himself had had to struggle to understand Bach, and had only gradually comprehended that, as he writes to his friend on the ninth of June, 1827, Bach, was a poet of the first order. He closes this letter, which branches out into quite a dissertation on Bach, with the remark, When everything has been weighed that can be said against him, this Leipzig cantor is a sign from God, clear yet inexplicable, to which he does not forget to add proudly that he might say to him, Du hast mir Arbeit gemacht, ich habe dich weiter ans Lied gebracht. Thou hast given me work, I have brought thee to the light. Goethe listens willingly. Zelta sends him the well-tempered clavichord, shoots the organist at Berka, plays to him from it, whereupon something of the greatness of the old master dawns upon him. On 21st of June, 1827, he writes, I expressed it to myself, as if the eternal harmony were communing with itself, as might have happened in God's bosom shortly before the creation of the world. It was thus that my inner depth was stirred, and I seemed neither to possess nor to need ears, still less eyes, or any other sense. When the young Mendelssohn was staying with him in May 1830, he had to play to Goethe a good deal of Bach. He remarked of the overture to an orchestral suite in D major, which his guest played on the piano for him. The opening is so pompous and so important that one can really see a file of trim people going down a great staircase. Zelta always regretted that his friend could not attend any of the performances of the motets in the Sing Academy. Could I, he writes, 7th September, 1827, let you hear some happy day, one of Sebastian Bach's motets, you could feel yourself at the centre of the world, as a man like you ought to be. I hear the works for the many hundredth time, and am not finished with them yet, and never will be. The best work that Zelta did for Bach was when he prevailed upon himself to retire in favour of his pupil Mendelssohn, and allow him to perform the St. Matthew Passion with the chorus of the Sing Academy. This had not been easy for him. He was on the point of dismissing with a surly reply the two young people, Edouard de Vrion, accompanied Mendelssohn on the difficult errand, who had distributed him at his work, who had disturbed him at his work on that January morning in 1829. Mendelssohn already had his band on the door to go. The old man growled something about young cubs who thought themselves capable of anything. But Devrion, from whom the whole plan had come, did not lose heart, and at last brought him round. The success of the work, so far as the singers were concerned, was decided after the first rehearsals. When the two friends set out to engage the soloists, they remarked in front of the opera house how wonderful it was that the passion should again come to light exactly a hundred years after its first performance under Bach and that an actor and a young Jew should be accountable for it. The performance took place on the 11th March. The chorus numbered about 400. The orchestra was mostly composed of dilettanti in the Philharmonic Society, with leaders of the strings and the wind drawn from the royal band. Sturmer sang the evangelist's music, Devrion that of Jesus, Bader was the Peter, Bussolt the high priest and pilot, 
Weppler, the Judas, the soprano and alto soli were taken by ladies named Schatzel, Mieder, and Tulschmeid. All gave their services free and relinquished their right to free tickets. The copying out of the parts had been undertaken by Reitz with his brother and his brother-in-law. They to refused any honorarium. Fanny Mendelssohn was angry with Spontini for having accepted two free tickets. Mendelssohn, who was then just twenty years old, conducted the whole excellently, although it was the first time he had stood before a large orchestra and chorus. In accordance with the tradition of the Singer Academy, he conducted from the piano, his face turned sideways to the audience, so that he had the first choir at his back. To humor Devrion, he beat time only in the intermezzi and the difficult passages, for the rest letting his hand hang quietly by the side. The audience was transported, not only by the work, but also by the fine dynamics of the choir, which was something unusual in those days. Not less powerful was the religious impression made by Bach's music. The crowded hall looked like a church, writes Fanny Mendelssohn. Every one was filled with the most solemn devotion. One heard only an occasional involuntary ejaculation that sprang from deep emotion. On the 21st of March, Bach's birthday, the work was repeated. Spontini had wanted to prevent a further performance, but Mendelssohn and Devrion had gone direct to the Crown Prince, whose orders the all-powerful ruler of the Berlin Opera had to obey. The enthusiasm was if possible, even greater than before. Mendelssohn, however, was not quite satisfied with the performance. The chorus and the orchestra had indeed done excellently, but in the soli there had been errors made that put him out of humour. On that evening, a select company of admirers of Bach was invited to supper at Zelter's, who was now quite reconciled with the undertaking. Frau Eduard de Vrion sat next to a man who seemed to her very affected, being continually anxious lest her wide lace trim sleeve should touch the plate. Do tell me who is the stupid fellow next to me, she said softly to Mendelssohn, who sat close by her. He held his serviette for a moment before his mouth and whispered, The stupid fellow next to you is the famous philosopher Hegel. Hegel took the warmest interest in Bach and took the opportunity to refer in his aesthetic to the master, whose grand, truly Protestant, pithy yet learned genius we have only lately learned to value again properly. Hegel saw in Bach's music the genuine Raphael-like beauty, in that it had progressed from the merely melodic to the characteristic, though the melodic remains justified as the sustaining and uniting soul. In March 1829, while he was conducting the rehearsals for the St. Matthew Passion, Mendelssohn went to Hegel's lectures on aesthetics, which were then dealing with music. For Schopenhauer, who attributed so great a significance to music, Bach did not exist. He did not fit in with the philosopher's definition of the nature of music. In the early years of the third decade, the St. Matthew Passion was produced in a great number of German towns, among them Frankfurt, Breslau, Konigsberg, Dresden, and Kassel. Leipzig did not hear it until 1841, when Mendelssohn was working there. The St. John Passion, which was performed for the first time on the 21st of February, 1833, in the Berlin Singer Academy, had not the same rapid success. The glory of having revived the B minor mass belongs to Schelbler, 1789 to 1837, the founder of the Frankfurt Kesselian Verein. He had performed the Credo as early as 1828, but nobody had taken any notice of it. In 1831, he followed it up with the Carey and the Gloria. The Berlin Singer Academy gave the first part in 1834, and the whole work, much curtailed, however, in 1835. Schelbler did not live to hear the performance of the Christmas Oratorio that he had projected. It was not given until 1858. Considered as a whole, Mendelssohn's victory hardly went further than the St. Matthew Passion. The fact that the piano and organ works now interested the public more was the by-product of this victory. We must remember, in this connection, what Mendelssohn had done for Bach by public performances of these works. The programs of his organ concerts were devoted almost exclusively to Bach. It was he who initiated Schumann into the beauty of the chorale fantasias. Of their favorite chorale prelude, Schmucke dich, o liebe Seele, Schumann writes, Round the cantus firmus hung golden garlands of leaves, and it was full of such beatitude than you yourself, that is, Mendelssohn, who had played it to him. Confess to me that if life were to deprive you of hope and faith, 
this one chorale would bring it all back again to you. The cantata still remained forgotten. Until 1843, the Singh Academy had produced only one of them. Perhaps it would have been otherwise if Mendelssohn, as he had hoped, had become Zelter's successor. Things were rather better in Leipzig, where, since the cantorate of August Eberhard Müller, 1801 to 1810, and more especially under his successor, Johann Gottfried Schicht, 1810 to 1823, Bach began to be honored again at St. Thomas's. Mendelssohn, when in Leipzig, did a great deal to introduce Bach into the concert room. The real Bach epoch for the St. Thomas choir began during the cantorate of Moritz Hauptmann, 1842 to 1868. At Frankfurt, Schelbler produced the Actus Tragicus, 1833, and the cantata Liebster Gott von Werd ich sterben, 1843 as if he had a presentiment of the early death that was to call him away from his ideal work. In Breslau, Johann Theodor Mosevius, 1788-1858, performed the cantatas Eine Fersteburg, 1835, Gottes Zeit, 1836, Seilob und Er, 1837, Wer nur den Leiben, Gott, Last Walton, 1839 and the first two parts of the Christmas Oratorio, with the Singh Academy, founded by him in 1825. He also published at the same time, in order to make these works better known, an essay on J. S. Bach in Seinen Kirchenkantaten und Choralgeschangen. Mosevius is the first great Bach aesthetician after Rochlitz, whose ideas he resumes. He always dwells upon Bach's penetrating musical treatment of the text as the characteristic feature of his art. At the same time, he recognizes the pictorial elements in his time, and shows that Bach almost always gives a figurative turn to the spiritual meaning of the words. He thinks that the key to Bach's development is to be found in his passion for pictorial illustration. As he says, Bach represents standing and moving, resting and hurrying, elevation and depression, with a naivete almost characteristic of the first beginning of art. Without abandoning this minute detail painting in his later works, his method now becomes, as it were, transfigured. His thought, vision, and emotion have remained unchanged. But in the later works, the tone painting is not so isolated. It is part and parcel of the melodic form that constitutes the basis of his movements, and his genius provided him with themes that contain in their germ all the possibilities of expression that the movement will afterwards require. In spite of its pictorial character, Mosevius regards Bach's music as genuine church music, Precisely in Sebastian Bach, he says in one place, we can clearly recognize that not this or that style alone can lay claim to the title of a church style, but that only a soul filled with the holiest and highest can speak the language that can bring the most exalted things home to us, and that discards the mean and the unworthy. He therefore concludes that the cantatas are well suited for the church service and would have been performed at the end of the sermon. Mosevius was the last to criticize Bach impartially. After that, the composer is drawn into a conflict of opinions with which he had no concern, and more than a generation had to elapse before men could again contemplate and criticize him purely as he was. The discussion was mainly upon the question of true and false church music. The reformation in church music, which in the middle of the 19th century was everywhere victorious over the inartistic ideal of pietism and rationalism, was not favorable to Bach. It harked back to the epoch before him, and condemned his cantatas in common with the whole of the church music of the eighteenth century as theatrical art not calculated for the edification of the faithful karl von winterfeld undertook the execution of the sentence in his work on der evangelische kirchengeschang und sein verhaltnis zur kunst der tonsatzes for him the true church style is that of an eckhart that aims at the objective not the subjective expression of feeling Bach, however, in spite of the ample piety that is evident in his works, is not a church composer, since his imagination always runs away with him. His art is incomprehensible by the multitude, and he aims at being dramatic. Even the extraordinary impression he makes on the souls of his hearers, and the means by which he effects this, exclude the wonderful work of Bach from the church, which is a place of worship. Winterfeld did not say this without weighing his words, for he revered Bach. He finally consoles himself with the thought 
that he can at any rate exempt the organ works from the condemnation, not seeing, as indeed Rochlitz and Mosovius before him had failed to see, that the chorale fantasias are as pictorial in their conception as the cantatas. Thus the church doors were closed to Bach. The church choirs refused to do for the cantatas what the oratorio societies had done in the concert room for the passions. While it did not occur to these societies to bring to light the treasures hidden in the cantatas, these being works with nothing of the oratorio about them, and not being long enough to fill a program. Even greater obstacles were placed in the way of the resuscitation of Bach's music by the controversy upon modern and classical art that sprang up around the work of Wagner. The consequent neglect of Bach was almost the least effect of this controversy, and in itself indeed was quite natural, for nowhere has the present such a right to be its own arbiter as an art. What did him harm, however, was the narrow definition of the classical that was put forward in opposition to the Wagnerian style and to Wagner's manner of interpreting Beethoven. The conservative party maintained that true classical music should concern itself only with perfect form and the expression of indefinite feeling and prove its true greatness by avoiding drastic tone painting and far-reaching poetic pretensions. Bach was an old musician, therefore he was a classical musician, Therefore, he could not have thought otherwise than as one was entitled to assume the classical master's thought. Thus, when he was a witness against Wagner, his thoughtless and polemical attitude was accountable for people not trying to find the real Bach, and this just at the time when his works were at last made accessible to the world. The earlier history of the publication of Bach's works is an unpleasant story. None of the hopes were fulfilled that had been built on the scheme for the publication of the complete works, at the beginning of the 19th century, by Hofmeister and Kuno, afterwards Peters. Two other publishers, Simrock and Nageli, had had similar plans, but their promises were unredeemed. They could only bring out the works for which there was a market, that is, pianoforte and instrumental compositions. The difficulties in the way of issuing the cantatas were realized by Breitkopf and Hartl, when, in 1821, they published Eine Fersterburg, at one and one-third thalers per copy. In 1829, Zelter writes to Goethe that they regarded the work as a drug. Such was the fate of the first cantata of Bach's that was offered to the German public. More success fell to the lot of the six motets which the same firm had published in 1803 at the instance of Schicht, who afterwards became a St. Thomas cantor. The publication of the Magnifica, Simrock, 1811, in E-flat major instead of D major, went almost unnoticed. After the Berlin performance of the St. Matthew Passion, circumstances seemed to improve. In 1830, the score of this work was published by Schlesinger. In the same year, Simrock printed six cantatas, Neem von uns Herr, Herr deine Augen, Ihr werdet weinen und heulen, Du hörte Israels, Herr gehe nicht ins Gericht, and Gottes seht. In 1831, Troutwein brought out the St. John Passion. Then the movement was once more checked. Thenceforward, no doubt could exist among musicians that if it were left to the publishers alone, the complete Bach would never appear, but that the work would have to be taken in hand by the community of Bach lovers. Schelbler wrote to this effect to Mendelssohn's friend, the singer Franz Hauser, 1794 to 1870, who had a large collection of Bach autographs and copies. In 1837, Schumann, who had done so much for Bach with his pen, inquired in the Neue Zeitschrift für Musik whether it would not be an opportune and useful thing if the German nation were to resolve upon the publication of the complete works of Bach, and he referred to two letters of Beethoven that had just been made public, in which the composer had congratulated the publisher Hofmeister on his projected edition of Bach. When in 1843 the formation of the English Handel Society was announced, Schumann remarked in his journal that the time was no longer distant when the plan of a complete Bach edition might be laid before the public. In July 1850, the Bach Geschelschaft came into being. At its head was Moritz Hauptmann, then cantor at St. Thomas's, Otto Jahn, the biographer of Mozart and professor of archaeology at Leipzig, Karl Ferdinand Becker, professor of the organ at the Leipzig Conservatoire, and Schumann. The printing and the financial arrangements were undertaken by Breitkopf and Hartl. From the commencement, the undertaking had the greatest difficulties to contend against. 
there really should have been some years of preparatory labor in order to sift the material and to draw up a clear plan for the edition it was feared however that public interest might slacken if something were not issued at once consequently a start was made with what happened to be ready in this way an element of disorder crept in that was never afterwards mastered the editors lived from hand to mouth thus the b minor mass and the french and english suites were published without any reference to the oldest versions for the mass the autograph formerly in nageli's possession now in the royal library in berlin which of course necessitated new and corrected editions at first the members of the committee had thought that voluntary labor would be sufficient to see the edition through but it soon became evident that the task demanded the whole strength and the whole time of some one from the ninth year onward the work developed upon wilhelm roost eighteen hundred and twenty two to eighteen hundred and ninety two the grandson of the well-known composer friedrich wilhelm roost of dresden seventeen hundred and thirty nine to seventeen hundred and ninety six who with emmanuel bach plays an important part in the history of the pianoforte sonata he superintended the issue with ideal devotion from the ninth until the twenty-eighth year the prefaces which he contributed to the separate volumes are sometimes masterly they deal not only with critical and historical matters but with purely practical questions relating to the manner of performing bach's music towards the end he fell off the task exceeded the powers of one man the responsibility was also too great for a single person to bear in eighteen hundred and eighty two he surrendered the editorship in order to be more equal to his new duties as cantor at st thomas's to which post he had been appointed in eighteen hundred and eighty in his place came new forces dorfel count waldersee naumann Wulner. these completed the difficult work in accordance with a prearranged scheme on the twenty seventh january nineteen hundred the completed final volume year forty sixth was laid before the committee on which not one of the original founders of the bach geschelschaft was represented to the very end the work had been carried on in face of an apathetic public the number of subscribers of whom there were three hundred and fifty at the end of the first year did not increase without the enthusiastic labors of franz liszt and hauser who exerted themselves to fill up the gaps as they arose the number would not even have remained at that the financial situation was always so bad that the question of the continuance of the society was raised time after time only a few artists realized the magnitude of the undertaking of the bach gesellschaft among them was brahms who used to say that the two greatest events during his lifetime were the founding of the german empire and the completion of the bach edition the church choirs whose help had been counted on did absolutely nothing it must however be admitted that the method of publication was the most unpractical that could have been devised people had to subscribe for the whole edition and pay for each volume in advance single volumes could not be bought separately the society thus threw away the good business they might have done with separate issues that were in general request such as the passions and the piano and organ works and the general public was not brought into touch with the weighty undertaking when at last in eighteen hundred and sixty nine it was resolved to sell the volumes separately at thirty marks per volume that is double the subscription price it was too late the press practically ignored the work the history of the publication of bach's works is thus a repetition of the history of his own life the undertaking of the bach gesellschaft was supplemented by the work of one man spita's life of bach of which the first volume appeared in eighteen hundred and seventy four the second in eighteen hundred and eighty for the first time the world had a real biography of the master before forkel's book writers on the subject had simply reproduced the necrology with more or less of their own fantasy after forkel they were content to gather together the existing information no one had issued a work adequate to the historical questions involved peter eighteen hundred and thirteen to eighteen hundred and eighty five afterwards prussian minister of finance had indeed set himself this aim in his book on bach eighteen hundred and sixty five without succeeding in getting beyond dilettantism spita's work is really a unique performance among artistic biographies it is rarely that the first scientific investigator of an art epoch leaves so little for his successors to do as in this case he not only awoke bach to new life but vivified the whole world in which bach had worked it was indeed not a work for the average reader 
nor a book for musicians to refer to casually for this it was too exclusively scientific and not always simple and clear enough in its plan the author having worked too closely together the story of bach's life an analysis of his works and an account of contemporary art only those who had the time and the enthusiasm to follow him in his tortuous path could really appreciate the depths and the many beauties of the work it was predestined to serve as a storehouse of material for writers of bach biographies of the popular kind nor was it wholly satisfactory to musicians on the aesthetic side it contains indeed many admirable analyses couched in poetic language there are some which no one who reads them can ever forget but the aesthetic viewpoint is too subordinate to the historical and owing to the plan of the book the essential artistic quality of bach's art is never presented as a whole rené de Ressy has formulated this approach most clearly in the revue des deux mondes for eighteen hundred and eighty five Spita saw that Bach aesthetic was no longer so simple as in the time of Mosevius. He is too obviously bent on holding up the cantor of St. Thomas's as representative of pure music, as an exemplar to the erring artists of his own day. The historical inquiry had prejudiced the aesthetic. So it was, again, with the subsequent biographies that were based on Spita. They do not complete him on the artistic side in the desired way and they are too much under his influence in another respect following him in the plan of mixing up the biography with analyses of the works there is not the slightest reason for this with bach in the case of no other artist has the external course of his life so little to do with the origin of his works or is what we know of his life so insignificant and as regards his personal experience so uninteresting still we are bound to recognize how much these popular biographies of bach have done for him those whom according to hauptmann the promoters of the collected edition of bach's works had principally in view actually profited by it least though correct scores of the cantatas were from the very beginning issued at the rate of something like ten each year performances of them were hardly more frequent than before matters did not improve in this respect until the bach society sprang up in various towns in vienna whither the saint matthew passion had penetrated in eighteen hundred and sixty two brahms as conductor of the local singverein exerted himself on behalf of the cantatas in our own time robert franz fought for them with his pen the passions after about eighteen hundred and sixty were taken up in most towns for the piano compositions franz liszt continued the work that mendelssohn had begun and by brilliant transcriptions of the organ compositions especially of the g minor and a minor fugues forced bach as an organ composer on the public attention the peters edition carried the preludes fugues and chorale preludes into every church about the middle of the forties a landmark in the victorious course of bach was afforded by the inauguration of the eisenach memorial in eighteen hundred and eighty five where the reverence of the artists who assembled round liszt found public expression it was well known that wagner was an admirer of bach he regarded him as the great teacher of beethoven who cut himself loose from haydn as the youth developed into the man he had thus expressed in his essay what is german the significance of bach for german spiritual life if we would comprehend the wonderful originality strength and significance of the german mind in one incomparably eloquent image we must look keenly and discerningly at the appearance otherwise almost inexplicably mysterious of the musical marvel sebastian bach he is the history of the inner life of the german mind during the awful century when the german people was utterly extinguished look at this head hidden in its absurd french full-bottomed wig look at this master a miserable cantor and organist in little thuringian towns whose names we hardly know now wearing himself out in poor situations always so little considered that it needed a whole century after his death to rescue his works from oblivion even in his music taking up with an art form which externally was the complete likeness of his epoch dry stiff pedantic like perukes and pigtails in notes and see now the world the incomprehensibly great sebastian built up out of these elements to these creations i only refer briefly since it is impossible to characterize by any comparison whatever their wealth their grandeur and their all-embracing significance unfortunately wagner nowhere discusses the nature of bach's art more thoroughly or fixes his aesthetic impression of it nor must it be overlooked that for wagner 
Bach's cantatas hardly ranked as true church music, of which his own ideal was pure chorale song with occasional organ accompaniment. He regards the addition of instruments as the beginning of the decline of this branch of the art, which explains why Wagner often speaks of Bach's motets but hardly mentions the cantatas. But it was in his works rather than in his words that he prepared the way for Bach. From them the world learned again to look for a profound inner relation between word and tone in the musical setting of poetry. The outcome of Wagner's art was a revolution of the whole musical consciousness. The hearer became exigent. Henceforth only the true characteristic in music could satisfy him. Only the truly dramatic could move him. Thus a whole mass of music sank slowly into the abyss of oblivion. And by the side of the music drama of Wagner, the dramatic religious music of Bach came out in clear light. Warring as Wagner did against the beautiful in music, he was at the same time, though unconsciously, fighting for Bach, whose pithy and often most poetical conception of the text in the motets astonished him. It is only now, after the strife is over, that we can see the importance of the victory. The magnitude of the change of view makes it wholly incomprehensible to us how the post-Beethovenian epoch could remain insensible to the greatness of Bach, and how even those who planned the great Bach edition could make a distinction between the pleasing and the unpleasing works. Bach numbered from the beginning many admirers among French musicians, as was shown by their ardent cooperation in the subscription for the collected edition. Among them was Gounod, whose understanding of Bach must not be estimated merely by his dubious arrangement of the C major prelude and the older school of French organists. Saint Saëns must indubitably be reckoned among the best Bach connoisseurs, and the same may be said of Gabriel Fauré, Gimon, Vidor, and Gigou, the creators of modern French organ music derived directly from Bach. The violinist Charles Bouvet, with his little Bach society, worked hard for the instrumental works. The Paris performance of the St. Matthew Passion by the Concordia Society under Vidor in 1885 was a decisive point in the public recognition of Bach. The Schola Cantorum under Vincent Diendi and Bordes gave excellent performances of some of the cantatas. This again was a special object of the Paris Bach Society, begun under the auspices of Fauré and Vidor, the conductor of which, Gustave Brett, is chiefly bent on organizing a capable choir perhaps the most difficult of the undertaking in Paris. The lack of mixed choirs is, generally speaking, the greatest obstruction to the diffusion of Bach's works in France. Many years may still elapse before a change is made in this respect, and the Bach of the cantatas becomes more widely known. Excellent Bach translations have been made by, among others, Maurice Bouchot and Madame Henriette Fuchs, a uniform translation of the whole of the cantatas is being prepared by G. Brett, the conductor of the Bach Society. In France, as a matter of fact, we can best realize how Wagner had prepared the way for Bach. The enthusiasm for Bach sprang up when the Wagner enthusiasm that had finally become little more than a fashion had spent itself, and the conviction arose that there was something alien to French artistic feeling in Wagner's union of poetry and music. It was precisely at this stage that Bach came on the scene. Every year it became more obvious how largely his system of musical characterization coincides with French artistic perceptions. His characterization is wholly plastic. Whereas the monumental formlessness of Wagner sets an ever-widening gulf between him and the French genius. Even French military music has come under the influence of Bach. In order to make the chorale preludes accessible to the people, Monsieur T. Bartnier, chef de musique of the 15th Regiment of Infantry in Bordeaux, has arranged them for military band and plays them at promenade concerts. England has this advantage over France, that it possesses exceptionally fine choruses. The future will show how the contest there between Bach and Handel will end. That the musical saint of the English is regarded on the continent as decidedly inferior to Bach cannot be denied. And the general experience is that cultivation of the cantatas of the one leads to something like injustice to the oratorios of the other, which, a couple of decades ago, completely dominated the musical world. Mendelssohn, in this respect, shares the fate of Handel. In Belgium, the indefatigable Gervert fought Bach's battle with great success. Bach triumphed also in Rome. At first, many of his works were produced privately by Herr von Keudel, 
Frau Professor Helbig and Frau Dr. Mengarini. Alessandro Costa rehearsed the B minor mass with a small chorus recruited from these circles. In the spring of 1889, the whole of higher Roman society was invited to a performance of the mass in the oratory in the Via Belsiana. In his Triomfo de la Morte, 1894, Gabriel D'Annunzio gives a picture of the public at this memorable performance and the impression it made. The Roman Bach Society dates from the year 1895. All this, however, constitutes only the external history of Bach's victory. To estimate its true magnitude, we must look in the scores of the composers of the 19th century. Since Mendelssohn, every composer of any significance has been to school to Bach, not as a pedantic teacher, but to one who impels them to strive after the truest and clearest expression, and to achieve impressiveness not by the wealth of the means they employ, but by the pregnancy of their themes. In Wagner, the spirit of Bach is most evident in the score of the Meister Singer. An interesting Bach Renaissance is visible in the consummate polyphony of Max Rega. How Bach will influence modern orchestral compositions cannot yet be seen. Only this much is clear, that he will lead us back to a certain simplicity and will develop in a quite extraordinary way the sense of form of future generations. As regards the present-day esteem of Bach, we must beware of taking all verbal enthusiasm for reality. Since it ceased to be a risk and became a recommendation to swear by Bach, lip service has been plentiful. Much of what is said of him represents no personal experience at all, but is a mere echo of the experience of others. How far have we really got? He is clearly influencing domestic music. This is beyond dispute. The inventions, the sweets, and the well-tempered clavichord have become the property of the people. What the average amateur of the present day lacks in theoretical musical education is supplied for him by these works of Bach from which he unconsciously imbibes certain principles of thematic formation, of part writing, of modulation and of construction, and from which he acquires a certain unconscious critical faculty that protects him against inferior art. As regards our public music, the conditions are not so satisfactory. To expect to hear the complete Bach in our concert rooms would be to experience many disappointments. Our pianoforte virtuosi give us transcriptions of the organ works rather than original piano compositions, on what grounds is not apparent. Why must it always be the A minor prelude and fugue that is given to the public? Even in Liszt's arrangement, they are merely makeshifts on the piano. Where can we hear, except rarely, performances of the suites, the well-tempered clavichord, the Italian concerto, the chromatic fantasia, the piano concerto in A minor, the C major concerto for two pianos, where are the Brandenburg orchestral concertos and the orchestral suites securely fixed in our programs? Where are Bach's secular cantatas regularly given? Statistics of Bach performances in our concert programs would bring some curious facts to light and would show that there are not too many towns where the auditor can really get to know Bach. The church cantatas stand in a category of their own. Even where the passions are regularly given, there are certain difficulties in the way of producing the cantatas. It looks as if their title were against them. Many conductors who have vowed themselves to the service of Bach think it injudicious to place cantatas on their programs, with the exception of the one or two that have become classics. They do not strike these people as sufficiently decorative. When, however, one of them takes it into his head to devote a whole evening to the cantatas, he has to invoke all the muses and all the saints against his choral committee, who are afraid that the program will not draw, or that it offers too little variety. One often believes oneself back in the days, it was in 1858, when so excellent an institution as the Hamburg Bach Society, terrified lest there might be too much Bach in the program, arranged it in this way. An eight-part motet by Bach, Chopin's Berceus, the Hall of Song scenes from Tannhauser, in a piano arrangement, Bach's chorale, Yeshu Minor Freude. Laterally, the question has been sharply debated whether the cantatas should be given elsewhere than in church. A paper read at the second Bach festival, 1904, took for its motto, The Church Works of Bach for the Church. The demand seems at bottom just and yet is false. Bach's cantatas today could only in quite exceptional cases be given in the course of the church service. 
and it is neither to be expected nor to be wished that the service should be so altered as to restore the old Leipzig conditions. The independent position of music in the ritual at that time was, as a matter of fact, something quite unnatural in itself, and only explicable by peculiar historical circumstances. The evolution of things has led to a separation between the church service and art that is good for both of them. We have the service on one side, and on the other the sacred concert, or whatever name people may prefer to call it by. The ideal for the present day is really a sacred concert, composed of three or four Bach cantatas, selected for the appropriateness of their text to the ecclesiastical season. Pure Bach services of this kind should have the preference over the liturgical celebrations that are grouped round a Bach cantata. Yet, here again, opinions differ. It should be observed, however, that under these circumstances the church must no longer be regarded as a sacred place. If the church for any reason is not available, the performances can be transferred to the concert room without their religious character being affected thereby. How can Bach help it if churches are often so built today that no chorus and no orchestra can be placed in them, or only in such a way that the chorus sings into the backs of the audience? The great point is that Bach, like every lofty religious mind, belongs not to the church, but to religious humanity and that any room becomes a church in which his sacred works are performed and listened to with devotion. It follows that everything that might disturb the audience must be avoided, and that a single cantata in a program of other works is no use, either a cantata evening or no cantata at all. Wherever such cantata evenings have been ventured upon, their success has shown that all the fears for them, real or imaginary, were groundless. In comparison with the cantatas, everything else that Bach has done appears as hardly more than a supplement, so long as the public has heard only the Passions, the Mass, and the Christmas Oratorio, we cannot say that the whole Bach is ours again. He is not yet known, and will not be until then. History and criticism have done almost all for him that can be done. It is time for the aesthetic to take the place of the historical, time to try to comprehend the nature of Bach's art in its whole depth, and its rich multifariousness. The necessity also becomes more and more urgent for more exact investigation into the musical practice of Bach's time. From this quarter much interesting light is yet to be thrown. We need it. The deeper we go into the question of how Bach should be performed, the more complicated it becomes. It breaks up into a number of questions of detail, which can be solved only by historical gleanings and by ever-repeated practical trials. For the elucidation of these questions, as well as for the spreading of a wider general knowledge of Bach, much is to be hoped for from the triennial Bach festivals planned by the Bach Geschelschaft. The hope seems justifiable. The four that have already been held have done much to stimulate interest. It is certain, however, that Bach festivals and everything else that we can do ad gloriam Bachi, are not what are finally needed most, but the quiet, modest work of thousands of unknown men, who go to Bach for nothing more than their own inner satisfaction, and love to communicate these riches to their neighbours. Only to people like these will he truly reveal himself. End of chapter 12 Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama Chapter 13 of J. S. Bach by Albert Schweitzer Translated by Ernest Newman Read for you by Chiquito Crasto Music performed by Jonathan Schofield Read for you by Chiquito Crasto The Organ Works Of all his preludes and fugues for the organ, only the prelude and fugue in E-flat in the third part of the Clavier Ubung was published by Bach. Everything else of this order has come down to us in manuscript, either in autographs comprising about a third, or in copies, or even in copies of copies. It is really wonderful that under these circumstances more should not have been lost. We possess the F minor prelude and its fugue, for example, only in a copy made by a pupil of Kittel. We owe the preservation of the great C minor fantasia.
to Krebs, who, as he notes at the end of it, made a copy of it on the 10th January 1751, a few months after the master's death. This manuscript had almost fallen into the hands of a shopkeeper for use as waste paper. Beneficent fate willed that it should be rescued by Reichard Coat, organist in Altenburg. The Russian pianist Palskow of Petersburg deserves mention as a kind of unfaithful steward among copyists. He undertook to improve the Dorian Toccata, and to this end behaved towards it, as Rust says, like a Russian censor. The majority of the organ compositions belong to the Weimar and pre-Weimar periods, at Koten and in the first Leipzig period. Bach appears only occasionally to have written for this instrument. Afterwards, however, about 1735, the first love revives in him, and he writes the gigantic organ works of his latest and maturest period. In the same period, he sifted and revised his earlier compositions, during which occupation he was overtaken by death. It is only in exceptional cases that we can determine precisely the date of composition of the separate preludes and fugues. Spita thinks that the great G major prelude with its fugue, Peter's 2, number 2, BG 15, number 11, belongs to 1724 or 1725, and the C major prelude, Peter's 2, number 1, BG 15, number 15, to 1730. He bases this opinion on the fact that the watermark of the paper used for the autograph is the same as that in the scores of the cantatas of those years. As a rule, we have to rely on internal chronological evidences. Fortunately, they are fairly clear. For every discriminating player, the preludes and fugues on close acquaintance fall into four groups. The works in which Bach is still under the influence of contemporary masters, those in which his independent mastery is evident, the consummate compositions of the Weimar period, and the final works. There are about a dozen preludes and fugues in which Bach reveals himself as a gifted pupil of Frescobaldi and Buxtehude. The storm and stress of the whole of the early organ art comes to life again in these works. The preludes have a kind of dramatic excitement and are somewhat spasmodic and lacking in unity. The fugues are often confused, but the proportions on which the works are laid out give us the feeling that the future promises something great. Bach owed his development not only to his perpetually improving organ technique, but before all to the study of Legrenzi, Corelli and Vivaldi, whose music was just then becoming known in Germany. Here he learned what neither Buxtehude nor Frescobaldi had been able to teach him, clearness and plasticity of the musical structure. In the C minor fugue, Peters 4, number 6, BG 38, number 14, upon a theme of Legrenzi. And in that, in B minor, Peters 4, number 8, BG 38, number 19, in which Corelli's fugue on, is expanded from 39 bars to 100. We see his efforts to realize a new ideal and to design in simpler, broader lines. In the Cansona in D minor, Peters 4, No. 10, BG 38, No. 20, he has entered the world of beautiful forms, which he never leaves again. In the G major Fantasia, Peter 4, No. 2, BG 38, No. 10, there is a lengthy five-part section of tranquil and finished polyphony, surrounded by quick and brilliant, yet at the same time simplified northern passage work. Thus did Bach win his freedom from Buxtehude by means of the Italians, and was enabled to bring to glorious reality the ideals that for two generations had agitated German organ music. We can only surmise in what order the works came in which he rises to independent mastery. An important point in Bach's work is no doubt indicated by the small G minor fugue, Peters 4, number 7, BG 38, number 18, and the well-known D minor Toccata and Fugue, Peters 4, number 4, BG 15, page 267. So vigorously and broadly laid out a theme as that of the G minor fugue is not to be met with in previous organ music. To say nothing of the rapid and weighty development of the fugue, in which there is hardly a trace of the ordinary fugal phraseology. Only the second pedal passage that seems to belong to the older world is inexpressive. In the D minor toccata and fugue, the strong and ardent spirit has finally realized the laws of form. A single dramatic ground thought unites the daring passage work on the toccata that seems to pile up like wave and wave. 
and in the fuga the intercalated passages and broken chords only serve to make the climax all the more powerful the peculiar charm of these works comes from their spontaneous freshness of invention they affect the hearer almost more powerfully than any other of bach's organ works and to play them is always to experience something of what the master himself must have felt when for the first time he exploited the full possibilities of the organ with regard to wealth of tone and variety of combination for this reason the wonderful pathos of the prelude and fuga in d major peters four number three b g fifteen number two and the toccata and fuga in c major peters three number eight b g fifteen page two hundred and fifty three is as potent today as it ever was perhaps we are able to appreciate these works even more than our ancestors for the great music of the nineteenth century has certainly had one result it has given those who have been nourished upon it a clear criterion for distinguishing between true and false pathos and a double sense of enjoyment of the true which is so rare in the brilliant and dashing fugues belonging to these preludes and again the one belonging to the majestic c major prelude peters four number one b g fifteen number one there is an extraordinary display of virtuosity we must not judge them too strictly by the rule that a fugue should be good in the first part better in the middle and excellent in the last for the two fugues in c major at any rate fall off in quality somewhat towards the end between these masterpieces of his youth and his real masterpieces bach himself has drawn a clearly perceptible line the former he left as they were at the others he worked incessantly until he had given them their definite form thus it happens that for these works it is not the oldest copies often not even the autographs that are the most valuable but the manuscripts that embody the work in its latest form the extant autograph of the prelude and fuga in a major peters two number three b g fifteen number six for example has no practical value since it gives us merely an earlier imperfect form of the work in three-eighths time instead of three-fourths it should be noted too that in the manuscripts the indication of certain preludes as fantasias or toccatas is not uniform sometimes they are not even entitled prelude but vaguely ps d'org these are occasional italian titles bach worked longest at the fugues in a minor peters two number eight b g fifteen number thirteen and g minor peters two number four b g fifteen number twelve the original form of the a minor subject is found in a three-part clavier fugue in this shape The elements of the latter theme are already all there, but the great and simple melodic line that the musician is striving after is as yet hidden by accessories, and is too abbreviated to be effective. Only after long labors did it attain the calm plasticity of the finished theme, with its mixture of playfulness and strength in the semi-quavers. The plan of the fugue and its main incidents are already prefigured in the first form. The A minor has also undergone revision. There is a copy of it, J. P. Kellner's, in which its essential chromatic line does not come out clearly through the majestic thread of the opening. Definite form. Original form. In the second edition of his great General Bachschule, Mattison tells us that at an organ examination in 1725, he gave the candidates the following theme to develop extempore. He does not mention Bach's name, but says he knows well to whom the theme belongs, and who was the first to work it out artistically. The most natural assumption is that he had heard the fugue during Bach's Hamburg journey of 1720. It would thus be one of the works that the master played to Reinken at that time, perhaps out of compliment to him, the theme of the fugue being, in fact, borrowed from Reinken. In Bach's version, the theme is much simpler and more elegant. It runs thus.
How is this difference to be explained? In the form in which Mattison quotes it, the original one, which Bach has altered and improved? Or has Mattison remembered it wrongly and misquoted it? The probability is that the theme never existed save in its present perfect form. Mattison knew it, but he could not give it to his candidate in this shape because, according to the rules of fugue, it was incorrect. It is laid down in the rules that a fugue theme shall not extend over an octave. The Hamburg examiner therefore thought it necessary to alter Bach's theme in order to bring it into conformity with the eternal laws of the art. The fugues in B minor and G minor are virtuoso works, like those in C major and D major. Not, however, like those merely brilliant streams of notes, but perfect architectonic creations, late Gothics, in music. As in that medieval form of architecture, the luxuriant detail of the pierced work only serves to unify and vitalize the simple, boldly flung lines and to exhibit power in its utmost flexibility. The A minor fugue is the simpler and clearer in construction. That in G minor surpasses it, however, in richness of imagination. In general, however, in the Weimar fugues, virtuosity becomes less and less prominent. The themes become compact, simple, unadorned, almost severe. In the working out, there is no longer any thought of effect. On the borderline stands the G major fugue, Peters 2, number 2, BG 15, number 11, the theme of which, in a minor form, however, is used again in the first chorus of the cantata Ich hatte viel Becumernis, number 21. The themes of the others no longer proceed by way of rapid passage work, but are built up of massive notes. This similarity groups them into a category of their own. They are the fugues in C major, Peters 2, number 1, BG 15, number 15, C minor, Peters 2, number 6, BG 15, number 16, C minor, Peters 3, number 6, BG 15, number 7, F minor, Peters 2, number 5, BG 15, number 4, F major, Peters 3, number 2, BG 15, number 10, D minor, Peters 3, number 3, BG 15, number 8, and A major, Peters 2, number 3, BG 15, number 6. Their lack of showy effects accounts for these works not being so popular with players and audiences as the A minor and G minor fugues. But one has only to live with them to prize them more highly than those, even if at first sight they have not the same fascination. They represent the pure sublime, not as before, the sublime in guise of the pathetic. The C minor fugue. and the F minor fugue. Are so tremendously tragic, precisely because they have divested themselves of every shred of passion and express only great sorrow and deep longing. The theme of the D minor fugue is indescribably suggestive of tranquil power. It throws out its limbs like an arc of mighty stones. Those who still maintain that Bach's fugues are too elaborately wrought for church use are apparently ignorant of this one, or do not feel the palestrina-like character of its style, or perceive that all these themes are really embodiments of religious ideas. An organist who recognizes their true character once declared that he could no longer hear them without imagining a secret superscription to each of them. The C minor fugue, with its grand victory over its chromatic counter-theme, seemed to him the symbol of confident faith. Over the sunny and vivacious A major fugue, he would write the gladsomeness of faith. It is worth noting that the same theme, slightly modified, dominates the orchestral introduction to the cantata Treat of Dyer Globensbahn, number 152. The curious step rhythm that runs through it, it should be noted. The question of how many of the preludes and fugues originated together is difficult to decide. The preludes and fugues in A major, D minor, Toccata, C major, and G major seem to have sprung from the same ideas. This is also the case with the prelude and fugue in E minor, Peters 3, number 10, BG 15, number 3, which are unique in their brevity and concision. In the A minor fugue, the inner kinship of its theme with the motives of the prelude is so obvious that it seems to rise from the foaming prelude like Venus from the waves of the sea. On the other hand, 
It looks as if the two C minor preludes and the Toccata in F major belonged to a later period than their respective fugues. Bach has apparently substituted these preludes for earlier ones, with which he was dissatisfied. If this be the case, he has nevertheless conceived the substituted preludes in the spirit of the fugues, preserving in each case an inner community between the two pieces. He has always conceived preludes and fugues in pairs. If we find isolated specimens of each, they are works rejected by him at some revision or other. We may probably assume two dates at which Bach revised his organ works. The first fell in the period when Friedemann and Emanuel were in a position to play their father's compositions. This would account for the fact that the preludes and fugues in G major and C major, in their definitive form, are written on paper of 1725 and 1730. A later and much more drastic revision probably took place towards the end of his Leipzig period, when Bach, having practically ceased to write cantatas, began to feel a new interest in his organ works. It is possible that he had the idea of making a complete collection of his prelude and fugues, as well as of the larger chorales he had revised. Then after his death, the basis for such a collection existed is proved by the fact that in a number of manuscript copies, the fugues and preludes in A minor and C major, and the pair in C minor, Peters II, No. 6, B.G. 15, No. 16, with the three last Leipzig works, the preludes and fugues in C major, Peters II, No. 7, B.G. 15, No. 17, B minor, Peters II, No. 10, B.G. 15, No. 14, and E minor, Peters II, No. 9, BG 15, number 18, are grouped together as the six great preludes and fugues. Besides these three great Leipzig works, there is a fourth, the prelude and triple fugue in E-flat major, Peters 3, number 1, BG 3, pages 173 and 254, which embody the great chorales that appeared in 1739 as the third part of the Klavierubung. The preludes and fugues in C major, B minor and E minor, however, belong to a later date. The works of this period, apart from the preludes and fugues in C major, show a return to the style of Buxtehude. They are not constructed on a single unified idea, like those of Bach's Middle Epoch, but are based on the dramatic opposition of different themes. Nevertheless, the power and vastness of the design gives the works an air of grandeur that is very different from the dramatic restlessness of Buxtehude and Frescobaldi. The old German organ style thus receives its final transfiguration in the symphonic works of Bach's old age just as his last organ chorale, when we're in Hoxton Notum Sind, brings the Pachelbel style of chorale treatment to perfection. It is the symphonic character of the latest works that makes it possible that the two preludes in C minor, which are conceived in the same spirit, belong to the same epoch, although they are grouped with fugues of the Weimar period. In the F major toccata and the C major prelude, Peters II, No. 7, BG 15, No. 17, there is a return to the virtuoso style, now, however, raised to a higher dignity and simplicity. In each case, a single idea is worked out in complete accordance with its own nature. The C major prelude reminds us strongly of the first chorus in the cantata Sai Wirden aus Saba, Alle Kommen, No. 65. The prelude in E-flat major that introduces the greater chorales symbolizes godlike majesty. The triple fugue at the end of them is a symbol of the Trinity. The same theme recurs in three connected fugues, but each time with another personality. The first fugue is calm and majestic, with an absolutely uniform movement throughout. In the second, the theme seems to be disguised and is only occasionally recognizable in its true shape, as if to suggest the divine assumption of an earthly form. In the third, it is transformed into rushing semi-quavers, as if the Pentecostal wind were coming roaring from heaven. Perhaps the most striking thing among these Leipzig works is a flowery arabesque of the B minor prelude. The E minor prelude and fugue are so mighty in design and have so much harshness blended with their power that the hearer can only grasp them after several hearings. Time is needed again before one can feel at home in the quiet world of the B minor and C major fugues. It is not less certain that only by degrees do we find our footing in the majestic monotony of the F major toccata and the C major prelude. This does not imply, however, that these works should not be performed in church and at sacred concerts, but rather that they could not be played often enough. Nor are they too long for the church service. The few minutes that they take can be found somehow in the liturgy. This is not too much to expect. To play the works with cuts is criminal. The Eight Little Preludes and Fugues, Peters 8, B.G. 38, and the Organ Sonata, Peters 1, B.G. 15, were written for the instruction of the two eldest sons. Any student with a fairly good piano technique can take up these works at once in order to perfect 
habilitate himself in pedal study, as they said in Bach's time. He will reach his goal quicker and better than with modern organ schools, against which, while fully admitting their merits, the reproach always holds good that they keep the student too long at the elements and are too pedagogic in plan. Bach, on the other hand, loved to place his pupils at once in the midst of difficulties. In the strictest sense of the term, it is wrong to speak of Bach's organ sonatas. The two manuscripts in which they have come down to us, one from Friedemann's possession, the other from Emmanuel's, prove that they are really works for the clavicembalo with its two manuals and pedals. This instrument was at that time in common use. It was excellently adapted for playing in three real parts, which accounts for the sonatas being in strict trio form. This does not imply that Bach never played them on the organ also. He intended the last movement of the E minor sonata to come between the prelude and the fugue in G major, Peters II, No. 2, BG 15, No. 11, and the Largo from the C major sonata to come between the prelude and the fugue in G minor, Peters III, No. 5, BG 15, No. 5. If these sonatas were written for Friedemann, they must have originated towards the end of the second decade of the century. Some sections of them are indeed older. The first movement of the D minor sonata, for example, that occurs among the variants of the first part of the well-tempered clavichord. This collection was finished in 1722. An older version of the Adagio and of the Vivace of the sonata in E minor for Obo d'Amore, Gamba, and Continuo figures as the introduction to the second part of the cantata Die Himmel Crux Irjalen, number 76, which certainly belongs to the year 1723. According to Spita, the whole of the organ sonatas were in existence as early as 1727. In 1733, Friedemann went to Dresden as organist. We cannot say enough of the beauty of these sonatas, writes Forkel. For the connoisseur, indeed, there is hardly a purer aesthetic delight than to pursue these three contrapuntal lines, so free and yet so bound by the laws of beauty, through their delightful intertwinings, to say nothing of the perfection of the themes. The dreamy subject of the adagio of the D minor sonata made even Bach himself its captain, took it up again later and made it into a trio full of longing for clavier, flute and violin. Forkel tells us that Friedemann owed his consummate technique to these sonatas, which is quite credible. To this very day, they are the gradus ad parnassum for every organist. Whoever has studied them thoroughly will find scarcely a single difficulty in the old or even in modern organ music that he has not met with there and learned how to overcome. And before all, he will have attained that absolute precision that is the chief essential for good organ playing, since in this complicated trio playing the slightest unevenness in touch is heard with appalling clearness. It is noteworthy that Friedemann's manuscript of the sonatas on which the Peters edition is founded, contains many more embellishment than Bach's own autograph copy, which Emmanuel possessed. This belonged to a later date than Friedemann's copy. We see from this how Bach became more and more sparing with ornaments. It is indeed one of the reproaches levelled against him by his critic Scheiber. The edition of the Bach Gesellschaft follows the autograph. Both manuscripts are now in the Berlin Library. The Pascaglia, Peters 1, page 75, BG 15, page 289, was also written in the first place for the cembalo with pedal and later arranged for the organ. As a matter of fact, its polyphonic structure fits in so thoroughly for the organ that we can hardly understand nowadays how anyone could have ventured to play it on a stringed instrument. On the other hand, there is no organ work that makes such demands as this is the matter of registration. Each of the twenty sections constructed on the repeated bass theme must have its characteristic tone color, and yet, if disconnectedness is to be avoided, no color must be too sharply differentiated from its predecessor or its successor. Pascaglia, in French, Pasacaille, properly denotes an old Spanish dance. Musicians understood by it a piece constructed on a recurring bass theme, in the Chiaconna, in French, Chacon, which is also developed like a string of pearls. It was permissible to introduce the theme in any voice. In Bach's work, the theme appears several times in the upper part, so that it is not a pure Pascaglia, but partakes of the nature of both the Pascaglia and the Chacon. The work was conceived under the influence of Buxtehude, whose organ compositions in this genre are of considerable significance. It therefore seems somewhat strange that there are not a number of youthful works by Bach in this style. He saw clearly, however, that on the whole the incoherency of this kind of work was not suitable to the greatest organ music, and he ventured upon the experiment only with this colossal theme. 
he follows his teacher again in grouping the Pascaglia with a fugue. Buxtehude, however, placed this at the beginning, while Bach, with more reason, places it at the end, where it has the effect of rising to a climax. But in the last resort, no comparison of Bach's Pascaglia with any of Buxtehude's works of the same kind is possible, for the pupil puts into his a dramatic life that was beyond the power of the master. Both the external and the internal evidence points to the later Weimar period as the date of origin of this work. The autograph was still known to exist about the middle of the 19th century. Since then it has disappeared completely, like that of the prelude and fugue in B minor that must be somewhere in Scotland. Both autographs were used for Peter's edition. The chorale preludes which he thought worth preserving were grouped by Bach in five collections, containing altogether about 90 of these works. They are the Orgel Buchlein, begun in Weimar and written out in a fair copy at Coton, the chorales published in 1739 as a third part of the Klavierbung, six chorales published by Schubler of Zeller about 1747, the canonic variations on the Christmas hymn Von Himmel hoch da kon ich her, published about the same time by Balthasar Schmidt of Nuremberg, which Bach afterwards submitted to the Miesler Society in joining its ranks, and the collection of 18 great chorales, during the revision of which he was overtaken by death. Another fifty or so chorale preludes, mostly youthful works, have come down to us in copies made by pupils and friends. Some of these, for example, that for double pedal on Anfarsiflusion Babylons, Peters 5, number 122, would certainly have been included by Bach in the collection had he got that far with the revision. It is not clear what aim he had in view in publishing the six chorales issued by Schubler. They are only arrangements of three-part chorale arias from the cantatas that have nothing in common with his other chorale preludes and do not even go particularly well on the organ. He already had in his portfolio dozens of splendid chorales ready for engraving. Why did he pass these over and issue mere transcriptions? The chorale partitas upon Christ der du bist der hellech tag, O Gott du frommer Gott, and Sai Greguset, Jesu Gutig, Peters 5, page 60 to 91, BG 40, page 107 to 123, in which the number of variations corresponds to that of the verses in the respective hymns, are certainly works of his earliest youth, as is evident from the awkward harmonization of the chorale melody and the optimal use of the pedal. When he wrote these works, Bach had not yet found himself. He was still a pupil of Bohm. Where and when he composed them, whether at Lüneburg or Arnstadt, cannot be determined. In any case, they are clever students' exercises, which it is impossible to play without being delighted with the work of original thematic figuration which they exhibit. Bach seems later on to have revised the third partita, as is fairly clear from the improvised harmonization and the obbligato use of the pedal in the last variations. The five-part final variation is a masterpiece. Afterwards, Bach no longer writes chorale variations. He was probably led away from the genre by purely artistic considerations, though we must not forget that in Weimar and Leipzig he no longer had any practical use for such works which were only serviceable in places where, according to the old custom, the organ struck in between the singing and worked out independently every other verse of the chorale, the singing ceasing. When at the end of his career Bach once more returned to this form and wrote the variations on von Himmel, Hoch da Kom ich Herr, Ich Herr, his only purpose was to pack into a single chorale the complete art of canon, and in the last variation he could not deny himself the pleasure of introducing all four lines of the melody simultaneously in the last three bars. If this work already shews the tendency to abstract thought that was characteristic of his last years, there is for all that a good deal of emotion in these chorale arrangements. They are full of Christmas joyousness and cheeriness. The first variation is of a truly bewitching beauty of tone. It is an interesting fact that besides the engraved copy we possess an original manuscript that is of later date and gives the definitive version. It is evident then that even in his printed compositions Bach always found something to improve. In the true chorale prelude, Bach appears to have cultivated chiefly the forms of Pachelbel, Bohm, Buxtehude and Reinken. Towards the end of the Weimar period, however, he becomes independent of his masters and produces a type of his own the chorale prelude of the orgel buchlein in this the melody is used as a cantus firmus unaltered and uninterrupted usually in the uppermost voice rounded plays an independently conceived motive not derived from any of the lines of the melody but prompted by the text of the chorale and embodying the poetic idea 
that Bach regarded as characteristic for music and expressible in musical terms. Thus in the chorale preludes of the Orgel Buchlein, the melody and the text are both presented at the same time, the cantus firmus being poetically illustrated by means of the characteristic motive. Here Bach has realized the ideal of the chorale prelude. The method is the most simple imaginable, and at the same time the most perfect. Nowhere in the Dürer-like character of his musical style so evident as in these small chorale preludes. Simply by the precision and characteristic quality of the line of the contrapuntal motive, he expresses all that has to be said, and so makes clear the relation of the music to the text whose title it bears. The Orgelbüchlein is thus not only of significance in the history of the development of the chorale prelude, but is one of the greatest achievements in music. Never before had anyone expressed the text in pure tone in this way. No one afterwards undertook to do so with such simple means. At the same time, the essence of Bach's art comes clearly into view for the first time in this work. He is not satisfied with formal perfection and fullness of sound. Otherwise, he would have continued to work with the forms and formulae of his teachers in the chorale prelude. He aims at more than this. He aspires after plastic expression of ideas and so creates a tone speech of his own. The elements of such a speech already exist in the Orgel Büchlein, the characteristic motives of the various chorales correspond to many of Bach's later emotional and pictorial tone symbols. The Orgel Büchlein is thus the lexicon of Bach's musical speech. This must be our starting point if we would understand what he is striving to express in the themes of the cantatas and the passions. Until the significance of the Orgel Büchlein was perceived, the fundamental character of Bach's art remained, almost down to the present day, obscure and disputable. The title, indeed, does not indicate the universal significance of this collection. It runs thus, the little organ book wherein instruction is given to a beginning organist to work out a chorale in every style, also to perfect himself in the study of the pedal, the pedal being treated quite obbligato throughout in the chorales herein contained. To the honor of the Lord Most High, and that my neighbor may be taught thereby. Autor, Johann Sebastian Bach, Capellai Magistro, S.P.R., and Haltini Cotinensis. The autograph is now in the Royal Library at Berlin. It contains 92 leaves and is bound in pasteboard with leather back and corners. At the head of each page, Bach wrote the title of the chorale that was to appear thereon, so that if the composition extended beyond the page, he had to paste an extra strip of paper below or make use of the tablature. All these chorales were written in Weimar. Afterwards, in Coton, he made a careful, fair copy of them. There still exists a Weimar autograph of the Orgelbüchlein that once belonged to Mendelssohn. It lacks the pages containing the first twelve chorales. On the cover is a note to the effect that the owner had cut out three more leaves, two for his bride's album and one for Clara Schumann. The order of the chorales is that of their succession in the church year. This is easily understood when we remember that at that time each Sunday had its own special hymns allotted to it once for all, and that other organists of the epoch, for example, B. Walter of Weimar also wrote similar yearly cycles of chorale preludes. In the details of their grouping, however, especially with regard to the chorales appropriated to feast days, each individual was naturally allowed a certain amount of liberty. Bach made the most ingenious use of this freedom. He disposed of the chorales in such a way that the Christmas ones formed a miniature Christmas oratorio, those of the Passion Time, a Passion, and those of Easter, an Easter oratorio. He aimed only at other effects of contrast. The chorale Das Alter Jahr Viergangen East, 5, number 20, is a sorrowful meditation in the twilight as the last evening draws to its close. It is followed by the jubilant song In Dear East Freude, 5, number 34, that is filled with the light of the new day. Of the two chorales relating to the presentation in the temple and Simeon's hymn of praise, the first Mietfreude und Freude, Ich fahr dahin, 5. Number 41 depicts a joyous longing for death, and the other, Herr Gott nun schleus den Himmel auf, 5. Number 24, a sorrowful longing. The somber hymn on original sin, Dirk Adam's Fall, 5. Number 13, is followed at once by the hymn of salvation in Christ, Es ist das Heil uns kommen, Er, 5. Number 16. The Orgel Büchlein is barely one third finished. The Coton autograph is planned out for a hundred and sixty-nine chorales. Forty-five of these are complete. For the others, we have only the white pages. What is the explanation of this? 
Did the Leipzig appointment come just at this time and prevent the continuation of the work? In this case, why did not Bach resume it when later on he turned his attention again to the chorale prelude? The abandonment of the collection in its incomplete state must have been due to some inward reason. Speaking generally, it is the grouped chorales relating to the various feast times that are finished, and of the others, those of which the strong pictorial or characteristic quality seem to make them specially suitable for music. The text of the numbers not completed lack these musical qualities. No characteristic theme could be evolved from them. They could only be developed as pure music, not in their poetic or pictorial aspects. All the chorales of this collection, however, were to be little tone pictures, and as circumstances made this plan impossible, Bach preferred to leave the collection unfinished. How strictly he adhered to the characteristic type he had in his mind for the Orgel Büchlein can be seen from the fact that he did not include beautiful chorales like Herzlich Tut mich Verlangen, 5, number 27, and Leibster Jesu Wir sind ihr, 5, number 36, which were quite suitable as regards their size and were certainly in existence at that time, simply because they were not constructed on a characteristic motive. When Griepenkerl edited the Orgel Büchlein for Peters about the middle of the forties, he unfortunately altered the original order, in which each chorale is in a position that explains it, and adopted instead a merely alphabetical arrangement. Besides inserting smaller chorale preludes and chorale fugettas that did not form part of the collection, we get the correct Orgel Büchlein by eliminating from the fifth volume of Peters' edition of the organ works number 7, 18, 20, 23, 26, 27, 36, 39, 43, 47, 52, and 53, and arranging the remainder in this order. Numbers 42, 19, 22, 38, 46, 17, 11, 49, 50, 35, 40, 31, 6, 55, 21, 10, 34, 41, 24, 44, 3, 8, 9, 45, 56, 29, 5, 32, 4, 14, 15, 28, 25, 37, 12, 48, 13, 16, 30, 33, 51, 54, 2, 1. Between numbers 28 and 25, again, must be inserted the first part of the chorale Komm Gott Schopfer Heiliger Geist, 8, number 35, which, although Spita, 1, 611, does not think so, was originally part of the Orgel Büchlein. The second verse was not added until later. Spita is of opinion that the treatment of the pedal in the first part is not sufficiently obbligato to authorize our regarding the work as composed for the Orgel Büchlein, but every organist will testify that the obbligato character of the pedal is shown by the fact that it is much more difficult to play than it looks. It is by no means easy always to strike these simple notes on the weakest part of the bar. The plan of the second collection of chorale preludes is explicable, like the first, from the order of the old hymn books. The Orgel Büchlein deals with the Cantica de Tempore, that is, hymns grouped according to their order in the church year. The other collection that appeared in 1739 as a third part of the Klavierubung deals with the catechism hymns. By these was understood, at that time, a small collection of classical hymns on the main points of the Christian doctrine that were included in every hymn book. The arrangement was the same as in the Lutheran Catechism. The core of them was formed by the Luther's hymns Die sind die Heiligen sein Gebot, Für Glauben all an einen Gott, Vater unser in Himmelreich, Christ unser Herr zum Jordan kam, Jesus Christus unser Heiland, the communion hymn, and Aus Teufer not schrei ich zu dir, the confessional hymn. Bach chose this catechism in the form of Lutheran hymns for musical treatment. In order to have the dogma complete, he prefaced these five chief hymns with the Kyrie and Gloria to the Holy Trinity from the Leipzig service, that is, the three hymns Kyrie Gott Vater, Kyrie Gott Son, Kyrie Gott Heiliger Geist, and the hymn to the Trinity Allein Gott in der Ho Se Er, this last, of course, in three versions. Luther, however, had written a greater and a smaller catechism. In the former, he demonstrates the essence of the faith. In the latter, he addresses himself to the children. Bach, the musical father of the Lutheran Church, feels it incumbent on him to do likewise. He gives us a larger and a smaller arrangement of each chorale, with the exception of Allen Gott in der Hoch sei er. The larger chorales are dominated by a sublime musical symbolism. 
aiming simply at illustrating the central idea of the dogma contained in the words. The smaller ones are of bewitching simplicity. The whole collection is introduced by the majestic E-flat major prelude and ended by the triple fugue in the same key. One would have thought this conception at any rate interesting enough to be respected in the various editions. This, however, has never been done except in the original edition of the Bach Geselschaft. Even Neumann, in the practical edition he brought out for Breitkopf and Hartel, mixes these works up with the others without any regard to their special quality and their inner connection. The Peters edition of these catechism chorales can be reconstructed thus. Introduction. Prelude in E-flat major, 3, number 1. Trinity, Kyrie. Large version, 4, numbers 39 ABC. Small version, 7, numbers 40 ABC. Allein Gott in der Hochzei Er, large version, 5, numbers 5, 6 and 10. The Ten Commandments. Dies sind hei heilgen ren gebot. Large version, 6, number 19, small version, number 20. Faith. Wir glauben all an einen Gott. Large version, 7, number 60, small version, 7, number 61. The Lord's Prayer. Vater unser im Himmelreich. Large version, 7, number 52, small version, 5, number 47. Baptism. Christ unser Herr zum Jordan kam. Large version, 5, number 17. Small version, 6, number 18. Penitence. Aus Teifer, not schrei ich zu dir. Large version, 6, number 13. Small version, 6, number 14. The Lord's Supper. Jesus Christus unser Heiland, der von uns. Large version, 6, number 30. Small version, 6, number 33. Conclusion. Triple Fuga in E flat major, 3, number 1. Bach was not correct in placing the penitence between the baptism and the communion, and it is impossible to say why he did so. It really should come last among these doctrinal pieces. These chorales were probably all composed at the same time, expressly for this collection, towards the end of the thirties. This was certainly the case with the larger versions. In the case of the smaller ones, we cannot be sure whether they formed an earlier collection. It is otherwise with the last collection, the eighteen chorales, it contains, for the most part, compositions of the Weimar period, which Bach, at the end of his life, revised and partly wrote. Rust, indeed, in the preface to volume 25 of the B.G. edition, maintains against Spita that they belong to the Leipzig period. But this is hardly probable. They are plainly masterpieces that Bach wrote, while still more or less dependent on the forms laid down by Buxtehude, Bohm, and Pachelbel. It contains no chorales of the types of those in the Orgelbuchlein. How Bach had polished these works is evident from the fifteen older versions that have come down to us. The autograph of the eighteen chorales is in the Berlin Library. It belonged at one time to Philip Emmanuel. The last chorale, When We Are in Hoxton Noten Sind, is incomplete in the autograph and must have been completed from the art of fugue, in which it appeared as Bach's last work. Here again, it is unfortunate that, regardless of Bach's last wishes, these revised chorales are always mixed up in order to get a purely alphabetical arrangement. Although it is true, this collection is not like the two others, governed by a definite sequence of ideas. The authentic order can be restored in the Peters edition thus. 1. Com Heilge Geist 7. Number 16 2. Com Alio Modo 7. Number 37 3. An Varsche Flüssen Babylon 6. Number 12b 4. Schmucke dich, o Leiber Schiele. 7. Number 49. 5. Herr Jesu Christ, dich zu uns wend. 6. Number 27. 6. O Lam Gottes Unschuldig. 7. Number 48. 7. Nun danket alle Gott. 7. Number 43. 8. Von Gott will ich nicht lassen. 7. Number 56. 9. Nun kom der Heiden Highland, 7, number 45. 10. Nun alio modo, trio, 7, number 46. 11. Nun alio modo, 7, number 47. 12. Allein Gott in der Ho se er, 6, number 9. 13. Allein alio modo, 6, number 8. 14. Allein alio modo, trio, 6, number 7. 15. Jesus Christus unser Heiland. 6. Number 31. 16. Jesus Alio Modo. 
6. Number 32. 17. Komm Gott Schopfer Heiliger Geist. 7. Number 35. 18. When wir in Hochsten Noten sind, vor deinen Thron trägt ich all hier. 7. Number 58. The trio upon Nun komm der Heiden Heiland. 8. Number 46. Makes so strange an impression on us that it seems like a transcription of a movement from a cantata. Strictly in the old Pachelbel style is the angular arrangement of Nun Danket alle Gott, 7 number 43, that charms both player and hearer more and more as their familiarity with it increases. The chorale Island Gott in der Ho Sei Air, 6 number 9, is purely in the style of Bohm. To many people it seems rather youthful. In the prelude on Nun Komm der Heiden Highland, 7 number 45, that is laid out on the same plan, the arabesque-like contour of the melody seems much more mature and perfect. It is full of a dreamy expectancy. We see the style of Bohm perfected and idealized again in the chorale An Varsafluschen Babylon, 6, number 12b, in which the melody is given to the tenor. We are reminded of Buxtehude by the arrangement of Jesus Christus Unser Heiland, 6, number 32, the brilliant and animated Kom Heilke Geist, Herr Gott, 7, number 36, and Gott Schopfer Heilige Geist, 7, number 35, and the von Gott will ich nicht lassen. 7. Number 56. The most important works in this collection, however, do not conform to any strict type. They are fantasias, planned on broad lines, with free thematic use of one or more of the lines of the melody of the chorale. Bach has welded the forms into a new unity, through which the older outlines are only visible as through a fine blue mist. This chorale form might fairly be called the mystic. The chorale themes become veiled, the melodic line more free, as if everything external had been lost and only the general mood, the fundamental emotional idea, were being expressed. In this style, the chorales Allein Gott in der Ho Sei Er, 6 number 8, Komm Heilge Geist Herr Gott, 7 number 37, and Schmücke Dich O Lebe Seele, 7 number 49, form a category of their own. Mendelssohn was so affected by the mood painting in the last named chorale that he told Schumann, if life were to deprive him of hope and faith, this one chorale would bring them back. The triple chorale on O Lam Gottes, 7, number 48, and the arrangement of Jesus Christa Unser Heiland, 6, number 31, represent the ideas more in their dramatic aspect. So much so that one is almost tempted to agree with Roost against Spita and date these works from the Leipzig period. It is difficult to agree with Spita's division of Bach's chorale arrangements into the three categories of pure chorale preludes, organ chorales, and chorale fantasias. It is more reasonable to group them according to the style of treatment in the fugued style of Pachelbel, the coloristic style of Bohm and Reinken, or free fantasias in the style of Buxtehude. There is further the type of the Orgelbüchlein in which the characteristic motive illustrates the uninterrupted cantus firmus, and finally the great chorales that offer a perfected synthesis of all the forms. Besides the arrangement of An Varsaflusen Babylon for double pedal 6 number 12a, there were several excellent and interesting chorales not included by Bach in any collection, among which may be mentioned the Fantasia on Ein Fester Burg 6 number 22, the sublime fugue on the Magnificat 7 number 41, the joyous trio on Nun Freut euch Leiben Christen Gemein 7 number 44, and the expressive chorale, Erbarm, Dich, Mein, O Herogot, BG, 40, page 60, which in its kind, the melody is supported by evenly flowing quavers, is unique among Bach's chorale preludes. Christlag in Todesbanden, 6, number 15, Jesu, Mein, Freude, 6, number 29, Von Himmel, Hoch, Dachom, Ich, Herr, 7, numbers 54 and 55, and Wir glauben all, An einen Gott, 7, number 62, are all admittedly youthful works, in which we can follow Bach's earliest development. It is not clear why the harmonization of the chorale Herrgott dich loben wir, number 26, that is meant as an accompaniment to the hymn, should figure among the chorale preludes in all editions, even in that of Neumann. What is needed is a cheap edition of the chorale preludes in their original form, distinguishing the collections planned by Bach himself from the detached chorales that have come down to us the latter being freely grouped according to their style and their value. With an alphabetical index, any one of them could be found in a moment. 
It is also desirable that the texts should be printed along with the chorales, many of them having by this time disappeared from our hymn books. End of chapter 13. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Music performed from the source text available in the public domain by Jonathan Schofield, Birmingham, Alabama. Chapter 14 of J.S. Bach by Albert Schweitzer Translated by Ernest Newman This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto Music performed by Jonathan Schofield The Performance of the Organ Works How did Bach play his organ works and how should they be played? This practical question is much more important than the historical and aesthetic question. Upon the performance, it depends whether these works can really be brought home to the hearers, or whether they are simply to be admired in a kind of respectful wonder, their beauty being taken on trust rather than actually felt. This certainly happens frequently at the present day. Indications for performance are scarce in Bach's work. Once or twice, as in the D minor toccata, Peters three, number three, the changes of manual are indicated. In the Orgelbüchlein, we are expressly told which pieces are to be played on two keyboards. In the Schubler chorale trios, we are told whether eight or four or sixteen feet stops are to be drawn. Peters 7, numbers 38, 57, 59, and 63. That is practically all. We know from Walter's copy, Bach's manner of playing the chorale prelude, Eine Feste Burg, Peters 6, number 22, at the opening of the new organ at Mühlhausen. His unfriendly critic, Scheiber, informs us that his manner at the organ was extraordinarily quiet. Forkel says that he astonished other organists by the audacity of his tone combinations. Otherwise, he was distinguished from his contemporaries only by his consistent pursuit of the principle of legato playing. He had no experience of the Venetian shutter swell, which was introduced about that time in England, where Handel took great interest in the invention. In Germany, the opposition to this so-called trifling lasted a long time. When Bernie, more than twenty years after Bach's death, heard the Berlin organs, he was astonished to find that not one composed a swell. It no more occurred to Bach than to the rest of his contemporaries that some day organs would be fitted with combination stops, adjustable combinations, and all the rest of the apparatus of the modern organs, especially the so-called concert organs. How do we stand now with regard to the performance of Bach's work on the modern organ? We have achieved infinite possibilities in registration the power of gradual variation from pianissimo to fortissimo, and by means of the swells a certain power of tone nuance. But we have lost the old tone of the organ, that Bach wrote for, and, since the tone is a chief thing, it must be said that the modern organ is not so suitable for Bach playing as it is generally supposed. Our registers are all voiced too loudly or too softly. If we pull out the whole of the diapasons and the mixtures, or add the reeds, we get a force of tone that in the end becomes positively unbearable. The lighter manuals are weak in comparison with the great organ. They usually lack the necessary mixtures. Our pedals are coarse and clumsy, and also poor in mixtures, as well as in four-feet stops. The trouble comes principally from the change in the disposition of the organs. The relation between diapasons and mixtures have been altered wholly to the detriment of the latter, but also from the unnaturally strong bellows of the modern organ. In our passion for strength of tone, we have forgotten beauty and richness of tone, which depend upon the harmonious blending of ideally voiced stops. The older organs are becoming scarcer and scarcer. There are many organists today who have never heard Bach played on the kind of organ the composer had in view when he wrote. The day is not far distant when the last of our beautiful Silberman organs will be replaced or renovated beyond recognition, and then the Bach organ will be one of the unknown things of the past, like certain orchestral instruments that he uses in his scores. If we play Bach on an old and well-preserved Silberman organ, both players and hearers are as little conscious as the master himself was of the need for frequent changes of register, for on such an instrument the diapasons and mixtures give a forte so rich, intense, full-coloured, and yet in no wise fatiguing, that we can, if need be, preserve it unchanged throughout a prelude or a fugue. On such an organ, moreover, both the inner parts and the pedal come out clearly, whereas on the modern organ the inner parts are confused and the pedal, by reason of its deficiency in four-feet stops and mixtures, and its inferiority in weight to the enormous masses of tone above it, 
cannot even at its most brutal throw out a clear line. And all this on account of the too heavy voicing of our registers, the organs of forty years ago that are voiced with a normal pressure, for the simple reason that at that time the electric bellows was unknown and the wind was consequently sparingly used, are better, are better bark organs than the modern ones. What a joy it is, for example, to play Bach on the beautiful Walker organs built between about 1860 and 1875. As a rule, Bach kept to the characteristic registration with which he began, getting variety and gradation in his playing by transitions from one manual to another. It is noteworthy, however, that he played a great many organ pieces throughout on the great organ without any change whatever of manuals and without any gradation of tone the essence of them being the evolution of a single idea, free from any dramatic suggestions. This is especially the case with the works in which the pedal is employed uninterruptedly throughout. For example, the two preludes in C major, Peters 2, numbers 1 and 7, and A major 2, number 3, respectively. The majority of the chorales of the orgel Büchlein and both the larger and smaller ones in the fugal style of Pachelbel. Here, any variation of tone color or alternation of strong and weak would destroy the ideal unity of the work. The organ sonatas and trio form, again, are most effective when the tone color that has been found to be the best for each of the three obbligato parts is maintained throughout. As regards the choice of tone colors, it need only be said that these are sufficiently Bachian when they suit the character of the work. We must not grudge even months of trouble in order to find the right registration. It is still disputable what is meant by the expression organo plano that often figures at the head of a work. It practically amounts to this, that in passages of this kind, Bach desires the main strength of the organ, at any rate, diapasons and mixtures. On present-day organs, however, this must be done with discretion. The tutti of the diapasons and mixtures, thanks to the disagreeably sound quality of the latter, hardly correspond to what Bach had in his mind. Should we also use the reeds in Bach's preludes and fugues? His objection to those usually found in modern organs would have been that they are too blaring and that they obscure the polyphony. On the other hand, it is probable that he added reeds to his diapasons and mixtures, for he cultivates the metallic tone in the orchestra as well. His pedal timbre was really based on reeds. Moreover, we know how highly he valued good reeds in an organ. What we have to do in future is to restore the old, delicate and beautiful reeds, then just add a luster to the diapasons without overwhelming them as ours do. Until then, we must manage with compromise and use diapasons, mixtures and reeds with sufficient discretion to get something like the old quality of tone. It is interesting to note that Bach's contemporaries complain that the Silberman brothers voiced their organs too softly in order to get beauty of tone. Bach evidently did not think so. The effect that can be made with a fine full fortissimo combining all the timbres may be seen in the little prelude in E minor, Peters three, number 10. If we play it right through without any change, we realize at once that this is how Bach conceived it, and that to play it with any variation of color or of force is to destroy its dramatic majesty. We play the chorale preludes of the Orgel Büchlein and many others too softly, again, because we do not make sufficient use of beautiful mixtures on the secondary manuals, which would not only sound well in themselves, but would permit the use also of one or two reeds. We are thus thrown back as a rule on the characterless tone color of some eight feet diapasons which particularly obscure the polyphonic writing the four feet and two feet are also generally voiced too strongly and we try to make up in sentimentality for what we have lost in richness and quality of tone it is obviously wrong for we lose the simple effect of the cantus firmus we should carefully consider which chorales are written for two and which for one manual and not plume ourselves on our cleverness when we play the latter on two manuals. Bach's own intentions can always be gathered from the style of writing. A part that he intended for one manual cannot be played upon two without seriously marring the grouping and leading of the voices. Conversely, a work conceived for two manuals is written in such a way that each part lies smoothly and clearly on its own manual down to the smallest detail. This principle can be applied to all organ works. If the cantus firmus is broken up into coloratura, as in the chorale preludes in Bohm's manner, it often comes out to particular advantage with an oboe or clarinet colouring. Wonderful effects of blending can be obtained by using a small mixture in the swell and adding diapasons and an oboe colouring to it. These chorale preludes in Bohm's style should be played the most delicately of all. The pedal should not be too heavy, and at any rate in the chorale preludes uncoupled wherever possible. It is most effective with its own stops. 
Frequently, only an eight-feet tone should be employed. For example, in the chorale preludes Olam Gottes, Peter 5, number 44, and Gottes Son ist kommen, Peter's 5, number 19. At other times, even only a four-feet tone is suitable. For example, in Il Dulci Jubilo, Peter's 5, number 35, where the double pedal is prescribed throughout. It goes without saying that only eight-feet stops should be employed, with the four feet for stronger effects. This rule is frequently disregarded. The case is different when the double pedal is used at the end of a work. Example, in the D major prelude, Peter's 4, number 3. Here the 16 feet is to be maintained, though it must be admitted that the fortissimo of a modern pedal of this kind is far from charming. The organist should not worry either himself or his hearers too much with the working out of a canonic passage. The piece is not there for the sake of the canon, but the canon for the sake of the piece, especially in the canons of the Orgelbuchlein. If we hear properly the melody of the Cantus Firmus, the other parts can be so far kept in the background that the uninitiated need not even suspect there is a canon in progress. In chorales to be played on two manuals, experience teaches us that as a rule, it is better to let the string character prevail in the left hand and a flute color in the upper parts, this color being free from harshness there but muddy in the lower register. Special difficulties are offered by the two great chorales with double pedal. An Wasser Flüschen Babylon, Peter 6, number 122, and Austeifer, Not Schrei ich Judir, Peter 6, number 13. For the first following registration is recommended. Strings in the pedal, in the left hand flutes, in the right hand strings, all soft eight feet stops. The chorale prelude Austeifer Not is very effective when the whole eight and four feet register, diapasons, mixtures and reeds is used in the pedal. In this way, the mixtures and reeds which are often missing, can be got from the second and third manuals by coupling, and we can play the four upper parts on the great organ with the full eight and four feet diapasons, even adding a good mixture later on. This solves the problem of bringing out the cantus firmus clearly in the upper pedal part. Under certain circumstances, it is as well to omit the eight feet trumpet and to employ only the four feet stops for the reed timbre. In truth, however, we can only play these double pedal parts quite legato, either on the old narrow Bach pedals or the curved French and English pedals with their circular arrangement. It is impossible on the flat and excessively broad pedal keyboard that is regarded as the only correct thing in Germany. The foregoing remarks apply to the works that seem to call for neither a change of manuals nor a change of color. As a rule, however, Bach goes on the presupposition that we shall play his works with the variety suggested by their contents and their style of treatment. He gives no indication on the point, simply because the works carry their own indications. Leading parts in the grand organ, subsidiary parts, generally recognizable by the omission of the pedal on the supplementary manuals, this is what he expects from the player. This can be seen from the D minor toccata, Peters 3, number 3, in which he has specified the changes of manual, probably for a pupil. In the chorale on Ein Fester Burg, Peter 6, number 22, we can reconstruct Bach's registration from Walter's copy. His indications evidently refer to the Mulhausen organ, the renovation of which Bach superintended, and which he opened in all its new glory, in the autumn of 1709, perhaps at the Reformation feast. First of all, bars 1 to 20, Bach kept the right hand on the second manual, employing, among others, the Seskiel Terra, and the left hand on the first manual, defining the tone quality of his by the Fagotto 16 inches. Bar 20 to 24, he played on the third manual, drawing the soft pedal stops, especially the new sub-bass. During this, he strengthened somewhat the other manuals and came back to them in bars 24 to 32, in which the assistant, probably Walter, took advantage of the short pause in the bass in bar 24 to draw the full pedal. In bars 32 to 37, Bach returned to the third manual, the assistant shutting off the strong pedal registers. The finale from bar 37 was played on the great organ with all the stops. The registration of the piece could not be simpler or more effective. These two examples show us how ingeniously Bach managed the changes of manual. The first thing, therefore, is always to look for the simple architectural lines of the work. The registration that brings these out is the right one. Any other, no matter how ingenious it may be, is less good, in that it obscures the real configuration of the work. We must keep to the principle that every fugue and every prelude is to begin and end on the great organ. It is quite wrong to give out a fugal theme, piano or pianissimo, and let each voice, as it enters, take it up more loudly. The theme, whether joyous or sad, must always be given out with a certain fullness of tone. 
leaving the cumulative effect to come from the entries of the different voices. It is painful to hear themes that should enter proudly, like those of the A minor and G minor fugues given out softly on the third manual in a way that quite obscures their real character, all for the sake of the precious crescendo. In many a fugue, the whole architectural effect is sacrificed to the desire to render the theme always fully audible, to which end it and the other voices are transferred from the great organ to one of the others. This is unpermissible. Now and again we hear a Bach fugue played in such a way that it tapers off at the end in the most beautiful pianissimo. This modernization is partly the product of our present-day way of looking at music. If our organists wish to prove themselves modern musicians, it can only be by transferring the modern orchestral style to these works. They forget that Bach's own orchestral style was the ancient one, not the modern. The effects he aimed at on the organ are the same that he aspires after in the Brandenburg concertos. The organist, therefore, would be well advised to study these works thoroughly in order to penetrate to the secret of Bach's style and to realize that with him it is a question not so much of a gradual accumulation of effect as of the lucid opposition and combination of two or three bodies of tone. For this reason, the modern swell really does our organists a disservice in that it is always tempting them to indulge in these gradual crescendi. The true cumulative effects in Bach are made by the entry at definite moments of two or three new tone masses, and the decrescendo by their departure. On the other hand, the constitution of our organs that are incapable of the real Bach forte, and in which the polyphonic writing does not come out clearly, makes us have recourse to artificial effects instead of natural ones, and we try to make Bach interesting by variations of tone and of color, and by an over-insistence on the theme. Here also, until we begin building ideal Bach organs again, we must resort to a wise compromise. This does not mean that the gradual rise and fall of tone, effected on a small scale by means of the Venetian shutter swell and on a large scale by means of the cylinder, is always wrong in Bach. Archaistic tendencies should not be tolerated in music. Bach would have been the last to set his face against new methods. Many passages, for example, the conclusion of the A minor fugue, really demand an increase in the forte itself. And how happy Bach would have been could he have got a finer piano on his third manual by shutting off some of the wind, as is possible by means of the Venetian shutter swell. To refuse to make use of this device in the great episode in the A minor fugue, beginning at the 51st bar, employing first a decrescendo, then a crescendo, is to be false to Bach. Only the present-day organist must make use of the device in such a way as not to disturb the original architecture of the fugue, and be sure that the various episodes of the work come out simply and clearly. Within these limits he may do what he thinks necessary. If this principle is generally recognized, there will be an end of much of the modern pretentious virtuosity in the performance of Bach's organ works, and people will come back from the art that merely stimulates interest to the art that satisfies. And then the hearers will realize that Bach's organ works are not complicated, but extremely simple. Organists should particularly avoid the sudden decrescendo in the cadences that has gradually become the fashion under the seductive influence of the cylinder swell. It is to be hoped also that some day the practice will cease of employing the cylinder swell at the beginning of the F major toccata, instead of starting with a good forte and leaving the crescendo to the dramatic unfolding of the canon. For the rest, this toccata is one of the works that are most effective when played simply with various nuances of the one forte. The works differ greatly with regard to the changes of manual they require. In many, these changes amount merely to an occasional bar or two on the subsidiary manuals. We may even doubt whether Bach went to these manuals in the bars where the pedal ceases, for example, in the C major fugue, Peters II, number 1. Usually, however, the changes are so important that we cannot be in doubt as to where the intermezzo begins on the secondary manual and where it ends. In a number of fugues, the change comes exactly in the middle so that they appear to be triform both in structure and performance. 1. The first exposition on the great organ. 2. The intermezzo. 3. A second exposition extending to the final cadence. Of this kind are the fugues in G major, 2, number 2, C major, 2, number 7, F major, 3, number 2, A minor, 2, number 8, G minor, 2, number 4, and B minor, 2, number 10. The intermezzo on the subsidiary manuals begins each time at the place where the pedal ceases, or shortly afterwards, and ends at the re-entry of the pedal, or shortly before. Instead of one big crescendo lasting from the beginning to the end, as we moderns conceive the fugue, the fugue as Bach conceived it consisted of two equipolent main sections with a subsidiary section between them. 
To destroy the character of the intermezzo is to destroy the Bach fugue. The most striking fugues in respect of this simple structure are the three just mentioned, in A minor, G minor, and B minor. Here we clearly realize the necessity of a diminuendo up to a certain point in the intermezzo. The theme retires to some extent into the innermost and uppermost parts of the organ, there to evolve slowly, until the time comes for the re-entry of the pedal, signalized by a return to the tone color that prevailed at the commencement of the intermezzo when the pedal ceased. How the organist manages this, how he passes from one manual to another, how he introduces mixtures and reeds into the diapasons and takes them out again, and brings out this architecture even down to the smallest detail. That is his affair. He will have to be ruled by the disposition of his organ. The chief thing is for him to recognize the plan of the fugue and bring this out, not a fantastic plan of his own invention. Other fugues exhibit two or more changes. There are two in the following fugues. A major, Peters two, number three, bars 59 to 87 and 121 to 146. F minor, two, number five, bars 43 to 64 and 96 to 120. C minor, two, number six, bars 50 to 94 and 118 to 143. C minor, three, number six, bars 27 to 50 and 58 to 67. E minor, three, number 10, bars 15 to 19 and 27 to 33. We meet with more than two intermezzi in the great E minor fugue, Peters II, number no. 9, that has indeed more the character of a fantasia. It can be properly played only on an organ whose subsidiary manuals are so supplied with mixtures that they do not contrast too markedly with the great organ. The sections dominated by the main theme and the quaver figures are to be played wholly on the great organ, and the passages with the semi-quaver figures on the subordinate manuals. The charm depends each time upon the immediate entry of the chief theme and the quaver movement. Here one doubly regrets that Bach has not recorded the change of manuals. An excellent plan is to play the great semi-quaver figures in which the pedal shares on the first manual without its own mixtures, but adding those of the other manuals by means of the couplers, and then, at each return of the main theme, bring in the mixtures and finally the reeds of the great organ. The prelude in E-flat major, 3, number 1, which is similarly constructed, must be played in the same way. The triple fugue appended to it is the most effective when we play the first part with the full diapasons of the great organ, perhaps with delicate mixtures of the other manuals coupled to them. The second part on the subsidiary manuals with all the mixtures, and in the third part, return to the first manual, which has meanwhile been increased to fortissimo. In a number of preludes in which the pedal is used throughout, it is as well to work on a basis of varied fortes relieved one against the other by the intensity of the mixture tone obtained by adding the couple manuals to the full diapasons. For the G minor Fantasia, 2, number 4, we would propose at the commencement the three couple manuals, diapasons, mixtures and reeds, in bars 9 to 14, retain only the diapasons. From bar 14 onwards, add gradually each time on the strong beat of the bar, first of all the mixtures, then the reeds in the order 3, 2, 1. In bar 25, take them all off again, so that bars 25 to 31 are played only with the diapason tone color, of course on the great organ. In bar 31, introduce into the diapason mass, first of all the mixtures and reeds on the third manual, two bars later, those on the second, and two bars further on those on the first, until the fortissimo is reached, which is then retained to the end. This method, by which the player always keeps to the same manual, is perhaps less interesting than many of the modern virtuoso methods. It has, however, the advantage of presenting the work to the hearer in all its grand simplicity. This gradated forte can be employed with the same good effect in the preludes in C minor, 2, number 6, and E minor, 2, number 9, only that here, in the section without pedal, there are episodes that need to be played on the subsidiary manuals. The Fantasia in C minor, 3, number 6, is the despair of every organist. It is almost impossible to reproduce its ideal beauty in material tone. After every attempt, we come back to the simplest method, that consists in the beginning with a flexible diapason basis, introducing at the transition from bar 11 to bar 12, almost all the diapasons and mixtures of the subsidiary manuals, returning in bar 21 to the first diapason color, maintaining this until bar 32, and then gradually introducing, till the end is reached, the whole of the diapasons of the full organ 
and the mixtures of the subsidiary manuals. One of the works that suffers most at the hands of organists is the B minor prelude, 2, number 10, although its structure is as simple as possible. We should begin on the great organ. At bar 17, go to the subsidiary manuals. In bar 27, the right hand returns to the great organ, followed by the left in bar 28. Both remain there until bar 43, and then move to the other manuals until bar 50, when they again return to the first manual. From bars 56 to 60, keep to the great organ, but retain only the diapasons. During bar 60, introduce mixtures and afterwards reads under the cover of the chromatic passage. Maintain this on the great organ until bar 69, when we again take off the mixture and the reeds and continue with the diapasons. In bar 73, we come back for the last time to the subsidiary manuals, which we dexterously bring up to fortissimo, and return in the course of bars 78 and 79 to the great organ with all its stops drawn. In the Passacaglia, it is very effective to give out the theme with the complete diapasons of the organ coupled to the pedal, and then to begin pianissimo on the third manual and to draw more stops at each new variation. In bar 73, we may perhaps go to the first manual. In the four variations that follow, we may introduce by degrees the whole of the diapasons and mixtures, and finally some reeds. In bar 105, we go to the second manual, and afterwards to the third, taking off the mixtures and reeds. From bar 114 onwards, we close the swell box slowly. The arpeggio passages are played with the fine eight, four, and two feet registers of the third manual. On the last beat of bar 129, we revert to the diapasons and mixtures of the first manual. In the following variations, we add reeds and mixtures of the other manuals. Finally, we add also the reeds of the first manual. To ascertain whether the change of manual can be made, and the way in which it can best be effected, we must endeavour, by continual study of the work, to discover the ground principles on which it is constructed. The great art consists in going back with both hands to the great organ at the moment of the pedal entry. From the structure of the passage, we must try to infer whether we must go to the first manual with one hand after the other, in which case it is always best to begin with the left, since this can enter almost imperceptibly in the lower part, or whether Bach demands a decided contrast, for which we must bring both hands simultaneously to the great organ. His own play must have been characterized by extraordinary refinement, since he expressly desires that the manuals shall lie quite close to each other, so that he may easily pass from one to the other. There are many critical passages in which sustained notes or harmonies have to be taken with perfect smoothness of transition on another manual. For changes of manual in, in accordance with Bach's intentions, a certain homogeneous tone color must unite the three manuals. On the organs of today, that have scarcely any mixture on the subsidiary manuals, this is often difficult. It is also regrettable that on our organs the three manuals no longer represent three different and sharply characterized qualities of tone. Hence the main effect of the change of manuals and of the coupling and uncoupling of them is lost. This causes the organ virtuosi of today to renounce the most natural means of effect and have recourse to the cylinder swell that finally becomes so monotonous. If the vital question in Bach playing is that of the coupling and uncoupling of the manuals and of the entries and exits of different tone groups, it must be said that the plan of our modern organs does not lend itself greatly to this. The couplers are worked by the pressing of knobs, which means that the player cannot make full use of them, since in Bach playing neither hand can be dispensed with. Further, our combination stops and adjustable combinations usually work in such a way that they interfere with the existing registration instead of reinforcing it and they often have the further disadvantage of not acting separately on each manual, but on the whole organ. The console ought to be so arranged that the couplers can be worked either by the hand or the foot, the two mechanisms, of course, being connected. The player could then draw the coupler with his hand and release it with his foot, and vice versa. Or he could employ only the hand or only the foot, as suited him best. The collective stops and adjustable combinations should be arranged on a double principle, so that at the will of the organist they could either suspend or supplement the drawn stops. It would be an advantage if they could also be worked both by the hand and the foot. This would imply another much-needed simplification of our organs. It looks as if Bach's works were destined not only to instruct the organist, but to reform the organ builders of the present day, to emancipate us from the folly of the inventor and lead us back from the complicated to the simple, from the strong-toned organ to the organ of rich and beautiful tone. The more we play Bach's organ works, the slower we take the tempi. Every organist has this experience. The lines must stand out in calm plasticity. 
there must be a time also to bring out their dovetailing and juxtaposition. At the first impression of obscurity and confusion, the whole effect of the organ piece is gone. If so many organists imagine that they play Bach interestingly by taking him fast, this is because they have not mastered the art of playing plastically, so as to give vitality to the work by bringing out its detail clearly. It is quite a mistaken idea that what Bach chiefly wants is a monotonous smoothness. He certainly favored the legato style, but his legato is not a mere leveling. It is alive. It must be filled by a fine phrasing which the hearer need not perceive as such, but of which he is conscious as a captivating lucidity in the playing. Within the legato, the separate tones must be grouped into living phrases. This intimate style of phrasing breaks up the stiffness of the organ tone. The effect should be as if what is impossible on the organ has become possible. That is to say, that some notes have a heavy and others a light touch. That is the ideal to be aimed at. In the old days, when the absolutely uniform legato obtained by passing under the thumb was not known, so that only a few of the notes were played legato, while the others were detached owing to the displacement of the hand, players had a feeling for the artistic grouping of notes within a legato that we have lost, but of which we can form a rough idea by observing how, at that time, runs were divided between the two hands. Even in the introduction to the C major toccata, Peters three number eight, or that of the E minor prelude, Peters three number ten, there is revealed a whole world of interesting legato combinations. Many organists indeed have no idea that this division between the two hands indicates Bach's phrasing. They are even proud of themselves when they play these passages with one hand or in octaves with both hands, making one monotonous scale passage of them. If we follow the principle indicated by Bach's manner of writing his phrases, we see that he usually conceives four consecutive notes as grouped in such a way that the first is detached from the others by an imperceptible break and belongs rather to the previous group than to the one that follows. Thus not. But. In this way, there is no sense of monotony in the legato. When we apply this principle, we are surprised with what clearness and ambition the passages come out. Consequently, we must play thus. Prelude in A minor, Peters 2, number 8. Toccata in D minor, Peters 3, number 3. One of the most instructive examples in this regard is the passage work in the subsidiary section of the B minor prelude. Grouped as a scale, it is always unsatisfactory. It only acquires life and form when we play it thus. The fresh and healthy prelude in C major again, Peters 4, number 1, with a fine pedal solo, only loses its stiffness when we phrase it on this principle. We have the same experience with the other C major prelude, Peters 2, number 1. This phrasing, however, must never be obtrusively noticeable within the general legato. Its effect must be merely that of an agitation of the main contour. To bring out the phrasing by means of slurs and, and breath signs is much too clumsy a method. It should really be done by delicate and inexpressible means. It is doubtful whether, for the sake of variety, we should now and then play whole quaver or semi-quaver passages staccato. The phrasing of the fugue themes is still in dispute, though we are gradually getting further away from the extravagances of the earlier virtuosi, when they wrought such violence on Bach in the first joy of their virtuosity. A phrasing is fundamentally wrong that is not simple, and cannot be maintained throughout the whole piece, especially whenever the theme enters. Therefore, any notes that interrupt the normal flow and are denoted by characteristic leaps must to some extent be taken out of the group and stand by themselves. Thus, Fuga in A minor, Peters 2, number 8. Fuga in G minor, Peters 2, number 4. Toccata in F major, 3, Peters, number 2. The theme of the E-flat triple fugue is interesting, as the transformation it undergoes necessitate changes in its phrasing. First fugue.
Second Fugue. Third Fugue. Only when phrased in this way do the themes of the second and third fugues become perfectly clear to the hearer, which is impossible if the notes are grouped evenly. When the same note is struck repeatedly, it should be sustained for only half its time value, with a pause for the remainder. The repeated notes are thrown into relief by the preceding and following slurs. Thus, fugue in G major, Peters two, number two. Fugue in C minor, Peters three, number six. This rule holds good not only for the phrasing of the themes, but for the treatment of the repeated notes in general. It cannot be observed too strictly. Equally weighty is another rule. If a repeated note occurs on the paper by reason of the same note entering in another voice, the note must be held without repetition. It must not be heard as two notes because one voice takes it over from the other. In successive chords, the repeated notes are to be detached, and those moving in intervals are to be legato. In this way, the leading of the voices is brought out with extraordinary clearness. If one tries to translate these rules into practice, the simplest pieces become difficult. In order to realize the difficulties and the effect of playing in this strict style, the succession of chords in the middle section of the little E minor prelude, Peters three, number ten, should be studied. It is upon this plastic style of playing, not on ingenious registration and virtuosity, that the effect of Bach's organ works depends. But everything rests on seeming trifles, and we organists are much too modest and too indulgent to ourselves in this respect. Moreover, so few of us acquire a technique really adequate to Bach's demands. Many do not even acquire absolute precision of touch. Ornaments occur relatively seldom in the organ works, yet frequently enough for there to be plenty of opportunity for sins of thoughtlessness. It is always forgotten that the Bach trill, as Emmanuel expressly informs us, does not begin on the main note, but on the secondary note, and when it is long, always has a final turn. Thus the theme of the F minor fugue, Peters two, number 5, should be played either or Two rapid trills are to be avoided on the organ. In the opening mordants of the Durian Toccata, Peters 4, number 4, and E minor fugue, Peters 3, number 10, and the E flat prelude, Peters 3, number 1, the ornaments must be played with a whole tone interval. The grace notes in the pedal part of the B minor prelude, Peters 2, number 10, are to be played as quavers. Rust thought he recollected that in the autograph, that unfortunately has disappeared, they were so noted. It is best, however, to separate two notes thus. There remains the question of the organ works for practical use. It is entirely a question of usage. Whoever uses Norman's instructive collected edition, Breitkopf and Hartl, or Schreier's collection, Hofmeister, Leipzig, to mention these alone, certainly gets a good deal of practical information, and no one should neglect to acquaint himself with the brilliant and profound observations and suggestions contained in these and similar works. For daily use, however, editions of this kind are not the best. The multitude of fingering, phrasing marks, slurs, tempi marks, and suggestions for registering give the works an overloaded look, and what is really essential remains after all unsaid. What is needed is not these very practical editions, so much as thorough separate studies of registration, manual changes, and the like. Here almost everything still remains to be done. An organist of the right kind will not take refuge in a practical edition, but will use an original edition and enter in it his own observations and experiments. On the structure of Bach's organ themes, again, and on the architecture of the works in themselves, and in relation to his clavier music, scarcely anything has been published as yet that goes to the root of the subject. The rhythm of the themes of organ fugues, it may be remarked, is much simpler than that of the clavier fugues. A few quite elementary syncopations apart, scarcely an accent falls on the weak part of a bar. The main accent always falls on the strong beat. Bach sees quite clearly that any other than this natural accent is impossible on the organ. For clavier and for orchestra, he writes much more freely. Thus the object of transcribing clavier fugues for the organ is incomprehensible. 
No one who really understands the nature of Bach's organ works can listen to transcriptions of this kind. Further, the structure of the works is quite different. In the organ music, Bach works upon broader and simpler lines than in the clavier works. We seek in vain in the organ fugues for the subjective life, so rich in surprises, of the clavier fugues. The former are meant to work on a certain inner faculty of conception rather than on the immediate feeling, and to exhibit an idea in lofty simplicity. For this reason, Bach's clavier works sound restless on the organ. A satisfactory registration cannot be discovered for any of them. The difference between the clavier and the organ styles, in fact, cannot be better realized than by placing Bach's organ fugues by the side of his clavier fugues and studying the musical architecture of both in detail. There is, to be sure, one will for Bach's for the organ that stands on the borderline of the style he has laid down for his organ works in general. It is the A major fugue, Peters two, number 3. Every organist can convince himself of this. If we play the theme legato without the articulation that gives character to it, it goes very lamely. If we play it as it is intended to be played, accenting the syncopations by cutting them short, then no matter how perfectly we play the piece, it has a notable restless effect. This is increased by the fact that the structural interest lies rather in the detail than in the whole, to say nothing of the further fact that sequences of thirds in the bass and a conclusion like that of this fugue are to be found nowhere else in the organ works of Bach. The interesting point is that we can prove that the theme of this exceptional fugue was originally conceived not for the organ, but for the orchestra. In its primary form, it was written for the instrumental introduction to the cantata Tritt auf die Glaubensspann. There is more to be said for the transition of organ work for the piano than for the reverse proceeding, since the piano, as Liszt said, is to music what engraving is to painting. It serves to multiply and disseminate works of art. When masters like Liszt, Saint-Saint, Busoni, Reger, Philippe, Dalbert, Viana da Motta, and Ansorge undertake to arrange Bach's organ work for the pianoforte, the intelligent player has not only the advantage of learning works from which he would otherwise be barred, but the aesthetic pleasure of finding organ effects cleverly realized on the piano. Bach, who was himself passionately devoted to the art of transcription, would have been delighted with the pianoforte, apostles of his organ gospel. There is danger, however, in going to excess. These transcriptions, even when they are made with the utmost art, cannot in the long run give complete satisfaction. The organ themes lose something on the pianoforte. The simple plan of the works has to be replaced by an artificial one, since the various degrees of strength in the organ tone cannot be reproduced even on the modern pianoforte. When this perception grows, men will some day discover what Bach himself experienced. It will look back on the age that delighted in transcriptions as on something long passed away, and its joy will not be in the transcription itself, but in the education it afforded. We must not allow these artistic transcriptions that often surpass the power of the average player to make us forget the old German domestic resource of playing the organ works from the original in arrangements for four hands, one player taking the manual parts and the other the pedal parts in octaves. End of chapter 14. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Music performed from the source text available in the public domain by Jonathan Schofield, Birmingham, Alabama. Chapter 15 of J. S. Bach, Volume 1, by Albert Schweitzer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Music performed by Jonathan Schofield. J. S. Bach by Albert Schweitzer. Translated by Ernest Newman. Chapter 15. The Clavier Works. The clavier works, like those for the organ, mostly date from the Weimar and Cotton periods. Bach, however, published only the great works of the Leipzig period. Six large partitas, the Italian concerto, four duets, and the Goldberg variations. Partitas, not suites, though this is what they really are in form, was the name he gave to the works in the style of his predecessor, Kuhnhau, who had issued, in 1869 and 1695, 
two collections of clavier übungen, each containing seven clavichord partitas. The first partita appeared in 1726. It was the first composition that Bach published. He was at that time 41 years old. Each following year saw the birth of a new partita of his. When six of them had appeared, he united them under the title of Clavier Ubung, Part I, again in imitation of his predecessor. Ubung means here, of course, not so much a work for students' practice as one for diversion. If Bach's sons informed Forkel correctly, the work made a great sensation in the musical world. Such excellent clavichord compositions had never before been seen or heard. Anyone who learned to play a few pieces out of them well could make a great success with them. The second part of the clavier ubung, consisting of the Italian concerto and the B minor partita, was published in Nuremberg in 1735 by Christoph Weigel. Even Scheiber could not help paying a tribute of admiration to the Italian concerto. It is interesting to note that Bach got the idea of the work from a sinfonia in Mufas Flori Legium Primum, 1695. The similarity of the themes is too striking to be explained by mere chance. Mufa. Bach. In 1739, the third part of the Clavier Ubung appeared. It was intended to contain only organ works. The preludes on the catechism hymns, the four clavichord duets, got in by mistake. These organ pieces could be played, of course, on the two-manual pedal clavicembalo, which was very popular at that time. How these great works were received by organists is not recorded. The fourth part of the Clavier of Bung was also published in Nuremberg, not by Weigel, however, but by Balthasar Schmidt, who was also Emanuel's publisher. It contained the Goldberg variations. Goldberg was the clavichenist of Count Kaiserling, a patron of Bach, who acted as Russian envoy at the Dresden court. It was he who procured Bach the appointment of court composer. At any rate, the diploma came through his hands. Goldberg was a pupil of Friedemann, who was in Dresden at that time. When he went to Leipzig with his master, which, according to Forkel, often happened, he visited Bach to learn what he could from him. Forkel gives the following account of the origin of the variations. Count Kaiserling fell very ill and could not sleep at night. Goldberg, who lived with him, had on these occasions to spend the night in an adjoining room so as to be able to play to him when sleepless. Once the Count said that he would like Bach to write some clavichord pieces for Goldberg of a quiet and at the same time cheerful character that would brighten him up a little on a sleepless night. Bach thought the best thing for the purpose would be some variations, a form which he had previously thought a rather little bit off by reason of the persistence of the same basic harmony throughout. The Count afterwards always called them his variations. He could not hear them often enough, and for a long time, whenever he had a sleepless night, it was, Dear Goldberg, Dear Goldberg, play me one of my variations. Bach was perhaps never so well rewarded for any of his works as for this. The Count gave him a golden goblet containing 100 louis d'or. That Bach had no particular fondness for the variation form may be gathered from the fact that apart from the Goldberg set, the only variations he wrote were the youthful Aria Variata alla Maniera Italiana. B.G. 36, pages 203 to 208. In his organ music, also, he soon ceased to write variations on, a, on chorale melodies. The theme of the Goldberg variations is found in the Clavier Buchlein of Anna Magdalena Bach, 1725. It is the sarabande that follows the song Bis du by Mir. It has been in existence at least ten years before he thought of writing variations on it. The variations, however, are founded less on the theme itself than on its bass. Over this, Bach's imagination plays freely and the work is in reality more than a passacaglia worked out in chiaroscuro than a series of variations. It is impossible to take to the work at a first hearing. We have to get to know it, and to understand the music of Bach's last period, in which the interest resides not so much in the charm of this or that melodic part as in the free and masterly working out of the ideas. When once we arrive at this standpoint, we can savor the gentle, consoling cheerfulness 
that gives such warmth to these seemingly artificial pieces. In the last variation, the cheerfulness becomes laughter of the merriest kind. Two folk songs disport themselves in it. Kraut und Ruben, haben mich Vertri ben, hat mein Mutter Fleisch gekocht, so war ich langer blieben. Ich bin so lang nicht bei Dijo West. Ruck her, ruck her, ruck her. Thus Bach in his old age returns to the quadlibet with which his ancestors used to enjoy themselves so hugely in their great family gatherings. Of all Bach's works, this comes the closest to the modern pianoforte style. If their authorship were not known, anyone would take the penultimate and anti-penultimate variations, even from the mere look of them on paper, to be works of Beethoven's last period. The Goldberg variations, the Italian concerto, and the accompanying partita are written for the clavicembalo with two keyboards. Even without a positive statement to this effect, anyone would soon realize it in performance, in the difficulty for one keyboard of the passages in which the hands become entangled. It is strange that Bach did not think of publishing some of his other clavier works. The well-tempered clavichord indeed was out of the question, it was too large. A copy according to the prices of that day would have cost at least ten or fifteen thalers. Why, however, were the French and the English suites not published? Perhaps because they did not strike him as sufficiently difficult and ingenious. As he could permit himself the trouble and luxury of an engraved issue only in a very limited degree, he preferred to expend on them works that would win him honor and recognition among professional musicians and connoisseurs. As compositions in those days, however, were valued less for their aesthetic qualities than for their ingenuity, it would have benefited Bach to have published these simple suites. Nevertheless, it is a mistake to suppose that his other clavier works were not widely diffused. They were obtainable in manuscript copies. After 1720, indeed, there was scarcely a good German musician anywhere who did not possess at least one work of J. S. Bach. As early as 1717, in his book Das Beschutze Orchester, Mattheson reckons the celebrated Weimar organist Herr Johann Sebastian Bach, among the leading composers on the grounds of some works of his that he had seen. Besides the seven partitas that appeared in the Klavierubung, Bach wrote fifteen other suites, the six French, the six English, and three smaller suites that may have been sketches for the French. It is not known how the French and English suites acquired these names. Even Forkel could give no precise information on the point. He conjectures that the former were so called because they are written in the French style, and the latter because the composer wrote them for an Englishman of quality, which latter was certainly not the case. At a later date, an unsuccessful attempt was made to give the partitas the title of German suites. The French suites figure, though not quite complete, in the first Klavierbuchlein of Anna Magdalena Bach, 1722. There is also an autograph of them with the inscription Sex Suiten pour le clavicin composé par Monsieur J. S. Bach. The title of the autograph of the English suites is also in French, but written more correctly. There is a very valuable copy of the two collections of suites in Gerber's handwriting, made between 1725 and 1726, when he was a pupil of Bach. The French suites can be proved to be not later in date than the Coton period. The English suites also, in all likelihood, belong to the same time, though all the manuscripts and the copies that we have of them fall within the first Leipzig period. In the first year of his work at St. Thomas's, Bach had to write a new cantata for almost every Sunday, so that he could have had little time for other works. The suite owes its origins to the pipers of the 17th century, who used to string together various national dances. The German clavichord players adopted the form from them and developed it. The rule was that it should consist of at least four pieces, the allemande, the courant, the sarabande, and the gig. The allemande is in easy, four by four time, with a quaver or semi-quaver upbeat, the courant or current is in three seconds time and is characterized by its uninterrupted sequences of equal notes. The sarabande is a grave Spanish dance, also in three by two time. 
the heavy notes of which are surrounded by coquettish embellishments. The gig as a rule goes evenly and rapidly, and may be in all kinds of triple rhythms. It gets its name from the gig, ham or gamon, the satirical French name for the older violins. Thus a gig really means a fiddler's dance. There was no reason for refusing admission to the suite to the other dance forms that cropped up later. The French, especially Marchand and Couperin, made a point of introducing all possible dances. Their suites contain the gavotte in two halves time with a half beat uptake, the minuet in simple triple rhythm, the paspier, a Breton dance similar to the minuet, which under Louis the Fourteenth made its way into the French ballet, the bourrée in quick four by four time, an angular dance originating in Auvergne. The French also incorporated into their suites the rondeau, the rigodon, the polonaise, and even independent movements in no particular dance form. Bach takes all these rich suite forms over from his French models, but preserves moderation where they run to extremes. He follows tradition in placing the dances that were not originally part of the suite between the sarabande and the gig, so that the latter forms the conclusion. He generally places the extraneous movements at the beginning. Thus the English suites open with preludes, and the great partitas in the clavierubung with preludes, symphonies, fantasias, overtures, preambles, and toccatas. The French suites, however, begin at once with the allemande. Naturally, some of these dances were somewhat altered in the clavier suite. The gig, for example, which runs to considerable length in the suite, in its original dance form, consisted merely of two eight-bar phrases with repeats. The Italian composers, as a rule, retained only the meter and rhythm of the various dances, without troubling to preserve their essential character. The French were more scrupulous in this respect, and made a point of pursuing to its conclusion the rhythmical characteristic of each dance form. Bach goes still further. He always vitalizes the form and gives each of the principal dance forms a definite musical personality. For him, the allemande represents vigorous but easy motion. The courant represents a measured haste in which dignity and elegance go side by side. The sarabande represents a grave and majestic walk. In the gig, the freest of all forms, the motion is quite fancy-free. He thus raises the sweet form to the plane of the highest art, while at the same time he preserves its primitive character as a collection of dance pieces. As with the organ music, so among the clavier works are a number which Bach wrote as teaching pieces for his sons and pupils. His clavier school consisted of the preludes for beginners, the two-part and three-part inventions, and the well-tempered clavichord. Of the preludes for beginners, we have altogether eighteen. Seven are in Friedemann's clavier Buchlein, six more are contained in an old manuscript with the title Six Preludes à l'usage des commençants conversés par Jean Sébastien Bach. They were published for the first time by Forkel. The others have been handed down to us through pupils. Even in these little works, the overwhelming greatness of Bach is revealed. He merely meant to write a few simple exercises. What he actually wrote were compositions that no one forgets who has once played them, and to which the adult returns with ever new delight. Particularly captivating are the prelude in C minor, page 119, with its dreamy arpeggio semiquavers, the clear-cut prelude in D major, page 131, and the jubilant one in E major, page 132, the intoxication of which must have been one of the richest youthful experiences of any one who thoroughly grasped it. The title of the principal autograph of the inventions and symphonies runs thus, An Honest Guide, wherewith lovers of the clavier, and especially those anxious to learn, are shown a clear method, not only how to learn to play neatly in two parts, but further to play correctly and well in three obligato parts, and at the same time not only to acquire good invention ideas, but to put them out well, but above all to attain a cantabile style of playing, and in addition to get a strong taste for composition. Written by Johann Sebastian Bach, Anhalt Köthen, Kabelmeister, Anno Christi, 1723. Besides this autograph, we possess two others of an earlier date. Friedemann's Klavier Buchlein, begun in 1720, contains most of these compositions, but the title is different. Instead of invention, we have preambulum, and instead of symphony, we have fantasia. When Bach copied them out again, he altered the arrangement of the pieces. They still follow each other in order of their keys, but to each invention he added the corresponding symphony, which is justified by the fact that the two-part and the three-part pieces 
as is shown by certain thematic similarities, were, as a rule, written at the same time. In the definitive autograph, he again distinguished on didactic grounds between two-part and three-part pieces. Here again, the final work is a strict selection made by Bach himself from a large number of works of the same kind, relieved by a number of smaller pieces, splinters, as it were, from the workshop. Bach's inability to settle upon the title was due to the absolute novelty of this kind of work. He abandons the binary song form that was customary for small clavier pieces, and which he himself had used in the six preludes for beginners, and creates a new form of his own, marked by no external divisions, but giving free play to the natural development of the musical idea. The result was that his invention and manner of working became less melodic than thematic and motival. The same principle would necessarily have led from the da capo aria to the freer song form. Here, however, he never quite won his freedom, though he often seems on the way to it. The title invention for a clavier piece seems not to have been devised by Bach himself, as was formerly thought, but to have been derived from some unknown composer whose works he copied out at that time for his sons. He might just as well have called all the pieces simply preludes, but he thought this title too general and not sufficiently characteristic for the strict contrapuntal working out that he had in view. The inventions are written not for the clavicembalo, but for the clavichord, which at that time was called simply the clavier. It was only on this instrument that the cantabile style of playing was possible that Bach had chiefly in his mind when writing them. Thus, in the history of pianoforte playing, the inventions and the symphonies are a protest against the dulcimer-like tinkling that was the vogue at that time. And not only at that time. We feel in every bar of these pieces that the idea at the root of them has been the singing and modulatory capacity of the instrument. When Bach penned the title and expressed the hope that these pieces would give players a strong taste for composition, he could not anticipate how amply his wish would be realized. If the average modern musician, in spite of his possessing less theoretical knowledge of the technique of composition than those of Bach's day, at any rate has a clearer sense of the distinction between true and false art, it is primarily due to these little works of Bach. The child who has once practiced them, no matter how mechanically, has acquired a perception of part writing that he will never lose. He will always instinctively look for the same masterly weaving of the voices in every other piece of music and feel the poverty of the music where this is lacking. And anyone who has studied the pieces thoroughly in their formal and aesthetic aspects under a capable teacher has henceforth a criterion of true art whether he himself becomes a composer or, as in the majority of cases, simply an executant. In any case, Bach's title, with its evident desire that clavier study should not be an end in itself but an introduction to composition, is of significance to piano teachers today. These outwardly similar compositions fall into certain particular types, which are distinguished from each other according as the development of the piece is purely formal or conditioned by an imperative dramatic idea. The first type is represented by the well-known F major invention, the other by the E minor and F minor symphonies. Closely considered, however, each of these works is a masterpiece sui generis, with no exact analogue among the others. Only an infinitely fertile mind could venture to write thirty little pieces of the same style and the same compass, and without the least effort, make each of them absolutely different from the rest. In face of this inconceivable fertility, it seems almost a superfluous question whether any other of the great composers has had an inventive faculty so infinite as Bach's. The two parts of the well-tempered clavichord belong to widely separated periods. The first was finished in 1722, as appears from the dating of the autograph by Bach himself. The second was compiled in 1744, as we learn from the Hamburg organist Schwenker, who in 1781 made a copy of it from an autograph, now lost, belonging to Emmanuel, the title page which bore the date 1744. In Friedemann's Clavier Buchlein of 1720 are found eleven preludes from the first part, among them the one in C major. Bach's revisions of this and three others in C minor, D minor, and E minor made it probable that the majority of the pieces of the well-tempered clavier did not achieve their present perfection at the first stroke, but were continually worked over by the composer with a view to giving them a form that would satisfy him. 
Gerber, in his dictionary, says that Bach composed the first part of the well-tempered clavichord at a place where time hung heavily on his hands and no musical instrument was available. There may be some truth in this. Gerber's father had been Bach's pupil in the early Leipzig years, so that the tradition may quite well be based on some remarks of Bach's, especially as we know that Gerber was studying the well-tempered clavichord at that time, and Bach himself played it to him thrice. Bach may well have been in such a situation during some journey with Prince Leopold of Koten, when the small portable clavier that figures in the list of the court instruments would be left behind. The tradition is at any rate correct to this extent, that the majority of pieces in the well-tempered clavichord were written in a relatively short time. This manner of production was indeed characteristic of Bach. The second part was written after he had practically finished with cantata writing. A number of preludes and fugues, however, existed for some time before Bach conceived the idea of a collection. This holds good for the second part no less than for the first. In both there are pieces which, in their original form, really go back almost to the composer's earliest years. Anyone thoroughly conversant with Bach will gradually discover for himself which pieces belong to this category. He will at once see, for example, that of the preludes of the first part, those in C minor and B flat major, do not show the same maturity as most of the others. That the A minor fugue from the same part is a youthful work is shown not only by a certain thematic looseness and lack of design, but also by the fact that it is evidently written for the pedal clavicembalo. The final note in the bass, prolonged through five bars, cannot be sustained by the hands alone, but needs the pedal, as is often the case in the early works. Otherwise, the well-tempered clavichord, like the inventions and symphonies, is designed primarily for the clavichord, not for the clavicembalo. Bach himself does not appear to have called the 1744 collection the second part of the well-tempered clavichord, but simply, 24 new preludes and fugues. He inscribed the work completed in Coton, the well-tempered clavichord, by way of celebrating a victory that gave the musical world of that day a satisfaction which we can easily comprehend. On the old keyed instruments it had become impossible to play in all keys, since the fifths and thirds were tuned naturally, according to the absolute intervals given by the division of the string. By this method each separate key was made quite true. The others, however, were more or less out of tune, the thirds and fifths that were right for their own key not agreeing among each other. So a plan had to be found for tuning fifths and thirds not absolutely but relatively, to temper them in such a way that though not quite true in any one key, they would be bearable in all. The question had really become acute in the 16th century, when the new custom arose of allotting a separate string to each note on the clavichord. Previously, the same string had been used for several notes, the tangents dividing the string into the proper lengths for the desired tone. The organ also imperatively demanded a tempered tuning. The question occupied the attention of the Italians Giuseppe Zarlino, 1558, and Pietro Aron, 1529. At a later date, the Halberstadt organ builder Andreas Werkmeister, 1645 to 1706, hit upon a method of tuning that still holds good in principle. He divided the octave into twelve equal semitones, none of which was quite true. His treatise on musical temperament appeared in 1691. The problem was solved. Henceforth, composers could write in all keys. A fairly long time elapsed, however, before all the keys hitherto avoided came into practical use. The celebrated theoretician Heineken, in his treatise on thorough bass, published in 1728, that is, six years after the origin of Bach's work, confessed that people seldom wrote in B major and A flat major, and practically never in F sharp major and C sharp major which shows that he did not know Bach's collection of preludes and fugues. At one time it looked as if Bach were to be deprived of the honor of having written the first well-tempered clavichord. In 1880, there came to light a manuscript of one Bernhard Christian Weber, organist at Tenstedt, bearing a very similar title to that of Bach's work, and with the date 1689 in red crayon. The excitement, however, was soon allayed by Wilhelm Tappert's demonstration that the manuscript was not the work of a forerunner, but of a mediocre imitator of the middle of the 18th century. If anyone can be regarded as a forerunner of Bach, it is Mattison, who in his Organistem Probe, 1719, in the article on thorough bass, advocated the employment of all keys, and gave two examples, a difficult one and an easy one, in each. 
When this work appeared, however, Bach was already engaged upon the well-tempered clavichord. Bach found an imitator in his admirer, Georg Andreas Sorge, 1703-1788, the Lobenstein organist, who also wrote preludes and fugues in all the 24 keys, and issued the work in 1738 through Bach's publisher, Balthasar Schmidt of Nuremberg. For a long time it was taken for granted that the autograph of the second part of the well-tempered clavichord was lost. In the middle of the 1890s, Sir George Grove and Ebenezer Prout announced that it still existed and had just passed from private hands into the possession of the British Museum. It had come to England through Muzio Clementi, who had acquired it in some unknown way. After his death, it had been bought by a Mr. Emmett, at whose house Mendelssohn saw it in 1842 and recognized it as a genuine autograph. His daughter sold it to her friend, Miss Eliza Wesley, who bequeathed it to the British Museum on her death in 1895. It is not the original autograph, but a copy carefully made by Bach himself, in which he had continued each prelude and fugue on a separate sheet in such a way that he did not need to turn over when playing it. Unfortunately, three of these leaves are lost. We have several autographs of the first part of the well-tempered clavichord. For each of his two eldest sons, Bach himself wrote out the work with the utmost care. Friedemann gave his copy to Müller, the cathedral organist at Brunswick, with whom he sometimes stayed after he had given up his post at Halle. It is now in the Berlin Royal Library. Emanuel's copy was sold in 1802 by his daughter to the Zurich publisher Nageli, and is presumed still in private hands in that city. Another autograph of the year 1722 was once in the possession of a Herr Wokmann of Pest, where in the middle of the 1840s it was involved in an inundation of the Danube, traces of which it still bears. It is called, after a late owner, the Wagner autograph. There was one copyist in particular who thought it his duty to improve Bach and tried to do so in every prelude and fugue in both parts. His chief concern was to rid them of all unnecessary complexity and to give them the form that Bach himself would have conferred on them had he lived in another epoch than that of the Zopf pigtail and had a more refined taste. He transformed, for example, the D major fugue of the first part in this way. Forkel had a number of the preludes and fugues from each part in a still more drastically curtailed form. It seems almost incredible that he and after him the Bach biographers Hilgenfeld and Bieter should have regarded these versions as the authentic ones and energetically maintained their superiority over those generally accepted. The children of Bach's muse slink along in the most miserable shapes. They are merely skin and bones. And the man who knew Bach's sons, who had heard them play, and in whom one might presuppose some breath of the Bach spirit, fell a victim to this clumsy deception. Even Zelter had to try his hand at simplifying Bach. So great was the aesthetic suspicion with which people at that time regarded the works of the musical Rococo period, even when they bore the name of Bach. The title of the first part runs thus in the autograph. The well-tempered clavier, or preludes and fugues in all tones and semitones, both with the tertium majorum, or ut re mi, and the tertium minorum, or re mi fa. For the profit and use of young musicians desirous of knowledge, and also of those who are already skilled in the studio, especially by way of pastime, set out and composed by Johann Sebastian Bach, Kapellmeister to the Grand Duke of Anhalt Koten, and director of his chamber music, Arno, 1722. The first edition of the Well Tempered Clavichord was issued by the Englishman Coleman in 1799. In the following year, the work was issued simultaneously by Nageli of Zurich and Simrock of Bonn. In the latter edition, the second part comes before the first. The first Peters edition appeared in 1801. Breitkopf and Hartel did not bring it out until 1819. The contemporary Paris and London editions are only pirated reprints of the Nageli version. The first satisfactory text was that of Kroll in the BG edition, 14, 1866. The well-tempered clavichord is one of those works by which we can measure the progress of the artistic culture from one generation to another. When Rochlitz met with these preludes and fugues at the beginning of the 19th century, only a few of them really appealed to him. 
he placed a tick against these and was astonished to find how the number of these ticks increased as he played the works if someone had told this first of bach prophets that in another hundred years every musically minded man would have regarded each piece in the collection as perfectly easy to comprehend he would hardly have believed it the fact that the work today has become common property may console us for the other fact that an analysis of it is almost as impossible as it is to depict a wood by enumerating the trees and describing their appearance we can only repeat again and again take them and play them and penetrate into this world for yourself aesthetic elucidation of any kind must necessarily be superficial here what so fascinates us in the work is not the form or the build of the piece but the world view that is mirrored in it it is not so much that we enjoy the well-tempered clavichord as that we are edified by it joy sorrow tears lamentation laughter to all these it gives voice but in such a way that we are transported from the world of unrest to a world of peace and see reality in a new way as if we were sitting by a mountain lake and contemplating hills and woods and clouds in the tranquil and fathomless water nowhere so well as in the well-tempered clavichord are we made to realize that art was bach's religion he does not depict natural soul states like beethoven in his sonatas no striving and struggling towards a goal but the reality of life felt by a spirit always conscious of being superior to life a spirit in which the most contradictory emotions wildest grief and exuberant cheerfulness are simply phases of a fundamental superiority of soul it is this that gives the same transfigured air to the sorrow-laden e flat minor prelude of the first part and the carefree volatile prelude in g major in the second part whoever has once felt this wonderful tranquillity has comprehended the mysterious spirit that has here expressed all it knew and felt of life in the secret language of tone and will render bach the thanks we render only to the great souls to whom it is given to reconcile men with life and bring them peace half a dozen connected preludes and fugues and a dozen isolated fugues remained over after the compilation of the well-tempered clavichord bach apparently not thinking them important enough to be included in that collection two of them in a major and b minor respectively are based on themes by albinoni other preludes and fugues were too large and too self-subsistent for it to be possible to include them in a collection of this kind are the fantasia and fuga in a minor and the prelude and fuga in the same key which are among the grandest things in piano literature later on bach rearranged the prelude and the fuga with consummate technique as a concerto for flute violin and clavier with orchestral accompaniment adding by way of adagio an expanded version of the middle movement of the third organ sonata the prelude begins thus and the fugue thus he notates the later in the orchestral concerto in four-fourths time and combines it with a broad and free tutti this a minor prelude and fugue probably belonged in their original form to the cothen period they certainly existed as early as seventeen hundred and twenty five it was perhaps rearranged as an orchestral concerto at the beginning of the thirties when bach conducted the performances of the telemann musical society and had need of concerted pieces the fugue in a minor with its introduction of arpeggio chords would perhaps be better described as a fugal fantasia the spirited and brilliant work contains no fewer than one hundred and ninety-eight bars the chromatic fantasia and fugue was from the first one of the most popular of bach's clavier works as is proved by the many manuscript copies of it that we possess dating from his own and from later times the first is found in a volume bearing the date seventeen hundred and thirty the work however is much older than this it probably dates from the same epoch seventeen hundred and twenty as the great g minor organ fantasia it has a kind of inner affinity with this work not only does the same peculiar fire burn in each of them but in both the recitative style is carried over into an instrumental medium in the c minor fantasia bach employs the neapolitan clavier style that had been founded by alessandro and domenico scarlatti one of the main effects of which consisted in the crossing of the hands bach had already made use of this effect in the gig in the b flat major suite of the first part of the clavierubung 
The C minor fantasia may belong to the same period as the Italian concerto. Perhaps it was written somewhat later, about the end of the thirties. The autograph which we possess points to this period. A fugue was appended to this fantasia, but the autograph unfortunately gives only the first forty-seven bars of this. They are rich in promise. This does not imply that Bach left it unfinished. It certainly lay before him complete when he made the copy we now have of the C minor fantasia. Only he did not get as far as the copying of the whole fugue. By this accident it is lost to us. This is doubly regrettable, because, judging by the commencement of it, it was a very individual fugue, more in the form of a fantasia. The theme is constructed on one of those chromatic sequences that we so often meet with in Bach's fugues. It runs thus. Four larger works of Bach for the clavier in several movements have come down to us in the form of clavier sonatas. Two of these, however, must be deducted, those in A minor and C major, Spita having discovered in 1881 that they are only arrangements and amplifications of instrumental pieces from Adam Reinken's Hortus Musicus. The D minor sonata is only a transcription for the clavier of the second sonata for solo violin. The sonata in D major is therefore the only original composition for the clavier. In this, however, there is hardly any originality, the youthful composer having written it under the influence of Kuhnhau's clavier sonatas. In the final fugue, he amuses himself by imitating the cackling of a hen, working out this theme. And a counter theme. in merry if not very witty style a note in italian tells us what the piece is meant to represent seven clavier compositions in several movements are designated toccatas they might with equal propriety have been called sonatas at that time every piece in several movements for a keyed instrument could be called a toccata without the title implying anything as to its special form of these seven toccatas, five, those in D major, D minor, E minor, G minor, and G major, belong to the first Weimar period. The other two, in F sharp minor and C minor, seem to have been composed somewhat later. As a whole, the G minor toccata is the most interesting. The melancholy adagios of the D minor and the G major toccatas are touching in their simplicity. In the two later toccatas, the total impression is somewhat weakened by the lack of finish in the design. In the F-sharp minor toccata, we find already the descending chromatic theme that later dominates the crucifixus of the B minor mass. It is here in the following form. Quite sui generis is a capriccio in B-flat major probably written in Arnstadt in honor of Bach's second brother, Johann Jakob, who had enlisted as an oboist in the Swedish guard when Charles XII was in Poland in 1704. The 19-year-old Johann Sebastian may have written the Capriccio Sopra, La Lontananza del suo fratello di Letissimo, Capriccio, on the departure of his beloved brother, for the family leave-taking. It begins with an arioso, inscribed Casualries of his Friends, who try to deter him from his journey. Then comes an andante, meant to be a representation of the diverse accidents that may befall him in foreign lands. The general lamentation of his friends is depicted in a passacaglia like Adagissimo, on a descending chromatic theme suggesting that of a crucifixus in the B minor mass. In the following movement, the friends, seeing that it cannot be otherwise, come and say farewell. Thereupon comes the aria of the postilion and a fugue in imitation of the postilion's horn call ends the delightful work that follows in the footsteps of Kuhnhau's biblical histories represented in clavier sonatas published four years earlier in seventeen hundred a capriccio in e major that probably belongs to the same period is not so interesting it may have been written in honour of his eldest brother johann christoph bach of ordorf by whom the composer was brought up among the clavier pieces are some that Bach designed also for the lute, and were even perhaps written in the first place for that instrument. 
This is the case with the little prelude in C minor. Recent researches show that the prelude in E-flat major, BG 45, page 141, the suite in E minor, BG 45, page 149, that in E major, BG 42, page 16, and that in C minor, BG 45, page 156, are also clavier arrangements of compositions for the lute. The fuga of the G minor sonata for solo violin and the suite discordable for violoncello solo have also come down to us in lute tablature. The three Bach partitas for lute mentioned in Breitkopf's catalogue in 1761 are thus not lost, as was almost universally supposed. We may therefore probably answer in the affirmative the question whether Bach himself played the lute. End of chapter 15 Read for you by Chiquito Crasto Music performed from the source text available in the public domain by Jonathan Schofield, Birmingham, Alabama. Chapter 16 of J.S. Bach. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Music performed by Jonathan Schofield. J.S. Bach by Albert Schweitzer. Translated by Ernest Newman. Chapter 16. The Performance of the Clavier Works. The ordinary player of Bach finds the ornamentation one of the greatest difficulties. It is a book with seven seals to him. In reality, the question is by no means so complicated as it appears at first sight. We must start from the explanations which Bach himself gives on the third page of Friedemann's Klavierbüchlein, 1720, under the heading, Explanation of Diverse Signs Showing How to Play Certain Ornaments Neatly. Bach elucidates each sign by writing out in full the manner of playing it thus. Trill. Mordant. Trill and mordant. Cadence. Double cadence. Idem. Double cadence and mordant. Idem. Accent ascending. Accent falling. Accent and mordant. Accent and trill. Idem. In addition, there is the essay on Manieren, ornaments, in Karl Philipp Emanuel Bach's Versuch über die wahre Art das Klavier zu spielen, essay on the true way of playing the clavier. The main rules to be observed are the following. 1. Bach indicates the trill simply by the signs T, T, R, without specifying every time the particular manner or duration of it. As a rule, it occupies the whole or the greater part of the note value. 2. The trill begins, as a rule, with the upper accessory note, and only in exceptional cases with the principal note. In long trills, it is desirable, first of all, to linger a moment on the principal note, and then begin the trill with the adjoining note, especially when a movement or a theme, see, for example, the F-sharp major fugue in the second part of the well-tempered clavichord, commences with a trill, or when the upper note has just been struck. 3. The Bach trill is further distinguished from the modern trill by the fact that it must be played much more slowly. It is spoiled by being taken quickly. We must bear in mind that the trill sign over a quaver signifies nothing more than it must be decomposed into two parts of easy demi-semi-quavers. In the same way, a crotchet, if the tempo be somewhat fast, will be simply split up into two pairs of semi-quavers. The ornament is best realized when we play it with almost an exaggerated deliberation. 4. If the succeeding note is a descending second, then the trill sign, as a rule, indicates not an ordinary trill, but a pral triller. 
This must be carefully observed. Bach writes the trill with a nachschlag after beat, thus trill mordant, conceiving it as a trill with a mordant. The downward and upward wurschlag preliminary grace note are denoted by crooks of a similar kind but reverse direction, double cadence and idem. Trills with wurschlag and nachschlag, double cadence and mordant, have both signs, thus double cadence and mordant and idem. The manner of performance is explained by Bach himself in the above mentioned examples in Friedemann's Clavier Buchlein. According to Emmanuel, long trills must always have a nachschlag, but this is dispensed with when several trills follow each other. The sign trill before a descending second thus signifies a prol triller, that is, a broken trill. It must be played much faster than the ordinary trill. The final note of it must, to use Emmanuel's expression, be filliped, by which he means that the key must be struck quickly and then jerked up again by an equally rapid drawing inwards of the point of the finger, which gives the note a very marked accent. Thus, partita fo aria. In the case of a practice player, Emmanuel recommends a prolongation of this proud thriller by one or two extra notes. His view of the proud thriller is that it is simply a very rapid trill of longer or shorter duration, which is suddenly cut short on the staccato main note in such a way that the whole purpose of the trill seemed to be merely the throwing of a weightier accent on this note. The mordant also denoted thus trill is an interrupted trill in which it is less a matter of the number of notes trilled than of throwing the accent on the main note that cuts the trill short. Unlike the proud thriller, it is not limited to any particular situation. It takes the next note below and is thus, as it were, the inverse of the proud thriller. Both in Emmanuel's phrase glide into the second, the mordant above, the proud thriller below. We may distinguish the two chief forms of the mordant, a short and a long. The latter has generally two constituent notes. It can also be presented by the prolonged sign. Mordants have a preference for the major second. French suite, sarabande in E-flat major. The turn in Bach's music, denoted thus, must as a rule be played in four equal notes, in accordance with a note in Friedemann's book. A longer duration may, however, be given to the principal note if the tempo is not too quick to allow of this. Thus, or, or, the Vorschlager, appoggiature, indicated by slurs or small notes, are sometimes long, sometimes short. In each case, however, the accent falls on them, not on the principal note. The latter is tied with them and struck lightly. Emmanuel calls this the Abzug, pulling off. If the Vorschlag is long, it takes half the value of the following note, if equal division is possible. If not, two-thirds fall to the Vorschlag. Thus, or, or, or. This rule, however, is not to be rigorously adhered to, but must be interpreted with reasonable regard to the requirements of the rhythm at the moment. The Vorschlag before a long note is generally long, and that before a short or passing note is generally short. Yet here again everything depends upon the position and the significance of the note. According to Emmanuel, a Vorschlag that takes the interval of a third is always short, even before a long note. The examples are very instructive in which the long and the short of Vorschlage are met with the same work as in the Sinfonia in E flat major and the Sarabande from the Partita in G major. Here the Vorschlage on the second and third beats of the bar are best rendered short and those on the first beat long. Thus, Sinfonia in E flat to be played. Partita 5, Sarabande, to be played. The more we study the nature of the Bach Vorschlag, the more we see that the actual note values are a matter of indifference and that the real questions are the weight and the energy of the accents. As he always writes the accent as an abbreviation of the note, such passages as these. 
only attest that the first note must have a strong accent while the second must be tied to it and have a diminuendo the time values of the notes must be as if written thus conversely quavers or semi-quavers grouped in pairs must always be played in such a way that the second is only a kind of afterbreath of the first and sustained for only a fraction of its time value the tie is thus simply an accent mark the nachschlag indicated by a crook appended to the note or by small notes is always short and must merge into the note that follows thus when bach writes the following two examples it must be played as if written thus when as in the courant of the first partita he writes this is merely the old inexact method of notation for all through his work we find him using the dot in the old way that was more summary than exact these explanations of bach's manieren can only be regarded as general rules for the average case if the ornaments accumulate we soon exhaust the art of explanation and are thrown back upon our sense of natural euphony as the last authority this is also philip emmanuel's view after pursuing the casuistry of the rendering of ornaments into its final subtleties in the end he submits the decision to artistic feeling and so disowns the scholasticism at which he has been so seriously laboring all the time any one who has made himself familiar with the fundamental principles of bach's ornamentation will find by a little reflection a satisfactory solution of the difficult rhythmical and tonal problems involved he must always bear in mind that the reason for the ornaments being indicated by signs instead of written out in notes is that he may have a certain freedom in the embellishment of the design if we can get out of some of the beaten tracks of modern piano playing and acquire a sense of the formal principles underlying the old ornamentation we shall have achieved a good deal the question of whether we shall ever agree upon an interpretation of the numerous ornaments in the aria of the goldberg variations will then be nearer a satisfactory answer closely considered the whole system of ornamentation of that epoch indicates the partial surrender of the composer to the virtuoso who wanted to make his own effect by adding freely to the music during the last century and a half we have slowly moved away from this conception of the role of the executant artist the first to set his face against it was bach himself he could not combat his critic scheiber's reproach that he left nothing to the player but wrote out in full what had been formally indicated by signs the reproach is just as a matter of fact bach banishes ornaments from his music in the well-tempered clavichord we practically never meet with them even a bravura piece like the italian concerto is almost destitute of them in his vocal music again they are almost wholly dispensed with his music certainly seemed bare to his contemporaries only in the gallant genre the suite does he allot the ornaments a role which however is very trifling in comparison with what was customary at the time there is thus a certain irony in the fact that the small amount of ornamentation in his work should give such trouble to the average player of today this is however his own fault not bach's any one who will devote four or five hours to getting a clear idea of the main points here discussed will find that the works have lost their terrors for him and in the end he will find these manieren a source of pleasure the question whether our modern piano is the right piano for bach does not as yet occupy the general public very seriously as it can form no conception of the instruments bach used in more expert circles however the question is already being debated with some heat what would be bach's attitude towards the modern piano exactly the same as towards the modern organ he would hail with enthusiasm the perfection of its mechanism but not be particularly enchanted with its tone qualities sebastian erard's invention in eighteen hundred and twenty three of the repetition action made possible on the hammer clavier the finely gradated touch that caused bach to prefer the weak clavichord to the full tone cembalo henceforth however it was towards greatly increased strength of tone that attempts to perfect the piano were directed the more powerful the tone became the duller became the timbre so that the piano of to-day no longer suggests in any way the tone of the instrument of bach's time the result of substituting an iron resonance for the clear and bright wood resonance the duller of the timbre of an instrument the less suitable it is for polyphonic playing 
in which each voice must stand out clearly from the others and be always perceptible by the hearer without effort how unsatisfactory our piano is in music with bold obbligato parts like those of bach only become evident after we have heard a few preludes and fugues on a good clavichord or clavicembalo the clavichord is a string quartet in miniature every detail comes out lucidly on it on the cembalo every melodic line is quite clear the plucked tone having a much sharper quality than that of the modern piano whether however it is advisable to posit a return to the old instruments as imperative for the true enjoyment of bach's clavier music is doubtful the clavichord is put out of court at once for we could never again accustom ourselves to so weak a tone it is otherwise with the cembalo the charm of its sparkling and rustling tone is not so easily resisted and the variety of tone that it permits by means of change of keyboards coupling uncoupling and octave coupling almost makes us forget that no nuance of tone is possible on it the bass part too comes out more clearly and beautifully on the cembalo than on any other instrument any one who has heard frau wanda landowska play the italian concerto on her wonderful playel clavichin finds it hard to understand how it could ever be played again on a modern piano but even in a quite small concert room the cembalo fanatic's enthusiasm has to contend against the unfortunate fact that at a distance of about twenty-five feet the tone that is so rustling when heard at close quarters becomes somewhat feeble and tremulous nor do all bach's work sound equally well on the cembalo it is best for pieces of unbroken and uniform motion those that like the c major prelude of the second part of the well-tempered clavichord consist of arpeggio-like broken chords and particularly those in pure two-part form like the a minor prelude from the second part of the well-tempered clavichord on the other hand the abruptness of its tone and its inability to sustain a note make it unsuitable for music that demands a singing quality of tone the reconstructed cembalo thus seems better fitted for bach's music in private circles and for certain of his works than to impress the general public with the clavier compositions as a whole none the less all lovers of bach owe their gratitude to the scholars artists and instrument makers who have again brought the cembalo in honor among us and it is to be hoped that the instrument will be more used for bach playing on the other hand we must not imagine that the cry of back to the cembalo solves the problem of which instrument we should play bach upon for the moment we can only be sure that the modern piano is not so close in character to the one bach dreamed of as Spita and his contemporaries thought it was. This is evident from the peculiar demands made by Bach's works, and a certain toning down is already beginning to be noticeable in the modern piano. We are gradually realizing that the excessively strong and blunted tone of our grand pianos may be necessary for a large concert room, while in a small music room in a house it is too deafening to be pleasing, and that we must combine our consummate mechanism with a fabric of such a kind that the tone shall again be bright and clear and metallic. When this has been properly realized, and we have again reproduced in perfection the type of the table piano of 1830, as we have done with the cembalo, then we shall be much nearer the solution of the question which piano we ought to play Bach upon, at any rate at home. Until then, anyone who would rather play Bach beautifully than powerfully must be content with a well-restored table piano of 1830 or 1840. But the problem will not be wholly solved even by a reform of the domestic piano, for the reason that Bach had two instruments in his mind's eye. The modern piano is suitable for the music of the clavichord type, while the pieces calculated for the cembalo come out in their true beauty only in the silvery tone of that instrument. As regards the interpretation of the clavier works, opinions are gradually become clearer. When Liszt and Billau in the middle of the nineteenth century undertook to show the public again the living bach they had to fight a tradition that made stiffness pedantry and absence of temperament the true requisites for bach playing we can therefore easily understand their falling into the other extreme and thinking that if bach was to speak intelligibly to us he must be born again in the spirit of modern virtuosity this was the origin of those bach arrangements and bach interpretations that aimed at modern effects in which the aim was not so much to bring out the laws of the works themselves as to make Bach talk like a modern. Later on, Bülow himself went astray in his Bach editions, that of the chromatic fantasia was a typical case, trying to give the public a simpler idea of Bach's work than the composer had. 
what he was dimly striving after came into clear consciousness in a later and more reflective generation of pianists that had learned to look at Bach's work as a whole. Two typical representatives of this new school are Busoni and Vianna da Motta. These and the others who see eye to eye with them do not aim so much in their Bach playing as in genius dynamic nuances or striking effects as on making the broad plastic lines of the work speak for themselves. Bach is an organist rather than a clavierist. His music is more architectonic than sentimental. That is to say, his feelings express themselves in a kind of acoustic design. As in his organ works, so in his clavier works, there is little of the imperceptible merging of the piano into forte and vice versa. A certain strength of tone dominates a whole period, and is followed by another of a contrasted intensity of tone. Bach's music is always more or less majestic, says Vienna de Motta. It always rises in broad terraces like the primitive Assyrian temples. It is this structure that we must look for if we wish to understand a given work thoroughly. Otherwise, we shall always come to it with an arbitrary conception of our own and try to force it into conformity with this. We must begin with a study of the clavier works in which Bach himself has indicated forte and piano. These are the Italian concerto, the chromatic fantasia. If we can rely on the copies here, and the last partita in B minor, these show us on what very simple lines Bach conceived the structure of a work. The contrasting periods are very long. A change only occurs when there comes a salient episode of a different kind. Even in the echo piece at the end of the partita, the contrasts are not lavishly employed. This very partita, however, shows us that in many works Bach did not calculate on any variation of tone strength. After having made use of the two keyboards in the overture, he adopts only one color for all the other numbers. On the other hand, it is obvious that the majority of the long introductions to the English suites and the partitas demand two-tone colors and are built on the same plan as the overture to the last partita. In the prelude to the English suite in G minor, the piano begins at bar 33 and continues to bar 67. Then comes a forte passage, lasting to bar 99. From this point, the hands play for some bars on different keyboards, the one that has the flying quaver motive derived from the main theme being each time on the forte manual. To bar 125, both are on the main manual. The succeeding piano passage lasts until bar 161, where the right hand goes to the forte manual, while the left stays on the soft manual. In bar 185, this hand also goes to the forte. It is important that in the pieces noted by Bach with forte and piano, we should be quite clear how he goes from one tone tint to the other, sometimes with both hands at once, sometimes with one following the other. In this connection, the organ works should again be studied, which, being laid out on larger and simpler lines, exhibit the terraces much more clearly. Nor should the Brandenburg Concerto be forgotten. They are most illuminative as the structure of Bach's works and the employment of different degrees of strength of tone. We must consider, too, that in the orchestral suites called overtures, BG 31, Bach indicates changes only for the introductions and the free movements, but not for the dances. This accords with the principles exhibited in the last clavier partita. With the information thus acquired, we have some sort of a guide as to the dynamic plan underlying the preludes and fugues of the well-tempered clavichord. Here again, there are a number of pieces among both the preludes and the fugues that are intended to be played in one color throughout. Where the character of the architecture shows no logical necessity for change, where consequently alterations of forte and piano seem arbitrary, it is better to maintain an agreeable and flexible forte. For example, the preludes in C-sharp minor, D minor, and E major from the first part. In the fugues, we shall still more frequently have the conviction that they are not planned for dynamic variety. In the pieces that employ two degrees of strength of tone, these degrees are either distributed simultaneously between two voices or they alternate. To the first order belong the preludes in D minor, A minor and B minor from the second part. Here, the proper dynamic is to bring to the front each time the voice that has the main theme, while the other voice remains more in shadow, as it were. Many preludes are laid out in such a way that the one hand always plays piano, the other always forte, as it is prescribed in the middle movement of the Italian concerto. A typical specimen of this is the three-part prelude in F-sharp minor from the second part, which is written in such a way that the left hand plays the lower voices and the right hand the upper voice alone. 
to play now forte now piano here would be as wrong as to do so against bach's express specifications in the middle movement of the italian concerto the clue to the distribution of light and shade in the a-flat major and a major preludes from the first part is given by the entry of the theme wherever it appears whether in one part alone or in the ensemble it must be given out forte the rest must be kept piano in the f minor prelude of the second part again that is so often maltreated the variations of forte and piano are unequivocally determined for the first section at any rate by the entry of the main theme in the second section the matter is less clear theme and episode not being so clearly marked off from each other the most natural way of playing it would be thus bars one four and a half forte four and a half to eight and a half piano eight and a half to sixteen and a half forte sixteen and a half to twenty and a half piano twenty and a half to thirty two and a half forte thirty two and a half to forty piano forty and a half to forty six and a half right hand forte left piano forty six and a half to fifty two and a half vice versa fifty two and a half to fifty six and a half piano then forte to the end the prelude in c major from the first part seems to be calculated on an echo effect of the kind obtainable on two manual cembalo the first part of the bar should thus be played forte the second half piano in this way it sounds exquisite on the cembalo the prelude has then the effect of a cheerful reverie instead of the pathetic effect we are apt to read into it when we try to bring out the mysterious melody that seems to hover above it if we play it pathetically on our pianos with a big and continuous crescendo the effect is unsatisfactory no matter whether this finishes in a fortissimo or contrary to bach's clear intentions dies away to a pianissimo if indeed it has not done this several times already the one thing we can be sure of with regard to the modern way of interpreting this prelude is that there has never yet been a pianist who has succeeded in playing it to the satisfaction of another the d major fugue in the first part which is more on the line of a fantasia makes its natural effect when we play the main theme the upward striving demi semi quaver figure forte each time it occurs contrasting it with the calm downward moving semi quaver figure which must be played piano in this way the powerful final climax becomes particularly effective in the d minor prelude from the second part again the descending answer to the ascending fanfare like theme should contrast with this by being taken piano if we are to play this prelude in accordance with the sense of it we must conceive it as scored for bach's orchestra on closer examination we shall discover only a few quiet short sections that are to be given in the piano tint these short piano interludes are very characteristic of bach as we see from many examples among the organ and orchestral works their very brevity makes them doubly effective in the majority of pieces however these episodes are to be recognized only from their structural plan and not as contrasts inherent in the theme itself it is safest to be guided by the cadences and the incidents of the polyphony if the segment is preceded by an important cadence or if one or more voices are resting then it is a fair assumption that the passage in question is to be played piano the e major fugue from the second part may serve as an example bars one to twenty two forte twenty three to thirty four piano thirty five to the end forte the e flat major fugue for the same part is similarly laid out bars one to thirty forte thirty to fifty eight piano but with the theme given out forte fifty nine to the end forte the c sharp minor fugue from the first part calls for a similar treatment for increases of intensity within the forte bach realizes only secondarily on dynamic means he builds up the effect by the fullness of his tone and the way in which the voices cooperate the evidence for the inner necessity of a change to piano is not always so clear as this as a rule we have to be satisfied with a certain amount of probability for example when in the f major fugue for the second part we begin the piano at bar twenty nine and let it cease in the left hand in the second half of bar sixty six in the middle voice in the right hand in bar seventy and in the upper voice in the second half of bar seventy three or when in the g minor fugue of the first part we end the forte at bar twelve and one fourths 
taking the following bars of piano, only bringing out the theme forte wherever it occurs, and let the final tutti begin at bar 28, or when in the C major fugue for the first part we begin the piano at bar 14 and let it continue until bar 24, or when in the D major fugue from the second part we play forte until bar 16, piano until 27 and a half, and then bring in the final tutti with many preludes and fugues however our efforts are in vain we can discover in them no dynamic plan that could not equally well be replaced by another and our only recourse is to bring out the theme and avoid marked contrasts as an example we may cite the f minor fugue from the second part in the g minor fugue from the second part it is clear enough that the final tutti begins with bar sixty seven but it is not so clear how far back the previous piano extends one is tempted to begin it in bar forty it is a false modernization to let a cadence that ends a forte section die away in a diminuendo so as to lead over into the following piano or to make a crescendo at the end of a piano section in order to glide imperceptibly into the forte in this way we level the terraces on which everything depends in these works and destroy the plastic outlines of the piece the bach cadence is something solid and must be given out in the normal tone of the section which it concludes it is this stock antithesis that gives the music its charm as can be seen in the brandenburg concertos the tutti voices suddenly cease and the concertino of the solo voices after having entered on the last chord of the tutti remains suspended as it were in the air it is another false modernization to begin or end pianissimo just as in a pianoforte piece that bach himself has marked or in a brandenburg concerto or in an organ work we have to begin and end in a forte we must so begin and end in the pieces of the well-tempered clavichord. This rule will not at first be acquiesced in by players who think in the modern pianistic way. It will strike them as pedantic. Nevertheless, the longer we play Bach, the more we revolt against artificialities and clevernesses of every kind, and feel that the simplest way is the only right one. Some day we shall even dare to begin and end the e-flat minor and b-flat minor preludes from the first part in a beautiful but full-toned color and to conceive them largely and pathetically instead of delicately and sentimentally as we do now in the e-flat minor prelude all the chords whether they lie above or below should be taken piano while everything that pertains to the eloquent theme including the cadences should be taken forte in the b-flat minor prelude we should begin with a vigorously shaded forte take bars thirteen and fourteen piano then begin again with a quiet forte that works up until three bars before the end the final cadence being taken in a quiet forte a further fault that is likewise ground in the pianistic feeling of our time consists in sacrificing everything in a fugue to the working out of the theme and as soon as this enters clapping the hand as it were over the mouth of the other obligato voices the result being that the auditor hears the theme but not the fugue in episodical passages it is natural to play the theme whenever possible on a separate manual as it were but in the logical opening and final structure of the fugue all the obligato voices have equal rights and the theme can only be considered as primus inter pares from the foregoing it is evident that on the piano as on the organ it is wrong to begin a theme pianissimo and then work it up through a continuous crescendo to a final fortissimo as if we were first presenting it as a cub and then showing it in all the stages of its development until it becomes a lion every bach theme whether it expresses joy or grief has a touch of the sublime about it and it must be delivered in this style from the beginning it must be confessed though that it is difficult for us modern musicians to emancipate ourselves from the idea of working bach gradually up to a final climax there are still many artists who think that the essence of the fugue in general and of bach fugue in particular consists in a gradual pulling up from piano to fortissimo the laws here laid down for the plastic performance of bach's music are not derived from tradition but are grounded in the works themselves they attest that nothing is gained by besprinkling his compositions with pianissimo piano mezzo forte forte fortissimo crescendo and decrescendo as if they were written for the accordion but that we must aim either at the working out of a broad dynamic plan or decide to play the work with a uniform strength of tone this view can seem pedantic only to those who think that it elevates monotony to an artistic principle the opposite is really the case when the one quality of tone is distributed over a segment large or small 
it must be richly shaded in detail but in such a way that these shadings do not overstep the limits of that particular degree of tone bach loved the clavichord so much precisely because he could produce this shading of detail on it and the magic of his playing for his contemporaries came from his vivacity of detail we must therefore distinguish in his music between an architectonic dynamic that aims at bringing out the great lines of the piece and the dynamic of detail that accompanies it the object of which is to give life to these lines the latter could almost be styled a declamatory dynamic being somewhat analogous to the cadential element in the musical speech bach's music is gothic just as in gothic architecture the great plan develops out of the simple motive but enfolds itself in the richest detail instead of in rigid line and only makes its effect when every detail is truly vital so does the impression of a bach work makes on the hearer depend on the player communicating to him the massive outline and the details together both equally clear and equally full of life if in place of this dual architectonic dynamic we put the uniform modern emotional dynamic such as we meet with in beethoven's works we have simply done our best to make bach unintelligible by confounding the great and the small nuances in one therefore to play the prelude in e flat minor and b flat minor from the first part with a uniform strength of tone does not mean playing them monotonously but declaiming them with simple and impressive pathos avoiding sentimental effects and trying to get all possible richness by the perfect shading of the normal forte within our bach forte we must get the relief of a piano and a forte and a similar shading in the piano our mezzo forte is unknown to bach the sign m f is nowhere to be found in his music he serves the link that binds piano to forte on the other hand as is proved by his markings in the scores of the cantatas he distinguishes a pianissimo within the piano a mezzo forte makes a bach piece uninteresting this holds good not only for the piano and the organ works but for the orchestral concertos and the cantatas if an orchestral piece does not make its effect we may be sure that in half the cases this is the fault of a lack of character in the quality of tone employed unfortunately our pianists and instrumentalists can get a mezzo forte but neither a piano nor a forte that is rich and capable of gradation for this reason it is no unreasonable demand curious as it may seem that whoever wishes to interpret bach must first of all learn how to play forte and piano in bach however the real essential thing is not so much the dynamic shading as the phrasing and accentuation we soon realize this when we look at one of those precious orchestral scores which he has furnished with indications for performance seifert in his fine essay on praktische bierbeitungen bachscher kompositionen justly contrasts him in this respect with handel in handel he says the care for dynamic effects is always uppermost for the phrasing he is satisfied with incidental hints bach gives extremely little in the way of dynamic suggestion but he all the more carefully phrases the orchestral parts seifert's explanation of this difference that handel had at his disposal trained orchestral players while bach had only town musicians is not convincing the difference in the two methods is rooted in the dissimilarity of the men's music bach's works demand a characteristic and subtle phrasing of the themes and of the parts on which the effect of the whole almost entirely depends handel's themes and passages on the contrary run more on the customary lines and demand no such individuality of phrasing in general we may lay down the principle that in bach every theme and every phrase must be delivered as if we were playing it on a bowed instrument this holds good for the pianoforte not less than for the woodwind instruments we play the preludes and fugues of the well-tempered clavichord in accordance with bach's intentions when we try to render them as if we were employing not a keyed instrument but a quartet or a quintet the ideal must be to link the notes in such a way that they do not seem to be struck one after the other but as if several bows were being simultaneously drawn over the strings bach's omission to record the phrasing and grouping in his clavier works is due partly to the fact that this was not customary at the time the executive artist in our sense of the term being as yet unknown and partly to the fact that the players he had in view were almost always his sons and his pupils who were familiar with his principles in the works for clavier with other instruments there are often indications of the phrasing in the clavier part bach thinking it necessary that the clavier player should phrase precisely like the instrumentalists look for example at many movements in the violin sonatas and among the clavier concertos 
at the one in a major number four the greatest importance however attaches to the dots and ties in the orchestral parts of the brandenburg concertos and of certain cantatas a study of these will convince any one of the right way to phrase the clavier works legato playing that is regarded as the characteristic of the bach school does not as we observed in connection with the organ works mean a uniform style of delivery but implies an endless variety in the tying and grouping of single notes of equal value four semiquavers are for bach not four semiquavers but the raw material for quite varied shapes according to how he groups them thus or 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 the last system of connection that is almost universal elsewhere is always subordinated by him to the other and more characteristic systems he mostly groups the notes in twos when the second and third semiquavers have the same note in common in these cases he always uses short ties as if he were afraid of being misunderstood thus on the very first page of the italian concerto the same grouping is also found in certain cases where none of the notes is repeated but it is observable that here as a rule the melody moves in seconds in the b minor fugue from the first part bach indicates this grouping by twos as it did not seem to him quite self-evident in this connection it cannot be sufficiently insisted on that the second of the tight notes should be like a mere breath a bach connoisseur like jevet advocates writing such passages in this way this accentual rule naturally holds only good for the normal case in which the first of the two tight notes coincides with a stronger beat in the opposite case the second gets the strong accent and the first counts as a preliminary prelude twenty second part the rhythm in which the fourth note is attached from the first three appears in the presto of the italian concerto where bach in addition plays a dot over the last note so as to ensure it being properly detached from the others the combination most frequently met with however is that in which the last three notes are tied and separated from the first here again bach makes sure of the freedom of the first by means of a dot thus at the commencement of the italian concerto in a longer succession of tied notes again the first must be detached from the others bach phrases the presto of the italian concerto sometimes thus the dot only signifies that the note does not belong to the same group as those that follow it is however closely bound to the preceding ones in our notation this is best expressed by including the detached note in the same tie as a previous note thus fuga in b flat second part fuga in g major second part In the groups in triple time again the first beat is very often the second of a tied series not the commencement of a new one bach's phrasing of the theme of the a major fugue from the first part would therefore be this even in pure triplets it is in certain cases better to separate the second and third notes from the first as if taking a light breath the eighth bar of the b flat major prelude from the second part should consequently be played thus the phrasing is so frequent in bach because his themes and figurations even where the bar divisions do not indicate it to the eye have generally an upbeat character beginning with an unaccented note that leads into an accented one it is a great mistake to play successive notes in his music with equal volume in the style of Czerny's School of Velocity or Clementi or Kramer. 
there the essence of the legato phrasing is that we begin with an accented note and play the remainder as nearly as possible with the same weight bach's legato however is much less pianistic and much more vital the large tie in his musical embraces numberless smaller ones that gather the notes into subordinate groups neither in his piano runs nor in his violin runs does he desire equivalence in the notes each has its relative value namely that belonging to it from its place in the tie this can be explained on historical grounds the monotonous legato that obsesses our pianoforte schools could only become after the passing under of the thumb had become recognized as the cardinal principle in playing a legato of this kind was impossible so long as people simply passed the other fingers over and under each other or merely moved the hand as a whole and fingered scale passages three four three four three four or five four three two two one as bach tells his son to do in the clavier ubum the ties of the second kind grew out of the style of fingering for this reason bach's legato compared with the usual pianistic legato is as much richer and more varied as his fingering was richer and more diverse than ours we must not imagine we are playing bach with the right legato when we have worked out on paper all the passing unders of the thumb and the complicated interchanges of the fingers and so make sure that every note will be properly sustained even to the last hundred thousandth of its value the correct tying and fingering are those which bring out all the variety intended by bach in the phrasing and the accents that is those which tell the bach staccato coincides only in rare cases with our light modern staccato it is not so much a key pizzicato as the short and heavy stroke of a bow its effect is therefore to accentuate the note rather than to lighten it it would be better indicated in our notation by a short stroke than by a dot long quaver or semi quaver passages in staccato are rarely met with in bach when he separates the notes it is only by way of a transient interruption of the legato perhaps in passages like this the semi quavers between the two ties are to be played staccato and this time lightly not heavily certain indications in the orchestral parts make it probable that in the weakest beats of the six eighths and similar times when the motion is quite uniform a light staccato is often indicated to break the legato in general however the rule holds good that bach's staccato does not run a uniform course and that it is not light but heavy an interesting case where he makes use of a staccato to accentuate a beat is found in the final allegro of the clavier concerto in a major the transition here is in every respect so abrupt especially as the orchestra enters on the trill that the break must to some extent be put on the triplets to play them with a light staccato would be to run the risk of negating bach's intentions the only rhythm that must always be given in staccato notes is that which bach uses to express solemnity we must detach the second note from the first let it press forward toward the one that follows and play it rather too heavily than too lightly in order to preserve the impression of a somewhat formal solemnity of the kind that bach wishes to suggest in many of his sarabands and gigs thus the bass of the f sharp major prelude from the second part should be played thus nor should we be afraid to play whole pieces such as the g minor prelude from the second part if they are wholly in this rhythm without a single really legato note the rhythm and and the variants of these demand a certain emphasis on the short notes as if there were a fear of their passing unobserved the shorter they are in actual time value the more careful we must be to make them tell in this way we can detach them somewhat from the main note and play them with a heavy staccato for example well tempered clavichord prelude 17 second part have we any means of knowing whether groups of notes are to be played staccato in the first place the staccato is required when the sequence is in characteristic or widely separated intervals under this first rule come all the themes that have anything of a springy motion the best known example is perhaps the theme of the f major invention the theme of the choral fantasia jesus christus unser heiland again from the third part of the clavier ubung must be played staccato
the theme of the a minor fugue from the second part of the well-tempered clavichord must be given thus it seemed self-evident to bach that the crotchets in this theme could only be rendered in this way some players, however, might have been in doubt as to whether to play the quaver legato or staccato. Bach therefore settled the matter by adding dots to the notes. He could not foresee that by doing so he would tempt the players of later generations to play the crotchets legato, as they have no dots, and to contrast the staccato quavers with them. The second rule for the employment of the staccato in Bach might be formulated somewhat thus that any note interrupting a uniform motion at once steps out of the general tie embracing the preceding notes the examples of this are innumerable a typical one is the theme of the d minor fugue from the first part in which bach himself made the staccato point throughout the whole piece here indeed it becomes perfectly clear that the principle of the bach phrasing is derived from an ideal bowing this general rule however has one exception the interrupting passage is only to be played staccato if it moves in a zigzag line if it consistently ascends or descends in uniform and close lying intervals it must be played legato there are thus two fundamental conceptions from which the whole of bach's themes have sprung the first is that of the differentiated ties the second is that of the staccato as a rhythmic interruption of the legato Therefore, the phrasing of the themes should not be left to the caprice of genius, but must be deduced from the ground rules of legato and staccato in Bach. Every player can acquaint himself with the typical combinations that arise from the differentiation of the ties and from the concurrence of legato and staccato, and can thus learn to bring out the various groups of which a Bach theme is composed. A few examples from the well-tempered clavichord may serve to elucidate these points. Themes consisting purely of differentiated ties prelude 20 part 2 fuga 6 part 2 fuga 10 part 1 Prelude 5, Part 2. Prelude 2, Part 2. Themes combining legato and staccato. Fuga 2, Part 1. Fugue 21, Part 1. Fugue 16, Part 1. Fugue 1, Part 1. Fugue 15, Part 1. Fugue 11, Part 1. Fugue 5, Part 1. Fugue 12, Part 1. Fugue 7, Part 2. Closely bound up with the question of phrasing is that of accentuation. It is indeed solved by the right solution of the other. It has already been remarked in connection with ties that Bach's themes are mostly conceived as beginning with a large upbeat. The unaccented notes do not follow, but lead up to an accented note. Therefore, to play Bach rhythmically means accenting not the downbeat, but the emphatic beat. With him, more than with any other composer, the bar divisions are only external divisions of the themes 
the real meter of which cannot as a rule be represented in simple time species the first to express this clearly was rudolf westphal in his metrical study of the fugues in common time in the well-tempered clavichord in which he proves again and again that those who regard the bar lines in Bach's music as the borders of the rhythmic factors are bound to play him unrhythmically in a Bach theme everything urges forward to a principal accent till this comes all is restless chaotic when it arrives the tension relaxes and at one stroke all that went before becomes clear we understand why the notes had these intervals and these values the chaos becomes order the restlessness becomes peace the theme lies before the hearer like a good coin with the milling fresh and sharp if however this emphasis is lacking and in place of the note that is an integral part of the rhythm of the theme we accent strongly a note that belongs only to the bar rhythm the unity and totality of the impression are destroyed all he has in his hand is a coin of several pieces soldered together that keep falling asunder this of course does not mean that in bach the thematic accent and the bar accent never coincide cases of this kind however are more or less accidental the superior vitality and lucidity given to bach's music by throwing the main accent on the characteristic notes can be seen at once by anyone who makes a practical trial of it accenting according to the nature of the theme instead of taking the phrases with the usual rise and fall the final diminuendo with all its shadings that we introduce into everything out of pure habit is one of the direst enemies of stylistic bach playing the point can be best elucidated by reference to the theme of the e flat minor prelude it is usually played thus it should really go thus if we play it in this way the prelude couched as it is in dialogue form acquires a much finer inner coherence to these indications for the accentuation of bach's melodies one is tempted to add another rule that may seem extrinsic and imperfect but which does good service in the majority of cases according to this rule we should primarily emphasize the notes at the end of the melodic line running in a certain direction whether this is carried through in one piece or breaks off now and then and continues in separate segments in the latter case the end notes of each segment form preliminary accents that are meant to lead up to and culminate in the last and principal accent it is just these themes built up in periods that are most often misunderstood the following is a specimen of correct accentuation well tempered clavichord fugue 11 part 2 here as a rule we do indeed hear the first two accents the third however on the f that ought to crown the others is lost and the theme runs about in the fugue like the poor ghost that carries its head under its arm fugue seventeen part two this case is similar to the foregoing the average player resists the seductive appeal of the third beat for the first accent he cannot however resist the first beat of the second bar he respects the traditional rights of a note that occupies so important a position and gives the a flat the accent that should be given to the d flat without noticing that the succeeding semiquavers are no more than an ideal retardation of the passage of the d flat into the c in the second place a main accent must be given to the note that interrupts a melodic line more or less suddenly whether the note be syncopated or not as a matter of fact in the majority of cases it will happen either on a striking interval or on a syncopation this sudden holding back is a characteristic feature of a number of Bach's themes. If we efface it by emphasizing the strong beats, we only torture the outline of the theme. But if we bring it out by proper accentuation, we reveal the great natural line that embraces this angular curve. We should therefore always emphasize with confidence any conspicuous interval or syncopation. This holds good even in matters of detail. In the B minor prelude of the first part of the well-tempered clavichord, the natural bar accent seems demanded by the regular quaver movement in the bass if however we accent thus it will immediately be followed that this rhythmical antagonism between the upper parts and even the bass is the very life of the prelude it is unnecessary to say that here the emphasized notes are to be detached from the preceding ones the following are types of themes that call for this syncopated accentuation 
Fuga 19, Part 2. That the main accent here must be given to the last note, which on the first thought one would hardly venture to do, is provided by the further course of the piece, and especially its end. The two syncopations are thus only preliminary accents, leading up to the third. Fuga 16, Part 2. Here, the method of accentuation may be thought too venturesome, but with repeated playing it will finally seem more right than the more obvious accentuation on the first beat. A particular result of this syncopated accentuation is to give life to the otherwise monotonous seven quavers on the same note. Fugue 8, Part 1 This theme clearly shows how little significance the bar divisions in Bach have for the thematic emphasis. That the consistent syncopated accentuation here is the only right one is shown by the composer himself at the finish. As if he had sufficiently played with the performer and the hearer, he brings in the theme in augmentation in such a way that the syncopations fall on the strong beats. In the animated second subject of the Italian concerto, again, we can see how the syncopation deprives the neighboring strong beat of its accent. It is usually accented thus. This, however, does not bring out the essential principle of its structure. The correct way of phrasing is that in which the two syncopations act as preliminary accents leading up to the final accent. Thus, It may be objected that accentuation on these principles is too harsh and rough to be correct. It is, however, the only accentuation that does justice to the original character of Bach's themes. The hearer will not feel anything disagreeable in the sharp characterization they thus receive. He will only feel the truth and vitality of it. In any case, the fugues will now give him more enjoyment than before, as he will grasp the rhythmic essence of them instead of regarding them in the customary way as mere sequences of intervals and it is quite certain that the cultivated hearer also pursues a theme in all its developments not as a sequence of intervals but primarily as a succession of certain characteristic accents that bring with them the idea of the intervals associated with them reference has been made in the chapter on the organ works to the profound distinction between bach's organ themes and his clavier themes the former are almost always based on the principle of the accentuation of the strong beat since it is impossible to bring out any other accent on the organ it is even impossible to make one note stand out above the others. The possibility of this on the piano, if only in a limited way, is made use of by Bach to the utmost permissible limits. Bowed instruments, again, can individualize the tone much more even than the piano. The themes of Bach's instrumental works are much freer and bolder than those of the clavier works. Whatever force we give to the accent, the phrasing must be kept discreet and unobtrusive. In the last resort, the whole phrase, with its varieties of ties and the staccati between them, must be embraced as it were in one large tie, which permits of diversity without restlessness. The hearer really should not be conscious of the phrasing as such. He must only be conscious of it as a self-evident and vital illumination of the whole, down to the smallest detail, so that he is himself surprised at the ease with which he grasps this complicated polyphony. There is little to be said with regard to the tempo in Bach's clavier works. The better anyone plays Bach, the more slowly he can take the music, the worse he plays him, the faster he must take it. Good playing implies a fine phrasing and accentuation in every detail, in every voice. This of itself sets certain technical bounds to speed. On the other hand, in playing of the right kind, the hearer, even if the tempo is not quick in itself, has the feeling of it being quite fast enough, for the reason that at any quicker pace, he could not grasp the detail. It should never be forgotten what a complicated process it really means for any musician, even for one who is not listening to it for the first time, to follow one of Bach's polyphonic works properly. Of course, if we are careless as to our phrasing and accentuation, and so obliterate the greater part of the detail, we can play faster with impunity, so as to give the music another interest of a kind. In general, however, the maxim holds good, 
that the vivacity of a Bach piece depends not on the tempo, but on the phrasing and the accentuation. In this sense, every one may strive to play him with plenty of temperament. The tempo marks where they exist should not be interpreted in a modern sense. Bach's adagio, grave, and lento are not so slow as ours, nor his presto so fast. Therefore, we are easily betrayed into making his slow movements too long drawn, and of hurrying his fast ones. The circle of possible tempi in his music is a relatively narrow one. The question is really one of varied nuances on either side of a moderato. The presto of the Italian concerto is as a rule played twice as fast as it should be. Nobody will make this mistake who tries to realize the complicated system of ties that Bach has indicated in the movement. It goes without saying that the alla brav sign in Bach implies nothing as regards the tempo. It does not double the speed of the four crotchet beat. The ideal edition of Bach's clavier works would be a critically correct reprint of the original, in which the text is not adorned with ties and dynamic indications. It is hard to say how much mischief has been done by many of the old editions and arrangements. It would be something to establish the principle that the editor should indicate all editions of his own, so that the player who has not the original edition at hand may know what is and what is not by Bach and can use his own judgment. An inquiry among the piano-playing public would show that the majority have no idea that the ties and dynamic indications in their scores are not Bach's own. The best thing for our Bach editors to do would be to follow Busoni's example and publish not arrangements but their interpretations of the works. Busoni's edition of the Chromatic Fantasia, published by Simrock, is one of the finest achievements of this kind. That fascinates even those who cannot always see eye to eye with Busoni on the question of the permissible limits of modernization of Bach's music. It is to be hoped that Bulow's arrangement of this work is nowadays relegated to a bygone epoch of Bach interpretation. He himself would wish it to be so, were he alive now. Instructive editions of Bach's clavier works have this difficulty to contend with, that in half of them the text becomes unreadable by reasons of the number of ties, staccato dots, and accents that are needed in order to give vitality of the phrasing. Perhaps future editors will adopt the plan of expressing their views in prefaces and footnotes instead of in the text. After all, the essential things are only the suggestion of the great dynamic lines and the phrasing and accenting of the themes. The details of the development of the work follow of themselves from these. Another advantage of editions of this kind would be that they could discuss various alternative phrasings instead of peremptorily thrusting one upon the player. It cannot be denied that many editions of piano music do not induce self-reliance but the lack of it. This does more harm in the case of Bach's music than in any other. No one can play it satisfactorily who is not conscious of the essential principles of its musical structure. Perhaps even the copious fingerings that adorn our Bach editions are not so beneficial as is generally supposed, for they relieve the player of the trouble and the profit of working them out for himself. The rules for playing Bach's clavier works here elaborated are open to many objections. The view that the phrasing of the preludes and fugues of the well-tempered clavichord is primarily to be learned from Bach's own phrasing of orchestral parts will perhaps be thought too drastic. The rules as to accentuation may appear to lay too much stress on characterization. It will be objected that these dynamic rules insist too strongly on the architectonic side of the music. All this, however, does not in any way invalidate the rules. We may even regard it as a positive necessity to formulate general principles for performing Bach's clavier works, and it may be that these will coincide with the views of a number of our Bach pianists, who are also in revolt against excessive and unintelligent modernization of the works, and believe that more is to be hoped for from a careful artistic enquiry than from self-satisfied caprice. The greater or less extent to which these views are adopted, however, is of little consequence. They will have fulfilled their object if they prompt players to more thorough reflection and a more careful examination of the works. In any case, no reader can be so conscious as the author that the framing of rules is more unsatisfactory and more imperfect in art than anywhere else. End of chapter 16 Read for you by Chiquito Crasto Music performed from the source text available in the public domain by Jonathan Schofield, Birmingham, Alabama Chapter 17 of J. S. Bach by Albert Schweitzer, translated by Ernest Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
read for you by Chiquito Crasto, music performed by Jonathan Schofield. Chamber and Orchestral Works Bach seems to have cultivated violin playing from childhood. When he left the gymnasium at Luneburg, he was an accomplished violinist and could take a place as such in the orchestra of Johann Ernst, the brother of the reigning Duke of Weimar. Nor did he neglect the stringed instruments in later life. In chamber music, he played by preference the viola, for in this way he found himself, as it were, in the center of the web of tone. We have no direct information as to the extent of his proficiency on these instruments. We may be sure, however, that he had a thorough practical knowledge of the technique of the stringed instruments. Otherwise, it would have been impossible for him to take such unique advantage of all the effects that can be obtained on them, as he does in the polyphonic works of violin, gamba, and cello solo. Nor can he quite forget that he is a violinist in the works written for keyed instruments. The violinist is observable on every page. The characteristic of Bach's piano and organ style is precisely this, that he demands from the keyed instruments the same aptitudes for phrasing and modulation as the strings. At bottom, he conceived everything for an ideal instrument that had all the keyed instruments' possibilities of polyphonic playing and all the bowed instruments' capacities for phrasing. This is how he came to write polyphonically even for a single instrument polyphonic playing on the violin had long been customary in germany bruns sixteen hundred and sixty six to sixteen hundred and ninety seven of husum buxtehude's pupil used to perform in this way at the same time playing the bass on the organ pedals the italians were far behind the northerners in this art although bach wrote in reality three partitas suites and three sonatas it is customary to speak for brevity's sake of his six sonatas for solo violin. As might be guessed from our knowledge of his way of composing, these works were written within a short time of each other. They belong to the Coton Epoch. The oldest autograph we have of them probably dates from about 1720. The history of this autograph is told by Polkhau, the gallant manuscript hunter of the early days of Bach enthusiasm. In a short note on the front page of it, I found this excellent work, in Bach's own handwriting, in Petersburg in 1814, among a lot of old papers, destined for the butter shop that had belonged to Palskow, the pianist. At a later date it passed, with the other manuscript treasures of the finder, into the possession of the Berlin Royal Library. Polkow was in error, however, in imagining it to be an autograph of Bach's. It is from the hand of Anna Magdalena, whose handwriting even at that time was deceptively like that of her husband. While she was making the copy, she was watching over one of the boys, perhaps Friedemann, who used a free page for exercises of his own in making notes, his father having written some examples for him. There are no blank sheets, for the leaves are filled on the same principles as the English autograph of the second part of the well-tempered clavichord. In order to avoid the necessity of turning over, each work is made to occupy one or other side of a page only. In the Leipzig period, Anna Magdalena made a new copy of the sonatas for solo violin. She made them up in one volume with those for violoncello with the title Pars I, Violino Solo, Senza Basso, Composé par Signor Jean Seb Bach, Pars II, Violoncello Solo, Senza Basso, Composé par Signor j s bach maitre de la chapelle et directeur de la musique à leipzig écrite par madame bachen son épouse bach it will be observed is not called court composer the copy must therefore be dated earlier than seventeen hundred and thirty six the sonatas for solo violin were first printed in eighteen hundred and two by simrock of bonn in eighteen hundred and fifty four robert schumann edited for them edited them for breitkopf and hartel adding a pianoforte accompaniment to them this was following in the footsteps of mendelssohn who had adopted the same procedure in eighteen hundred and forty seven with a chacon from the second partita to us it is incomprehensible that two such great artists could believe that they were thus carrying out bach's intentions the sonatas and partitas are so arranged that each sonata is followed by a partita in both of them we hardly know what to admire most, 
the richness of the invention or the daring of the polyphony that is given to the violin the more we read hear and play them the greater our astonishment becomes the chacon that concludes the second partita has always been regarded as the classical piece for solo violin and justly since both the theme and its development are consummately adapted to the genius of the instrument out of a single theme bach conjures up a whole world we seem to hear sorrow contending with pain till at last they blend in a mood of profound resignation it is very instructive to compare the chacon with the passacaglia for organ which is also in reality a chacon for the organ bach takes a theme that is accented only on the strong beats of the bar knowing well that the least syncopation would give the whole work a restlessness that would make it unbearable on the organ on the violin however that permits of every kind of accent cross accentuation makes for superior force and vivacity he therefore employs here a quite unusual amount of syncopation the instrument free from the hindrance of an accompaniment shall for once realize all its powers in perfect unrestraint it is interesting to note at the two themes side by side that between them incarnate the organ and the violin music of bach chacon for violin Sacaglia for organ. Notice how in the Chacon Bach alternates between polyphonic and monophonic writing so as to give the hearer relief and to heighten the effect of the polyphony by the monophony interspersed among it his music as a whole is full of these fine calculations of effect every one who has heard these sonatas must have realized how sadly this material enjoyment of them falls below his ideal enjoyment there are many passages in them that the best player cannot render without a certain harshness the arpeggio harmonies sometimes make a particularly bad effect even in the finest playing polyphonic arpeggio playing is and must be an impossibility there is thus some justification for the question whether bach in these sonatas has not overstepped the bounds of artistic possibility if it be so he has for once acted against his own principles for everywhere else he has been careful to set an instrument only such tasks as it can solve with satisfaction to the ear recent research seems to show that the tradition of bach's own day can throw some light on this in an interesting article by arnold schering one of the most assiduous of bach's students of our time some passages from old works are cited that make it probable that the old arced bow with which the tension was affected not by means of a screw but by the pressure of the thumb was still in use in germany in bach's time the flat mechanically stretched italian bow the predecessor of that of today was indeed known in germany from the beginning of the eighteenth century but displaced the older one very slowly the german violinist of bach's day could thus stretch the hairs tighter or relax them as he liked chords that the virtuosi of today can play only with difficulty and without any beauty of effect by throwing the bow back on the lower strings gave him no trouble at all he simply loosened the hairs a little so that they curved over the strings this accounts for the fact that the germans cultivated polyphonic playing on the violin while it was almost unknown to the italians in italy the straight bow with its purely mechanical tension had already established itself by the end of the seventeenth century this bow permits a polyphonic playing only to a limited extent since it allows of no further tension during the performance for if the hairs are relaxed they do not arch over the strings but fall against the stick with the old german bow on the other hand the stick of which was not straight there was a fair space between the hairs and the bow the last representative of chord playing on the violin was the norwegian ola bull eighteen hundred and ten to eighteen hundred and eighty his bridge was quite flat he had his bows made in such a way 
that the stick stood at a considerable distance from the hairs. It is interesting to know that he always maintained that this method was no new invention of his own, but a return to the true violin method of the past. It is quite possible that in Scandinavia the traditions of the 17th century had been retained, along with the old bows, down to Ola Bull's time. In his sonatas for violin solo, Bach has thus demanded of the instrument nothing impossible or even unsatisfactory per se, but only what seems so with our excessively arched bridges and our flat Italian bows. To play these sonatas as he did, we need only to file down the archings of the bridge so as to bring the strings almost level, and to use a bow so shaped from nut to point that the hairs can curve towards the stick without touching it. Still better is a bow with a slightly curved stick. In this way, violinists will be able once more to play Bach in a correct style. Any one who has heard the chords of the Chacon played without any restlessness and without arpeggios can no longer doubt that this is the only correct and, from the artistic standpoint, satisfactory way of playing it. Of course, the slackly stretched bow demands a different technique from the usual one. The pure springing bow is impossible. But the tone also undergoes a change. It acquires a curious softness. If we play the chords with the hairs of the bow relaxed, we get an almost organ-like tone somewhat like that of a soft selicionale. To get an idea of this tone, unscrew the hairs of an ordinary bow, place the stick under the violin, lay the hairs over the strings, and fasten them again to the stick. If we move this reversed bow, we observe the organ-like ethereal tone that the relaxed bow produced. When we have imitated the old bow as best we can, and given the hairs their utmost tension by thumb pressure in the monophonic passages, we still do not get the powerful tone of the modern mechanically stretched bow. We purchased beauty of tone, that is to say, at the expense of some loss of strength. The reproach was always being leveled against Ola Bull that his tone was weak. It is a question whether the modern public would accustom itself to this weak tone. In large concert rooms, it will scarcely be possible to play the sonatas for solo violin in the old way, as the tone would not carry sufficiently. In chamber music performances, on the other hand, the proper style of rendering should suit admirably. If we had once heard the Chacon in this way, we cannot afterwards endure it in any other. Thus the result would be that the works for solo violin would disappear from the programs of, of the larger concerts and be restored to the chamber music to which they really belong. The movements of the sonatas for the solo violin that exist also for the piano or organ are arrangements of violin originals. It is doubtful whether they are all effective in this form. They show, however, how completely the violin method of phrasing ranked with Bach as the universal method to which the keyed instruments had to try to conform. When we read the prelude of the third partita, we find it impossible to believe that Bach could have entertained the idea of asking the organ to perform these repeated semi-quavers, the proper articulation of which is possible only on a bowed instrument. Yet this is what he actually does in the instrumental prelude to the Ratzwall cantata, Weir Duncan dear, got a weir Duncan dear. Number twenty nine. He could only venture to do so because he himself played the part on the rook positive of the organ at St. Thomas's. The fugue of the first sonata may have been originally conceived for the organ. Its theme is derived from the first movement of the Veni Sancte Spiritus and runs thus. Madison quotes this theme in his Gross General Basschule and sketches a development of which resembles Bach's at many points, especially in the employment of a chromatic countersubject. As he quotes in the same place the theme of the great organ fugue in G minor without mentioning Bach's name, it may be taken for granted that he has also the fugue of the third sonata before him. Did Bach play it in Hamburg about 1720 as an organ fugue? assuredly not in the present form for the structure of the fugue it reminds us of the chacon has nothing whatever in common with those for the organ but is wholly designed for the violin here again therefore the violin form must be the original one in two places madison speaks of the fugue of a minor sonata with unreserved admiration the six sonatas for violin solo also belong to the colton period they are as perfect in their own way as the works for violin solo. Chord playing, of course, is not used to anything like the same extent, nor does Bach even employ a simple kind of two-part polyphony. 
this is to be explained by the fact that the germans played the big violin with the non-relaxable bow in quality these suites remind us of the french the last but one is described as a suite discordable and requires the tuning of the a string down to g thus for the last bach requires a stringed instrument with an e string above the a there may have been five string cellos at that time it is more probable however that bach wrote the suite for the viola pomposa that he invented and that was strung in this way we know from gerber who was the son of one of bach's pupils that bach employed this instrument in the orchestra in the early leipzig years the stiff way says the lexicographer in which the violoncello was played in bach's time compelled him to invent for the animated basses of his works the so-called viola pomposa which was a little longer and deeper than a viola and was turned like a violoncello with a fifth string e and was laid on the arm on this convenient instrument very high and rapid passages were easier in considering the works for a solo instrument with clavier we must remember the distinction of that day between the obligato clavier and the accompanying clavier in a sonata with obligato clavier the latter plays the chief role several obligato parts being given to it while the solo instrument has only one in bach we do not get a sonata for violin and clavier or sonata for flute and clavier but sonata for clavier and violin and sonata for clavier and flute a light is thrown on the way of looking at the matter in that epoch by the fact that a work for clavier and violin if the polyphony was in three parts was called a trio they counted that is to say not the instruments but the obligato parts by sonata for violin and clavier bach means a composition in which the clavier only supplies the bass and the figured bass even zelta uses the terms in this sense of bach's works for obligato clavier and violin we possess a suite in a major and six sonatas for violin with accompanying clavier he wrote a sonata a fugue and four inventions the suite for clavier and violin is not on the same level as the six sonatas it is probably an earlier work bach incessantly improved the sonatas as is shown by the various copies of them the last version is represented by a copy of altnikol's the manuscript that belonged to emmanuel is overloaded with ornaments in the same way friedemann when transcribing his father's organ sonatas embellished them according to the taste of the epoch this shows us how much reliance is to be placed on the ornaments in any work of bach's that we possess only in copies even though these are by his sons these sonatas were written at coton how small by the side of them seem the works of corelli and the other italian violin composers at whose feet bach had sat in weimar bach's sonatas like beethoven's depict soul states and inner experiences but with force in the place of passion whether he is sunk in sorrow or in mystical dreams bach always recovers himself in a compact fugal finale sorrow predominates we could almost imagine that bach wrote these works under the impression of the loss of his first wife the siciliano of the fourth sonata is composed on a theme that closely resembles that of the aria embarma dich in the saint matthew passion and a sob runs through both of them siciliano from the fourth sonata Aria Erbarma Dich from the Saint Matthew Passion. This movement has, of course, nothing in common with the Siciliano of earlier composers except its motion and its rhythm. It has nothing of the lyrical pastoral mood. it is filled with the deepest pathos throughout it should be played in the spirit the violin part as in the corresponding aria in the saint matthew passion being heavily rather than lightly accented the third and sixth quavers should be brought out with some force and opposed by means of a certain weight of emphasis to the following strong beat if bach had not conceived it thus he would not have aimed at greater intensity towards the end by throwing the accent back on to the weak beat by means of syncopation
Many of our violinists play these sonatas in a sentimental style, instead of the expressive Bach style. An experienced critic in the Neue Zeitschrift für Musik rightly complains that in the practical edition of the new Bach Gesellschaft, the player will be misled into beginning the proud and energetic themes of the Allegro movements in a soft piano in order to get the usual gradual crescendo, and will do this even in the theme of the last sonata. That this is intended to suggest impetuous motion is shown by the fact that Bach uses it again, only in fuller form, in the secular cantata Weichert nur Betruote Schatten, B.G. 11, to illustrate the works Phoebus Flies with Swift Horses. Of what use are all the pianos, mezzo fortes and fortes, that the majority of our players and many editors import into these sonatas? The musician has yet to be born who can convince another where the piano or the forte or the crescendo or decrescendo should begin and end in the various movements. Of course, the obvious echo effects and the contrast intended between a pianoforte theme in one part and a tutti theme in another admit of no question. But what nuances are we to put, for example, into the first movement of the B minor sonata or that of the E major? Why should we play now softly, now loudly, in the andante of the first sonata? As this alternation is not an essential part of the structure of the works, its only effect must be to create an impression of aimlessness and unrest. What should we say if any one were to paint over fine, old steel engravings in modern tints under the pretext of heightening their effect? Yet there is no such general outcry against the variety of colors that are imposed upon Bach's works. In general, each movement of the violin sonatas should be played with a uniform stretch of tone. This does not mean that they are to be played monotonously. Declamatory nuances contained within the range of the general tone quality must bring out the detail in the same animated way as in the case of the pianoforte works. But from the architectonic standpoint, there should be no insistence in this music or variations of tint that will affect the broad plastic lines of it. Our modern emotional dynamics would obliterate the plan of the work and give a false idea of the cooperation of the three obbligato voices. We should try to play these sonatas with an eye only to the animated and plastic working out of the detail, and to a kind of broad declamation, leaving the variety to come from the vivacious interplay of the parts. The direct impression the pieces make in this way will prove the rightness of the principle. As regards the tempo, the andante movements are as a rule taken rather too slowly, and the allegros much too fast. We seldom meet a player who plays, for example, the theme of the final allegro in the third sonata in such a way that the hearer receives the impression of proud strength that should be given by this sequence of intervals built up on a basis of moving semiquavers. Even the best performance, however, is not wholly satisfactory. This is the fault of our pianoforte, the dull timbre of which does not blend with that of the violin. It is hopeless to try to blend a modern grand piano and a stringed instrument, as Wagner says, the timbre of the piano and that of the violin are incompatible. In a Bach clavier sonata, this is unpleasantly evident, for the composer has calculated on the cooperation of absolutely homogeneous obbligato parts. This was obtainable in his day, the cembalo producing the pure tone of a string vibrating on a wood resonance. It was only slightly brighter than that of the violin, owing to its coming from a metal string. When the cembalo part is played on a modern piano, the ensemble of the equal homogeneous parts is destroyed. We only hear a solo with pianoforte accompaniment. Even if in the future we should go back to a domestic instrument that substitutes a pure silvery timbre for the thick and brutal tone of our huge grands and uprights, the difficulties with regard to the performance of the sonatas for piano and violin would only be half surmounted. In the clavier parts of these works, Bach counts on the simultaneous doubling of a tone in several octaves, which is possible only on the cembalo. A good cembalo, like that of Friedemann's, acquired by Count Foss, has four strings to each note, to give the ground tone, one the lower octave, and one the upper octave. According to the couplers he used, the player could strike simply the two ground tone strings, or these, and that of the upper octave, or all four together. The tone was small but very rich. 
In this respect, our modern piano cannot compare for a moment with the sparkling, dashing cembalo. Moreover, the player could bring out the theme more pointedly by doubling it in the upper octave, or, if the theme was in the bass, in the lower octave. We can thus imagine how different the adagio of the first sonata, that of the third, and the largo of the fifth would sound then from what they do on a keyed instrument of today, on which it is impossible to play in three octaves at once. As a matter of fact, the adagio of the fifth sonata, with the double stopping in the violin and the arpeggio demi semi quavers in the clavier, is positively unpleasant when performed nowadays. The necessary vaporousness and at the same time definiteness of the tone can never be got on our grand piano, and the double stopping in the violin is never quite beautiful, for it can only be properly done with a loosened bow. Only in this way can these two violin parts receive the delicate organ-like tone they need, with the silvery tone of the clavier playing round it. Nature, fortunately, is compassionate, and lets us believe that we hear music only with the ears, while in truth we take it in at the same time through the eyes, and correct our hearing accordingly. We enjoy these works because the eye's perception of the beauty of them on the paper, and the mind's conception of the noble counterpoint, permit the ear to believe that the work sounds well in performance, and the delusion continues even if both players indulge in senseless alterations of pianissimo and fortissimo. But any one who has the misfortune to hear only with the ears is bound to admit that Bach's sonatas for clavier and violin imperatively demand the cembalo. This was insisted upon by Rust in his preface to the original edition, 1860. He could not foresee that forty years later the demand would be still more peremptory, and that an attempt would be made to meet it by the construction of the new cembali. We would not deprive those who have only a modern piano of their pleasure in these sonatas. Only we must be quite clear as to what an ideal performance of the works would sound like, and not seek this ideal in a false modernization of them. We must not omit to mention the tradition that in performing sonatas of this kind, the cembalo bass was helped by a stringed instrument. We shall in fact find that a discreet violoncello does good service in these works of Bach, especially where the theme has to be brought out in the lowest voice. This can be tested, for example, in the Largo of the F minor sonata. An old manuscript, partly autograph, of the sonatas categorically recommends the use of an optional gamba to strengthen the bass. It bears the title Sai suonate a cembalo certato e violino solo col basso per viola da gamba accompagnato se piace composte da Giov Sebast Bach. The chords to be struck between the obbligato voices are only rarely figured. They must be added, however, in every place where the contrapuntal web is thin. For example, when only the violin part and the bass are at work, or when the clavier alone is playing in two parts. If the movement begins with only a bass note, it goes without saying that the whole chord is to be struck, but in such a way as if it were being sounded by another clavier not by the one that is playing the obbligato parts. In this discreet way, the harmonic basis of the whole can be indicated throughout, even when three or more voices are going together. But to handle the piano part in this way requires exceptional skill, and a knowledge of the peculiarities of Bach's figuring. Otherwise, the harmony will not be correctly filled in. Kirnberger appears to have employed two claviers when playing the sonatas, one playing the obbligato parts, the other strengthened the bass and supplied the harmonies. We also possess the following instrumental sonatas by Bach, three wonderful ones for clavier and gamba, B.G. 9, page 175, three for obbligato clavier and flute, B.G. 9, page 3, three for flute with clavier accompaniment, B.G. 43, page 3, one for two violins with clavier accompaniment, B.G. 9, page 231, one for two flutes with clavier accompaniment, B.G. 9, page 260 which Bach afterwards rewrote as the first sonata for clavier and gamba, though it sounds better for two flutes. The end of the first movement of the third sonata for clavier and flute, a minor, is lacking. Bach wrote it on the same sheet as one of the concertos for two claviers with orchestral accompaniment, employing in his usual economical way the three vacant staves at the bottom of each page. From six of these leaves the lower part has been cut away, so that we lack some fifty bars of the sonata. The autograph was already in this mutilated state when von Winterfeld brought it for a few groschen from an antiquary in Breslau. 
the sonata for flute violin and accompanying clavier g major is written for the violino discordato bach desires the player to tune the two upper strings in a lower tone thus and consequently writes the part out a tone higher as there is nothing in the violin part that could not equally be well played with the strings tuned in the ordinary way bach's purpose in prescribing the peculiar tuning can only have been to get a softer timbre that would blend better with that of the flute of bach's orchestral works probably scarcely any have been lost we possess four large suites and six concertos it cannot be settled whether the suites were written in Coton or in leipzig in any case bach performed them not only before the prince of Coton, but also in the telemann musical society at leipzig which he conducted from seventeen hundred and twenty nine to seventeen hundred and thirty six he calls these works overtures not suites or partitas this being the customary name at that time for an orchestral suite in which the introduction played the chief part they are however just as much real partitas as those in the clavier of bung except that the old dances the allemande the courant and the sarabande retire in favour of the newer and freer movements the introductions are monumental movements all constructed on the plan of the french overture they begin with a stately section to this succeeds a long and brilliant allegro at the end the slow section returns when mendelssohn in eighteen hundred and thirty played to the old goethe on the piano the overture of the first of the two suites in d major the poet thought he saw a number of well-dressed people walking in stately fashion down a great staircase in eighteen hundred and thirty eight mendelssohn succeeded in getting them performed by the orchestra at the given house leipzig it was the first performance of any of these splendid works since bach's death in the dance melodies of these suites a fragment of a vanished world of grace and elegance has been preserved for us they are the ideal musical picture of the rococo period their charm resides in the perfection of their blending of strength and grace the celebrated aria is found in the first d major overture the six concertos are known as the brandenburg having been written for margrave christian ludwig sixteen hundred and seventy seven to seventeen hundred and thirty four he was the youngest son of the great electoral prince by the latter's second marriage he was passionately devoted to music and maintained an excellent orchestra he made bach's acquaintance about seventeen hundred and nineteen perhaps at the meiningen court with which he had relations through his sister or perhaps in karlsbad where bach accompanied prince leopold there enchanted by bach's playing he asked him to compose some works for his orchestra bach fulfilled this wish and sent him two years later the six concertos with the following dedication a son altesse royale monseigneur chrétien louis margraf de brandenburg monseigneur comme juste il y a un couple d'années le bonheur de me faire entendre à votre altesse royale en vertu de ses ordres et que je remarquais alors qu'elle prenait quelque plaisir au petit talent que le ciel m'a donné pour la musique et qu'en prenant conge de votre altesse royale elle voulut bien me faire l'honneur de me commander de lui envoyer quelques pièces de ma composition j'ai donc selon ses très gracieux ordres pris la liberté de rendre de mes très humbles devoirs à votre altesse royale par les présents concerts que j'ai accommodés à plusieurs instruments la priant très humblement de ne vouloir pas juger leur imperfection à la rigueur du goût fin et délicat que tout le monde sait qu'elle a pour les pièces musicales mais de tirer plutôt en bénigne considération le profond respect et la très humble obéissance que je tâche à lui témoigner par là pour le reste monsieur je supplie très humblement votre altesse royale d'avoir la bonté de continuer ses bonnes grâces envers moi et d'être persuadé que je n'ai rien tant à court que je pouvoir être employé en des occasions plus dignes d'elle et de son service moi qui suis avec une zèle sans pareil monseigneur de votre altesse royale le très humble et très obéissant serviteur jean sebastien bach Colton, d quatre-vingt mars mars mai mille 
721. To His Royal Highness, Monseigneur Chrétien Louis, Margrave of Brandenburg. Monseigneur, as I had the honor of playing before Your Royal Highness a couple of years ago, and as I observed that you took some pleasure in the small talent that Heaven has given me for music, and in taking leave of Your Royal Highness, you honored me with a command to send you some pieces of my composition. I now, according to Your gracious orders, take the liberty of presenting my very humble respect to Your Royal Highness, with the present concertos which i have written for several instruments humbly praying you not to judge their imperfection by the severity of the fine and delicate taste that every one knows you to have for music but rather to consider benignly the profound respect and the very humble obedience to which they are meant to testify for the rest monseigneur i very humbly beg your royal highness to have the goodness to continue your good graces towards me and to be convinced that I have nothing so much as heart as a wish to be employed in matters more worthy of you and your service, for, with zeal unequalled, Monseigneur, I am your Royal Highness's most humble and most obedient servant, Jean-Sebastien Bach, Colton, 24th March, March, May, 1721. How the Prince received this gift, and how he rewarded Bach for it, we do not know. When he died, these concertos, together with the rest of his large musical collection, were inventoried and valued. They do not, however, figure in the inventory under the composer's name, like those of Vivaldi and other Italians, but are included in two lots, one containing seventy-seven concertos by various writers, the other a hundred. Each of these concertos was valued at four groschen. Thus, in the year 1734, the six Brandenburg concertos were worth twenty-four groschen. At a later date, the autograph score which Bach had sent to the Margrave came into the possession of Kernberger, who left it to his pupil, Princess Amalie of Prussia. She bequeathed it to the library of Joachimstahl Gymnasium, whence it afterwards came to the Royal Library in Berlin. In elegance and cleanness, this autograph surpasses even the famous score of the St. Matthew Passion. The bar lines are drawn throughout with a ruler. In spite of all this care, the score contains an error. In the eleventh bar of the fifth concerto, the semiquavers of the viola descend in fifths with those of the obbligato cembalo. It is interesting to see that the error is due to a correction made by Bach in the fair copy. He noticed, that is to say, that the viola in the original version, which we have in the orchestral parts that have been accidentally preserved, ascended in hidden octaves with the solo violin. He at once erased the sequence, which he had already written in the fair copy, and inserted in place of it the descending semiquavers, without observing that in this way he was falling out of the frying gan into the fire. This is presumably the passage referred to by Zelter in a passage on Mendelssohn in one of his letters to Goethe. In the score of a splendid concerto by Sebastian Bach, he says, the lynx eye of my Felix, when he was ten years old, detected six consecutive fifths, which I perhaps would never have discovered as I do not bother about these things in large works, and the passage is in six parts. The Brandenburg concertos are the purest products of Bach's polyphonic style. Neither on the organ nor on the clavier could he have worked out the architecture of a movement with such vitality. The orchestra alone permits him absolute freedom in the leading and grouping of the obbligato voices. When we said in another connection that Bach's mode of expression is to be conceived as a plastic one, and deduced from this certain principles for performance, there was a danger of our being misunderstood, as if our object were to try to reintroduce the old, stiff way of playing his music. But one has only to go through these scores, in which Bach has marked all the nuances with the utmost care, to realize that the plastic pursuit of the musical idea is not in the least formal, but alive from beginning to end. Bach takes up the ground idea of the old concerto, which develops the work out of the alternation of a larger body of tone, the tutti, and a smaller one, the concertino. Only with him the formal principle becomes a living one. It is not now a question merely of the alternation of the tutti and the concertino. The various tone groups interpenetrate and react on each other, separate from each other, unite again, and all with an incomprehensible artistic inevitability. The concerto is really the evolution and the vicissitudes of the theme. We really seem to see before us what the philosophy of all ages conceives as a fundamental mystery of things, that self-unfolding of the idea 
in which it creates its own opposite in order to overcome it creates another which again it overcomes and so on and on until it finally returns to itself having meanwhile traversed the whole of existence we have the same impression of incomprehensible necessity and mysterious contentment when we pursue the theme of one of these concertos from its entry in the tutti through its enigmatic struggle with its opposite to the moment when it enters into possession of itself again in the final tutti in bach we often have not one but several groups of solo instruments that are played off against each other in the development of the movement the wind instruments are used with the audacity of genius in the first concerto bach employs besides the strings a wind ensemble consisting of two horns three oboes and bassoon in the second flute oboe trumpet and violin are used as a kind of solo quartet against the body of the strings in the third he aims at no contrast of timbres but employs three string trios all constituted in the same way in the fourth concerto the concertino consists of one violin and two flutes in the fifth it consists of clavier flute and violin in the sixth bach employs only the timbre effects to be had from the strings two violas two gambas and cello the study of bach's nuances in these works is a continual source of delight for they are also simple and yet so full and rich observe for example how in the first movement of the fourth concerto from the twenty-seventh bar before the end the piano comes down in a wavy line from top to bottom following the line of the forte theme that winds downwards and lies as it were in violent convulsions on the ground till suddenly a bold forte of the whole orchestra puts an end to the unrest that began with the first entry of this subsidiary theme in the violins and leads into the victorious conclusion many conductors indeed are still of the opinions that bach ought to be corrected here and there they think that the nuances should not be sharply defined against each other but should merge into each other by a crescendo or diminuendo this of course quite destroys the terrace-like plan of bach's music to which viana da motta has called attention there are also conductors who try to get a better effect by making a final tutti dribble out to a pianissimo the same rules holds good for the tempo here as in the organ and clavier works the better the playing the slower the tempo can be because when the hearer perceives all the expressive detail a quite moderate tempo has the effect on him of a quick one while in the faster tempo he could scarcely grasp the rich polyphony are the brandenburg concertos suitable for our concert halls no one can doubt this who has heard one of them say under steinbach and observe the effect on the audience these works should become popular possessions in the same sense as the beethoven symphonies are spiro finally says in a glowing article in which he affirms the right of the modern public to bach's orchestral works that these concertos in reality are not concertos but symphonies it is to be hoped that the overtures will also will come into their own before long our instrumentalists would profit greatly by going to school to bach there are no insuperable difficulties in the way of performance it is not for the best that the flute a beck in the fourth concerto should have to be replaced by our traverse flutes but the total effect really does not suffer viola players who can also play the gamba will probably be found before long in nearly every orchestra so that the sixth concerto may some day be freed from its babylonian captivity for the second concerto the instrument makers alexander brothers of mans have made a small f trumpet on which it is possible for any good trumpeter with a little practice to play the original bach part so that for the future it will not be necessary to modify the part or give it to the clarinet mendelssohn had recourse to the latter device when he produced the first d major overture and it is retained in david's edition of the work for the gewand house concerts the small quart geiger giving the four feet tone for which bach writes in the first concerto must also find cultivators again too large an orchestra is rather a disadvantage to these concertos as it destroys the natural proportion between the solo instruments and the tutti we are on the very border line between chamber music and orchestral music the woodwind in the tutti must of course be increased in proportion to the strings the accompanying clavier must not be omitted even when the orchestra is a large one in a small room a cembalo can be employed 
in a large one it is best to have a good table piano or a small erard grand of the old style a modern grand is too dull harmonically for the concertizing piano however we should always employ a modern grand as here it must play the part of a solo voice the harmonies should be given on another piano it is most desirable also that the basses in the tutti be accompanied in octaves by a piano as this will bring them out more clearly than exaggerated emphasis in the double basses it will always be noticed that to force the tone anywhere in these works is to spoil the effect when once the brandenburg concertos and the overtures have established themselves in the concert room the question will arise as to how far some of the preludes to the cantatas can win the same rights of naturalization it is already settled in principle by the fact that bach himself does not hesitate to transfer movements from his overtures and concertos into his cantatas he used the introduction to the first brandenburg concerto as a sinfonia for the cantata falsche welt dir trau ich nicht number fifty two and the first movement of the third concerto as a prelude to the cantata ich liebe den hoxton von ganzem getmuter number one hundred and seventy four but as a piece for strings alone did not seem to him rich enough for the church especially in a festal cantata on whit monday he added in the latter case three obligato oboes and two horns without altering the original composition this would be regarded as an astounding technical feat had he not eclipsed it by another he made the splendid chorus of the christmas cantata unser mund sire vol lachens number one hundred and ten by simply adding vocal parts to the allegro of the second overture in d major b g thirty one page sixty six one would almost suppose he had written the overture and the cantata together the allegro theme of the overture is so characteristic a musical representation of laughter that it seems to have been prompted by the text of the cantata a cantata prelude particularly fitted for performance as an independent orchestral piece in the wonderful orchestral mood picture from am aben aber deselbiegen shabbats number forty two in which bach paints the silence and the peace in which the slowly descending twilight envelops the earth the arrangement of bach's clavier and organ works for orchestra must be regarded as superfluous and imperfect even when they are as sensitively done as raff's arrangement of the g minor english suite it is misleading to speak of bach's clavier concertos and violin concertos as these works have nothing in common with the modern concerto in which the role of the orchestra is largely that of an accompanist with bach it is only a matter of giving a specially brilliant obligato part to the solo instrument if this happens to be the cembalo it may also play the bass in order to employ both hands that bach thought in the first place of the obligato part and only secondarily of the instrument that was to play it it is evident from the fact that the majority of the seven clavier concertos are not primarily planned for the clavier almost all are arrangements six probably come from violin concertos bach needed clavier concertos when he directed the telemann society the arrangements are often made with quite incredible haste and carelessness either time was pressing or he felt no interest in what he was doing violin effects to which he could easily have given a pianistic turn are not remodelled at all later on he improves them here and there in the score but leaves them as they are in the clavier part the reason for this was that he himself played the cembalo part and did as he pleased with the notes before him making a new part out of them we are under no special obligation to incorporate these transcriptions in our concert programs it is otherwise with the triple concerto for clavier flute and violin in a minor which we are accustomed to regard as the bach clavier concerto no audience surely could help being carried away by this work even at a first hearing it would certainly occupy the first place in the repertory of every earnest pianist if the cooperation of the two other solo instruments and the whole style of the work did not demand more rehearsals than the majority of concert directors are in the habit of allowing to a piano concerto as is well known this concerto has grown out of the clavier prelude and fugue in a minor on comparing the sketch with the masterly expansion of it 
we seem to share the pride that bach must have felt when he saw the new work arise in all its majesty out of the old the middle movement is taken from the organ sonata in d minor of the three concertos for two claviers and orchestra two the first and the third are arrangements of concertos for two violins the original of the first in c minor no longer exists the third also in c minor is identical with the d minor concerto for two violins how bach could venture to transfer the two cantabile violin parts in the largo of this work to the cembalo with its abrupt tone must be left to himself to answer had he not done it himself we should be protesting in his name today against so unbach like a transcription this is not the only case in which he makes it hard for his prophets to go forth in his name against the evil transcribers the one original concerto however number two in c major compensates us for all our disappointed expectations in the two others if we can speak of disappointment in connection with bach the fact that it was originally conceived for two claviers is shown at once not only by the rich writing for the two solo parts in the third section of the splendid fugue they are in three parts throughout but also by the subordinate position given to the orchestra it is not an orchestral concerto with two soli cembali but a concerto for two claviers with orchestral accompaniment perhaps indeed the first movement existed at one time without instrumental accompaniment certain indications go to show that this was added later and that bach wrote it out at first not in score but in parts otherwise we cannot explain how it happens that in two places of this first allegro bar eighty three and one hundred and eight the orchestra enters with the major third while the clavier parts maintain the minor third which grows logically out of what has gone before and we do not make it major until the following crochet bach would certainly have noticed this error had he had the clavier and orchestral parts before him in the score the curious thing is that the mistake was not noticed in performance and at once corrected in the clavier parts an accompanying piano is not necessarily here the two solo claviers themselves supplying the most essential harmonies the cembalo accompagnato is here really the orchestra consisting of a simple string quartet which in reality only plays a figured bass that has a good deal of rhythmical interest in a performance in a small room it can be quite well replaced by a third piano an ordinarily good player could easily play the part direct from the orchestral score we could even arrange for the two pianos all that is really indispensable in the orchestral accompaniment the two concertos for three claviers b g thirty one are constructed on the principle that underlies the original works for two claviers in them also the string quartet retires into the background for the most part it only supplies the harmonies and aims at supporting and throwing into relief the leading part in the ensemble of the three claviers the second concerto it is not agreed whether the original key is c major or d major is planned on larger lines than the first d minor and the orchestra plays a more important part in it in the adagio there are even tutti passages in which the three claviers merely accompany the orchestra the tonal and rhythmical effects that bach has achieved with three claviers are indescribable at every hearing of these works we stand amazed before the mystery of so incredible a power of invention and combination an old tradition has it that bach wrote these two concertos in order to play them with his two eldest sons if this be true they must date from about seventeen hundred and thirty to seventeen hundred and thirty three the concerto for four claviers a minor is based upon a vivaldi concerto for four violins of the violin concertos we possess only the half those left by philip emmanuel those belonging to friedemann are probably lost forever we have three concertos for violin and orchestra a minor e major and g major an important fragment of an allegro movement from a work for violin and large orchestra d major and a concerto for two violins with simple string orchestra d minor of lost violin concertos at least three two for one violin and one for two violins have come down to us in clavier arrangements the concertos for violin and orchestra that have survived are among the works of bach to which it is useless to employ the method of analysis we must put them in the category for which forkel briefly and eloquently observes one can never say enough of their beauty
the a minor and e major concertos are beginning to win a place in our concert halls modern audiences are enthralled by the two adagio movements in which the violin moves about over a basso ostinato we involuntarily associate them with the idea of fate the beauty of the a minor concerto is severe that of the e major full of an unconquerable joy of life that sings its song of triumph in the first and last movements the concerto for two violins in d minor is perhaps more widely known still it can be played at home as its orchestral part can be easily transcribed for the piano every amateur should know the wonderful piece of the largo man non tanto in f major the concerto in e major was regularly given in the berlin sing academy even in zelta's time this bach improver for such he is shown to be by his revision of the parts and the marks of expression he has added thought it necessary to have more alternations of solo and tutti than bach had indicated emmanuel seems to have performed this concerto in hamburg otherwise he would not have had the parts copied so carefully forkel has a notable passage to the effect that bach had instrumental soli played during the communion and wrote most of his own for this purpose of the violin concertos however he could have used only the largo from the concerto for two violins in modern performances of the two concertos for single violin the orchestra is generally too large this becomes unpleasantly noticeable when the basso ostinato in the middle movements is played in an intolerably heavy style by half a dozen contrabasses and twice as many cellos the accompanying piano is usually omitted without regard for the hearers who are conscious of gaps in the passages where only the violin and the bass are playing isaiah plays these concertos in captivating style even though at times he modernizes them too much but his habit of having the general bass performed on a harmonium is inexplicable either on historical or logical or musical grounds end of chapter 17 read for you by chiquito crasto music performed from the source text available in the public domain by jonathan schofield birmingham alabama chapter 18 of j s bach by albert schweitzer translated by ernest newman this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Music performed by Jonathan Schofield. Chapter 18. The Musical Offering and the Art of Fuga. Bach wrote the musical offering on his return from Potsdam in 1747. He had been received by the king on May 7th. On July 7th, he sent him his gift. The composition and the engraving of it had therefore been a matter of less than two months. Nor did the engraver even live in Leipzig. It was Schubler of Zeller, through whom Bach had already published several clavier works and six organ chorales. The copy with the dedication passed from the possession of Princess Amalie into that of the Joachim Stahler Gymnasium and is now in the Royal Library at Berlin. Bach's dedication runs thus. Most gracious King, Aleg Nagdikster Konig, Eu Majestat Veha, Yermit in Tiefster, Unter Tanigkeit, Ein Musikalische Opfer, Dessen Edelster, Tale von Derol Selben, Hohe Han Selbst Herurt, Mit einen Enrufugst Fallen, Vergnügen, Erinner, Ich mich anoch der ganz besonderen königlichen gnade da vor einiger zeit bei meiner anwesenheit in potsdam ihr majestat selbst ein thema zur eine füge auf dem klavier mir vorsucht spielen geruheten und zugleich allerg nadgist auferlegten solches also bald in Dero Selvin Hoxton Gegenford Auszuführen, Ihr Majestat Befel zu Gehorsamen war meine untertanigste Schuldigkeit. Ich bemerkte aber gar bald 
das wegen mangels notiker vorbereitung die ausführung nicht also geraten wollte als es ein so treffliches thema entforderte ich fasserte demach den entschluss und machte mich zugleich an heischig dieses recht königliche thema vollkommen auszuarbeiten und so dann der welt bekannt zu machen dieser wursatz ist nunmehr nach vermögen bewerkstelliget worden und er hat keine andere als nur diese unter der hafte abigst den run eines monarchen obgleich nur in einen kleinen punkte zu verherrlichen dessen große und starke gleich wie in allen kriegs und friedenswissenschaften also auch besonders in der musik jedermann bewurden und wehren muß ist er kühne mich dieses untertanigste bieten hinzuzufügen ihr majestat geruben gegenwartige weinige arbeit mit einer gnadigen aufhandme zu würdigen und derselben allerhöchste königliche gnade noch fenerweit zu gönnen ihr majestat allerunter tanigste gehorsamten knechte der verfasser leipzig den sieben july eins sieben für sieben most gracious king to your majesty i dedicate herewith in deepest submissiveness a musical offering the noblest part of which comes from your own exalted hand it is with respectful pleasure that i remember still the very special royal favour with which on my recent visit to potsdam your majesty yourself deigned to give me on the clavier a theme for a fugue and most graciously imposed on me the command to develop it at once in your majesty's exalted presence it was my most humble duty to obey your majesty's command i soon observed however that owing to the lack of necessary preparation the working out was not as successful as so excellent a theme demanded therefore i resolved and set to work immediately to work out fully this truly royal theme and then make it known to the world this undertaking has now been accomplished to the best of my ability and it has no other object than the irreproachable one of exalting if even in only a small degree the fame of a monarch whose greatness and power in all the arts both of war and of peace but especially in music every one must admire and honor i make bold to add this most humble request that your majesty will deign to honor this small work with your gracious acceptance and continue to bestow your most exalted kindly favor on your majesty's most humble and obedient servant the author leipzig seven july seventeen hundred and forty seven along with this dedication however he sent only the first third of the work as far as a sixth part ricercare the two remaining parts he probably sent to the king by the hands of his son five leaves in brown leather binding with gold tooling form the bulk of the potion sent first the paper is of uncommon fineness and strength the dedication occupies two leaves then follows the three-part ricercare and a canon afterwards comes a separate large folio sheet with the canon perpetus five canones diversi and the fuga canonica in epidia pente all upon the thema regium the ricercare is rather a fugal three-part fantasia than a fugue and contains many surprising things we ask for instance what is the meaning of the triplet passage that enters unmotived at the thirty-first bar especially as it is at once abandoned and twice again emerges only to disappear at once why did not bach open his work with a larger and stricter piano fugue upon the royal theme the most natural explanation is that he wished to keep to the improvisation that he had made before the monarch the complete working out of which the dedication speaks must consequently be taken to mean with regard to the first piece only a fundamental revision of the fugue actually played on the seventh may we thus possess one of bach's improvisations written down by his own hand that this is so is further suggested by the unusual freedom and animation of the fugue it is regrettable that this splendid work not being included among the clavier compositions 
is almost unknown to the majority of players. The royal theme runs thus. Frederick had desired Bach to extemporize a six-part fugue for him. Bach did so, not, however, on the king's theme, but on one of his own, giving as his excuse that it was not every theme that lent itself to six-part treatment. Afterwards, he made it a point of honor to work out the king's theme also in six parts. Thus originated the Richer Kare, which, with two supplementary canons, constituted the second consignment. This is not so luxuriously got up as the first. It consists of four ordinary leaves held together by a pin. The six-part Richard Kare is Bach's richest piece of fugal writing. In order to allow of a more comprehensive view of it, he wrote it out in score on six staves. It is, however, as playable on the piano as any of the fugues of the well-tempered clavichord. From the technical standpoint, the work is unique, but we see in vain in it for the inspiration and the poetry that made the fugues of the well-tempered clavichord so beautiful. No matter how often we play it, it affords no lasting satisfaction. It is a product of Bach's last creative period, in which the contrapuntal technique, though not actually an aim in itself, nevertheless plays the leading part, the invention taking a subordinate place. The musical offering ends with a sonata for flute, violin, and accompanying clavier, to which there is added a canon perpetus. It is in four movements, largo, allegro, andante, allegro. In the Largo, the royal theme is merely suggested. In the Fugue Allegro, it is used as the Cantus Firmus. The Andante harks back to motives from the three-part Ricercare. The royal theme forms the basis of the finale in this form. Bach thus wrote two sonatas for flute, violin, and accompanying clavier, one in the Weimar or the Cotin period, the other three years before his death. The difference between the two works is enormous. The first belongs to his naive period, when he was solely intent on beauty of sound. When we listen to it, we seem to be wandering by a woodland brook over meadows that the morning dew has studded with diamonds. The later sonata transports us to great mountain heights where vegetation ceases and peaks, rising one above the other, stand out in sharp outlines against the blue sky. The beauty of the trio sonata of the musical offering is of this quality. It is profound and severe, without any of the gracious charm that distinguishes the work of the youthful period. We have a manuscript copy of the musical offering, in which the figured bass of the clavier part is written out by Kernberger. This work by a pupil of Bach is invaluable as showing us how simply and correctly the composer wished the figured bass to be worked out. The musical offering contains in all ten canons, including the fuga canonica at the end of the first part. They are not canons in the ordinary sense of the word, aiming at a definite musical effect, but clever musical charades of the kind that the musicians of that time were fond of propounding to each other. The solutions of the first six canons are given by Kernberger, in his Kunst des Reinen Satzes. In two of them, the fourth and the fifth, Bach aims at a certain musical symbolism. Over the fourth, in which the theme is treated in augmentation in contrary motion, he writes, Notulis crescentibus crescat fortuna regis. May the good fortune of the king increase like that of the note values. The fifth, a circle canon ascending through the scale, is inscribed, Ascendent tec, modulatione, ascendat glorias regis. And as the modulation ascends, so may it be with the glory of the king. It was the custom to indicate the way to the solution of the canon by showing the notes of the theme on which the other parts had to enter. In the two canons that precede the sonata, Bach omits this hint. Querendo invenietis, seek and ye shall find, runs his inscription. The first is in two parts, the second in four. While the latter is clear enough, the former permits of several solutions which were put forward by Agricola, Kirnberger, and the Freiburg cantor Fischer, the latter in the Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung of 1806. Besides these, we have five other canons by Bach. One is given by the Marpurg in his Abhandlung von der Fuge. Another, belonging to the year 1713, was inscribed to an unknown person, probably his Weimar colleague and friend Walter. 
he paid the same honor during his hamburg journey of seventeen hundred and twenty seven to an amateur of that town a monsieur houdemann who returned the compliment with a poem on bach another canon also given in marpurg's abhandlung von der fuge was inscribed so spitter conjectures to schmidt the organist at zeller the fifth canon is found on hausmann's picture of bach belonging to st thomas's school while engaged on the musical offering bach resolved to carry out systematically a plan which he had here undertaken somewhat unsystematically to write a complete work on a single theme the new work was to be a practical illustration of the art of fugue it is an error to say he did not complete the art of fugue he died before the engraving was completed hence the work has come down to us in a seemingly incomplete form during the last week of Bach's life, none of the elder sons was with his father. After his death, they went on with the engraving in ignorance of what his plan had been. The plates were prepared by Schubler of Zeller, to whom Bach had also entrusted the engraving of the musical offering. Perhaps Bach had originally intended to etch the work himself on copper, the three pages of the autograph written in such a way that they could be reproduced directly on the plate point to this intention how little schubler and the sons were acquainted with bach's design is evident from the fact that they paid no regard to a list of errors carefully made by bach that has fortunately come down to us they were not even clear as to the arrangement of the pieces moreover they inserted a simple variant as a new piece fugue number no. fourteen is identical with fugue number no. ten except that it lacks the first twenty-two bars roost thinks that the whole style of the edition indicates that none of the elder sons had anything to do with it that is not so they merely attended to it in a hurry among bach's papers was found also a large fugue upon three themes at which he had worked until the last without finishing it emmanuel and friedemann thought it had been intended for the art of fugue and printed it there unfinished as it was in order however that the work might not end in this incomplete way they added the organ chorale when we are in hochsten noten sind which Bach had dictated to Altnikol. No one can say whether it had really been his intention to end the art of fugue with these two works. In a sense they belong to it, in another sense not. They have nothing to do with the specimen fugues, for they are not based on the same subject. On the other hand, they are so skillfully worked out. See, for example, Bach's constant manipulation of the theme in inversion in the organ chorale, that he may well have written them with a view to their forming an appendix to the art of fugue, the three themes of the unfinished fugue run thus. The three separate fugues on these themes are completed. Bach is just about to combine them at the point where the manuscript breaks off. The theme of the last fugue spells Bach's name. In the Weimar days, Bach had remarked to his colleague Walter upon the peculiarity of the four letters of his name as accounting for the musical aptitudes of the Bach family. Walter mentions this at the end of the meagre little article that he devotes to his former friend in his musical dictionary, 1732 and expressly says that the remark came from herr kappelmeister bach himself this makes it all the more curious that bach should have waited until the last year of his life before making a fugue on this interesting theme friedemann when questioned by forkel upon this point said positively that his father had never written any fugue but this upon the family name the various fugues on b a c h that claims to have been composed by johann sebastian therefore cannot be his there are four of these one of them, if not like Bach, is not uninteresting. Spitta tries to preserve the ascription of at least two of these fugues. They are not printed in the BG edition. However, even among the doubtful works, only the themes are given. The theme B-A-C-H is a favorite one with the moderns. Liszt and Schumann have written fugues upon it. In Reger's music, we fancy we can often detect it, even where it is not expressly indicated nor must we forget barblin's accomplished organ passacaglia on b a c h the art of fugue was published some months after bach's death at the price of four thalers it had however no sale then at emmanuel's request marpurg seventeen hundred and eighteen to seventeen hundred and ninety five 
wrote a preface to it, and the work was reissued with a new cover and the recommendation of the celebrated theoretician at the Leipzig East Affair of 1752. Its worth was recognized, Madison praised it warmly, but still it did not sell. In 1756, Emmanuel had sold barely 30 copies. The 130 thalers received did not cover the cost, and the disappointed son sold the plates of his father's last work for the value of the metal. Such was the fate of the art of fugue. In his biography, Forkel says indignantly, If a work of this kind, by so exceedingly famous a man as Bach, had appeared anywhere but in Germany, perhaps ten fine editions would have been taken up out of pure patriotism. In Germany, there were not sold even enough copies to pay for the copper plates and the engraving. Perhaps Forkel's exasperation with his countrymen carries him too far. It was not the fault of individuals, but of the epoch, that the great cantor's work had no success. Music had struck into new paths that led it away from the fugal style, and those who were still interested in it were not fugue masters, but fugue schoolmasters, and incompetent to understand the true Bach, however much they swore by him. We get this impression even from Mark Pope's preface, which partly consists of only a moderately clever polemic against the new tendency that refuses to recognize the fugue as a vital cornerstone of music. The art of fugue consists of fourteen fugues and four canons on the theme. The theme cannot strictly be called interesting. It is not a stroke of genius, but has plainly been made with an eye to its manifold workableness and capacity for inversion. Nevertheless, it grows upon us after repeated hearings. It introduces us to a still and serious world deserted and rigid without color without light without motion it does not gladden does not distract yet we cannot break away from it we get the same impression from the first four fugues that deal with the theme itself and its inversion with the fifth fugue however the monotony of the theme is broken the regular pace of the first four notes becomes more varied rhythmically the theme acquires a grave movement From the eighth fugue onwards, it becomes more and more animated, until in the eleventh it assumes the following form. All the possible fugue types, including those of which Bach himself had never made use, are represented in the art of fugue. We do not know which to wonder at most, that all these combinations could be devised by one mind, or that, in spite of the ingenuity of it all, the parts always flow along as naturally and freely as if the way were not prescribed for them by this or that purely technical necessity. His purpose in this work being a purely theoretical one, Bach writes the fugues out in score and calls them counterpoints. The last four fugues are grouped in pairs, each of a pair being note for note an exact inversion of the other, as if we were reading it in a mirror. They are in three parts. The negative stands immediately under the positive. Here again Bach soars playfully above every technical difficulty. The pieces are bright and animated from beginning to end, as if it were a pure accident that one of them happened to be the reflection of the other. Bach himself must have felt the purest pride in them. He arranged the last pair for two claviers, adding a fourth obligato part so that both instruments should be fully occupied. In this form, the last two pieces of the art of fugue were given as a supplement, and when the work was republished in the nineteenth century, this part of it was fastened on by the pianists and soon became the most popular of all. The theme runs thus. End of chapter 18. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Music performed from the source text available in the public domain by Jonathan Schofield, Birmingham, Alabama. End of J.S. Bach by Albert Schweitzer. Translated by Ernest Newman.